into closed session pursuant to section 3-305B7 of the general provisions article of the annotated code of Maryland for purposes of consultation with council. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Um, I got the email, but I just didn't. I printed it out and I left it. Okay. We need a motion to come out of closed session. So move. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, we need a motion to approve the draft minutes of, the, of December 5th, 2019 and December 12th, 2019 planning board meetings. Moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, so, so the Prince George's County Planning Board um, is obviously back in session, and I do want to take a moment. We always start with a moment of silence for those who have passed on since our intervening, uh, since um, our January 16th meeting. Um, I'm going to start in our commission family. We have Danny Jean Garrison, who was the father of Tina Dorsey, who works as an IT systems manager in, in the information management division of the planning department. Um, Anita Ellis, um, who, who, age 57, who died as a result of a house fire in New Carrollton. David Only, a singer-songwriter si who died on stage of a, an apparent heart attack. He stopped in the middle of a song while performing and said, I'm sorry, sat still with, upright with his guitar and passed away. Um, Jimmy Heath, age 93, legendary jazz saxophonist and composer known as Little Bird, who worked alongside musical greats such as Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane. Um, Gary Starkweather, who invented the laser printer while working for Xerox. Terry jo uh, Jones, um, star of the comedy group Monty Python. The three American firefighters who were killed in a plane crash while fighting uh, fires in um, Australia. <laughs> Um, and then we want to ask that you keep the, um, remember the, the victims of the coronavirus, and we ask that all of you be careful as well. Um, and then um, we want to remember the victims and the people in Puerto Rico who are subjected to earthquake after earthquake after earthquake, so if you can keep them in your thoughts. Finally, Ryan, um, in Prince George's County, we lost and icon. The inimitable Morgan Wooten, age 88, was the former basketball coach for 46 years at DeMatha High School in Hyattsville. He brought the school national recognition. He produced dozens of college and professional stars. Um, he was dubbed the winningest high school coach ever. And by the way, he coached basketball, baseball, football, and he was an amateur boxer, too. And he actually coached football at DeMatha as well before giving all that up to stick with basketball. Um, his most famous victory was in 1965 when uh, DeMatha ended New York City's Power Memorial's 71 winning game streak, where, of course, Power Memorial had the in inimitable then Lou Alcindor, now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, he, he just was such an amazing person, and for 31 straight seasons, every senior on his teams received a college scholarship offer. Plus, he taught world history to um, every DeMatha freshman up until 1980. So, um, I, I, the reason, he was just an icon, and he was an, an amazing, kind, gentle, wonderful man who managed to to coach his basketball teams without berating them, without yelling at them, and he was amazing. And finally, I want to tell you that uh, Morgan Wooten was a member of this Prince George's County Planning Board. He was appointed by then County Executive Glenn Denning. He sat right here where Commissioner Dorner is sitting. And there was a young attorney who sat right next to him to his left. That young attorney, <laughs> then, then young attorney, <laughs> was yours truly. And so I sat next to him, and he would kind of talk to me and say, okay, okay, what's, what, what can I do here legally? What can I do here? What kind of motion can I make here? And, then, and you can see his picture there, um, up there at the planning board before we did the renovations in this room. And then finally, as we got to maybe 1, 1.30, 
he, the famous th line he would always offer to me is, okay, Betty, get me out of here. Time to go to practice. <laughs> get me out of here. Um, I ask that we remember all of those who've passed on, including Morgan, who's going to be um, remembered at two ceremonies at DeMatho on Saturday in the afternoon and the evening. One ceremony um, um, service at DeMatho on Sunday evening, and then the funeral on, at, also at DeMatho on Monday mm. morning. Um, I don't know many people that get that many. So if we could have a moment of silence of all of those who have passed, including any of you who may have suffered a loss of which I am unaware, our hearts go out to you as well. And I'm going to ask that we remember our Madam Vice Chair and our thoughts and prayers as well too today. Thank you. Um, so of course it's it's the month of January, which is Get Organized Month, Financial Wellness Month, Get a Balanced Life Month. So far, these things are not working for me. Um, it is Self Love Month and National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. On January, it is January 23rd, and on January 23rd, in these respective years, there are historic events that took place. 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell became the very first woman in the United States to earn a medical degree. 1933 was the ratification of the 20th Amendment, which fixed um, the presidential inaugural, United States presidential election, um, inaugural date as January 20th. 1943, um, Duke Ellington played um, New York City's Carnegie Hall for the very first time. Now that was 1943. You can contrast that with Marian Anderson, who could not play at, at Constitution mm -hmm. Hall. Um, 1957, Whammo Company produced the first fris Frisbee. I defy you to go to a beach now and see somebody, and not see somebody playing Frisbee. Um, 1977 the, was the premiere of the groundbreaking miniseries, Roots. And that was before we had DVDs, and before we had VCRs, and I remember as a young law student, I was riveted, and I was conflicted because um, I, want, I was conflicted between studying torts and um, a need mm. to really uh, focus on, on Roots, the premiere of Roots, which was just fascinating. Um, 1979, the Say Hey Kid Willie Mays was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, 1986 was the very first uh, inductions into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, I know many of you, I'm looking at the audience, I can tell right now that many of you people are aware of them. Chuck Berry, James Brown, Ray Charles, Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Elvis. Um, uh, 1999, Michael Jordan scored double figures in his 800th consecutive game in an overtime win against New Jersey. Um, 19, 2018, singer-songwriter Neil Diamond. Okay, and famous hit. Nobody knows Sweet Caroline. Okay, um, retired after being diagnosed with Parkinson's. 2018, LeBron James became the youngest NBA player ever to reach 30,000 NBA point milestones. Finally, today, January 23rd, is National Pie Day, P-I-E Day, not P-I, P-I-E Day, which is as an apple, pecan, pumpkin, sweet potatoes. So when you break for lunch, I suggest that somebody go have some. Um, no, I don't know, but I hope somebody's listening because when we break for lunch, that might come in real handy. Okay, um, we're getting ready for the Super Bowl. And, um, and finally, New York Yankees great Derek Jeter was voted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. And I want to remind everybody, too, that the census is coming up. It is imperative that every person be counted. Every person. And it, Census Day is April 1st, but you will start receiving the forms come March um, 12th. And you can um, respond to the census. It's, only, it's safe. It's confidential. There are only nine questions. They will never ask you, like, for your financial information or social security number. If anybody asks you for that, it's a scam. Don't do it. Um, but it's merely nine questions, and for every person not counted in Prince George's County, that results in a loss of $18,250. Um, that is a huge amount that can go to all kinds of programs, transportation needs, and, all, and um, education needs, and so much more, social needs. And in 2010, that resulted in a, that loss, because of people not being counted, resulted in a loss of $363 million to Prince George's County. We cannot have that. We cannot leave that kind of money on the table. So I just wanted to mention that. Finally, we have Black History Month programs commencing this uh, Sunday, actually, with our opening, Black Women and the, uh, the, Black Women and the Vote. Um, and so um, there are brochures in the back, which you may want to see their month-long activities. 
And I think that, can, oh, and this, and we're getting ready for summer camp. So if any of you have kids, you know, please start looking into our summer camps. And without further ado, I'm going to proceed with our agenda. I'm going to start with um, the consent agenda. I'm going to go with item six, which is then a request for a continuance. Um, I'm going to seven and five. And here's, and then we have some which are going to take an extraordinarily long time. Mm. Uh, where's Mr. Gibbs? Is he? Uh, okay, Ms. it looks like, Mr. Gibbs, we may not get to your matter before we break for lunch, so it may be the afternoon. I have to give you a heads up uh, so that you can tell your folks. Um, I can't give you a precise time because I have no idea how long these other matters are going to take, but I do want to at least hold you harmless until maybe one. Okay, it, it may not be one, and you can check back with us, and anybody here, that is on um, 10, item... Is that 10? Yeah, 10. Um, so that is item 10. Um, and is anyone here on item 10? The detailed site plan for JSF Annapolis Road? OK, so, if you, so it looks like the folks that are here today are with you. So, OK, so if you can let them know and hold harmless. And you can check in um, to see how we're doing You know, come 12-ish. And that will let you know whether it's going to be one or after. Okay, thank you. So is anyone here to oppose the staff's recommendation on item 4D or any board member who would like to discuss this item? item uh, Madam Chair, move approval on item 4D in reference to the consent agenda in accordance with the recommendation of staff. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. Item 6, followed by 7, followed by 5. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Adam Bossy with the Urban Design Section, and I'm here to present a continuance request for DSP 19025 Northgate. For on one week? For one week, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Howell, did you need to say anything on that? Where did he go? Well, somebody needs to let Mr. Haller know we're calling his cases because this is next to. Okay. Well, he. I don't have anyone. Okay, well, he, he's in agreement. Mr. Howell, you're in agreement. We have a motion already. All in, you have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. So that matter will be continued to the following week, um, January 30th. Okay. I, but while you're there, Mr. Haller, item seven. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am David Simon, Planner Coordinator with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Item number seven on the agenda is the preliminary plan of subdivision for the preserves at Wingate 4-18025. The applicant proposes 18 lots for single family detached development. Wait, wait. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. The site is located in the northern part of Prince George's County within Planning Area 70 and Council District 4. More specifically, the site is located south of the intersection of Good Luck Road and Springfield Road, 3,000 feet northeast from the intersection of Maryland 564, Lanham 7 Road, and Springfield Road. The subject site is located in the residential estate RE zone. It is bounded to the northwest by Good Luck Road and to the northeast by Springfield Road. Abutting to the rear of the subject properties is the Wingate subdivision. The aerial photograph shows the site as currently undeveloped tree stand. This land represents the remainder of land that was not developed as part of the Wingate subdivision that abuts the subject properties to the south. 
The site map shows the varied topography across the subject properties. The master plan right of way map shows Good Luck Road, a master plan collector right of way northwest of the site, and Springfield Road, a master plan collector right of way east and north of the site. The critical intersection determined to be impacted by the development, the intersection of MD 6564 at Lanham Severn Road and Springfield Road, is highlighted with the red bullseye on the lower right hand corner of this slide and is described further in detail in the staff, technical staff report. Given the proposed development, it was found that the critical intersections of MD 564 and Springfield Road would continue to operate with adequate levels of service. The preliminary plan slide shows 18 lots are proposed, outlined in red. The surrounding public streets are outlined in blue. Adequate public facilities, including water, sewer, fire, rescue, and police facilities are available to serve the subject site. The areas of woodland retention and preservation are indicated in green, which roughly delineates the boundaries of the limits of disturbance on the subject properties. The specimen trees proposed for removal are indicated in orange. PMA areas along Springfield Road are delineated with a blue dash line along the subject properties along Springfield Road. The application also includes a variance request from the Woodland Conservation Ordinance for the removal of specimen trees. Staff is recommending approval of the variance request as outlined in the technical staff report. As shown on the TCP1 slide, the primary management area within the existing right of way will be impacted to provide utility connections to these lots. The applicant has provided further elaboration in their statement of justification, and staff supports the proposed impacts as outlined in the technical staff report. The total area of impacts are within the existing right-of-way is 4,540 feet. Public right-of-way dedication is required along with frontage improvements, which will also impact the wetlands within the right-of-way. This slide highlights the areas along the public right-of-way frontage of Good Luck Road, and Springfield Road, where approximately seven areas to provide potential opportunities for the installation of wetland mitigation swales, which is necessary due to the impacts of the PMA. The subdivision and zoning staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve the preliminary plan 4-18025 and tree conservation plan TCP 1-010-2019 and variance to section 25122B1G subject to the 12 conditions contained in the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Simon. Are there any questions? Um, I have a number of people on the sign-up list, so I'm going to go with Mr. Haller. I, um, and I know then we have um, um, Howard Aldag, Leslie Dougla Douglas Harding, and Bernice Austin. Okay, uh, Mr. Haller. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Thomas Haller, I'm an attorney with offices in Largo, and I'm here today representing the property owner and the applicant. Um, the, um, uh, my, my client, Mr. Jassim Alagabi, uh, is also a resident of the Wingate subdivision, um, and he is proposing, uh, he, he owns this property along with several of his family members, and he is proposing to subdivide the property and uh, have a home constructed for him to live on and then be able to sell some additional lots off as well. Uh, the property is obviously unique. Um, I've w done, done this for a lot of years, and I've worked with triangles, and I've worked with uh, with trapezoids, and I've worked with flag lots. I've never done a horseshoe, so this is my first horseshoe <laughs> case. But it's unique in that um, the property uh, was l was left as a residue parcel of a prior subdivision, um, and it has a lot of road frontage, which for many of you know, many years ago, that, w that created value in property. In today's world, it created decreases value in property because it's associated with uh, with road improvements and whatnot. Uh, but each one of these lots will be um, accessing uh, onto Good Luck Road and to Springfield Road. Um, we've had numerous meetings with uh, Department of, of Permitting Inspections and Enforcement in order to coordinate that with two in two regards. Uh, the first is uh, that um, uh, we have worked with them in order to minimize the points of driveway entrances onto the road. Um, because uh, they didn't want each lot to have a separate entrance that was spaced out across the road. So it, where we could, we have combined driveways uh, in order to um, uh, create limited points of access. And then we've also, because of the size of the lots, are able to accommodate uh, being able to have a turnaround on the lot so that cars don't have to back out into the, into the road when they, when they <coughs> leave the uh, properties. 
Um, and uh, there was a condition that staff has recommended to require that that be demonstrated at the time of building permit, and we're, and we're okay with that. Um, and then the other issue that we, we had to work out with, with uh, DPI was the issues with regard to the, um, the road improvements. We are providing uh, additional dedication of right-of-way. Uh, we'll be widening uh, the road, providing a paved shoulder along the side of the road. Um, one of the other unique features of this property is that when uh, Springfield Road was improved and, and um, years ago, uh, there was a side ditch, if you will, a swale for, for, uh, to, to convey stormwater. And over time, uh, uh, wetland vegetation has grown within that ditch. And as part of the requirement of widening the road, we have to essentially relocate that swale uh, further um, uh, from the current paving. And so that results in the need for the uh, environmental disturbances that are referenced in the staff report. All of the disturbances related to environmental features, whether it's specimen trees, whether it's wetlands, whether it's buffers, are all related to uh, governmental requirements that we have to widen the road, provide storm drain, and provide public utility uh, serving the property. So uh, there is no uh, impact related specifically to the development of the property related to the building of the homes. It's all related to the improvements of the public right-of-way uh, and the provision of utilities and, um, and, uh, and stormwater management. Um, uh, I know we have a few people signed up. I would mo note to the board that we have met twice with the Wingate uh, community. Uh, we attended their annual meeting last year, uh, December 6, 2018, as we were beginning the process of, of bringing the subdivision forward and, and, and showed them what we were proposing to do at the time. Um, and then uh, we, we attended their annual meeting in this, on December 12th of 2019 to also review where we were. Um, Pretty much what had changed from the time that we had originally come to them to now was we, we ended up losing a lot um, as a result of the environmental issues that we had to deal with. Uh, we went from 19 lots to 18 lots. And, um, and then we also had refined our um, access plan with the DPI uh, because of their uh, interest in, in min minimizing the number of entrance points along the road. Uh, but we did um, uh, present that information and provided copies of the uh, of all the plans to their attorney as well. So um, I just want to let the board know that we did reach out to the community and had meetings with them. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at this point in time, and then I'll be glad to come up and address any comments that the community has. Um, one other thing I um, just wanted to mention, as I always do, the staff has recommended several conditions. Uh, we have no proposed revisions to the conditions. We agree to them as written. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haller. And, and as okay. you know, that is an unusual thing. For yes, me. it is. <laughs> I was trying not to grab my heart, okay. Um, okay, so let's call the other folks up and then you'll have the opportunity to come forward. Okay, um, Mr. Howard, I may or may not be pronouncing this correctly. Howard Aldag, okay, please come forward. Just state your name and address for the record. Uh, Howard Aldag, 8485 Springfield Road, Glendale, Maryland. I'm right across from where this is gonna be. Okay, so the other thing is if, you, if every speaker would be close to the mic because um, it's being recorded. So, okay. so just remain close to the mic. I Thank a, you. I have a couple of concerns. Okay. Um, first off, um, way back when Sandy Hill uh, landfill was being closed, uh, this Wingate property was actually one of the proposed sites for being the expansion for Sandy Hill. Okay. I need when, you to pull the mic still a little bit closer because the mic is adjustable. Oh, you don't have to adjust yourself, just adjust the mic. Yeah, okay. okay. And so um, let me go back. Okay. Sandy Hill actually, uh, as you know, was going to be expanded. One of the sites that they looked at expanded very seriously was the Wingate property where this is. Um, they uh, basically made a settlement on not um, using the Wingate property and there's supposed to be a 100-foot buffer around the property right where this proposed subdivision is. And my question is, how could this be? Because it was always supposed to be a 100-foot buffer, and now that has changed. That's one of my questions. Um, the other thing is, I, I saw that there was some zoning changes where this particular property is zoned RE, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that our property remains across the street, RR. Can, um, can I ask 
Can, um, can you sh show us where Mr. Aldag lives? And then you can correct us. Okay, do you see, oh, go back to the, oh, there you go. You see the one with the, the line that goes around it right there? Um, go up north yeah. to those okay, properties. It. Both okay. of those are mine. Okay. No, 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 not there. On Springfield Road. Go up Springfield Road. It, to the left. Yep, right there. Oh, not that one. That one and that one. Those are mine. Okay. And so, and I've been well, there those since those seem to be um, 86. RR. Yeah, okay. okay. I've been there since 86, but um, being that they just changed this for RE, we are hoping that they don't make any changes to our Well, zoning. let me just say this. If, if your zoning yeah. was changed, you would get noted. You would know about it. So, no, what are you saying? Madam Chair, the, the zoning did not change. Yeah, okay. it doesn't, right? I'm saying, but if it, in the future, you know, Correct. you would you would have notice. Correct. So right now, yeah. it's still rural residential RR. Okay. Okay. Um, also, when uh, the new subdivision that is just north of us, right there, where they at, they're right there, uh, when they pick up the kids, um, the and the school bus stops, the, the um, cars actually go past our house, backed up. So, you know, the congestion on the road is something that I think it needs to be addressed, and I don't know if it needs well, a, a light or something. Well, let me ask you this. Do you, have a copy, do you have a copy of the staff report? What report? The, the, for every case that comes before us, there is a technical staff report that is produced. And I don't know if you have one or not, but Mr. Yeah. Hunt is about to give you one. Okay. Okay. Because there is, we do have do, do transportation analysis and traffic analysis. Okay. And I know they're planning to do some things because uh, the road is actually pretty rough. Uh, the last thing is my, my wife and I actually got together with everyone on the street, and we were the ones that put in the sewer. And the sewer line is like 12 foot in our front yard. Okay. And we're wondering how are they going to access the utilities? Uh, the, I got, yeah, the sewer lines, um, which are in the front yard, are we going to have to live through them, you know, digging up our front lawn and going and attaching into the sewer pipe that we actually installed? Okay. Um. A lot of this will be in, in, in the staff report, but you, you will not have enough time to go through the staff report right here, right now. Oh, I did already. Oh, you did? This. So you did have it. That's yeah. what was my question, yeah. if you had a copy. So it's, again, about the property. How did this parcel actually become, because that was part of the, the, you know, the um, Sandy Hill settlement, was that they weren't going to put the expansion there, and they also were going to give us a 100-foot buffer forever, and that's where this is. A um, little bit about traffic. May, we need to be mindful that it's already having a problem. Um, the zoning you answered, thank you. And about the utilities, well, I, make, I don't know how they're going to do the utilities, whether I don't want them to dig up our front yard. Last item, I called the engineer when he was designing this and said, do not make it so that our driveways are right across from each other because we don't want to smack cars. Okay. And I looked and the driveways are right across from each other and um, if we could make a move so that it's offset so that you know we don't have an issue. Okay. And those are my comments. Those are your, those are your concerns. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I know some of this is in here, but we're writing it down. We're taking notes, mm -hmm. and as is the applicant in this case, we're going to see about getting all your questions answered. Okay. okay? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Are there any yeah. questions? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, Leslie Douglas Harding. Hello, my name is Leslie Douglas Harding. I'm at 11302 Wycombe Park Lane. And my concern is the development. Could you go back to the picture yeah. where you yeah. had the, you showed the green that was going to be left? And so we can see where she one. lives as well, too. Yeah, I can see where, this one right here. Is it the buffering? No, there was another one where you had the, it was four houses that came. Yeah, that's it right there. So I'm right down on Wycombe Park, and I'm this. If you come over to the Can last, you, um, wait. Where are we? Where does she, we want to know where you live. That's on what this she's lab. trying to show. Yeah, that's oh, what I'm okay. trying to show you on the map. So, 
Well, you have the four houses there in that circle. Oh, that's where she is. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm back behind them. Okay. Right behind them. Right in that area over there. So my main concern was that area behind me sometimes will get kind of damp and whatnot. So what are they, what's going to be done about the flooding? I read in here the, the, um, on page six, it talks about the storm, storm water management. And it says uh, it is valid until November the 22nd. And after that, there's going to be something else that, that comes into effect in 2022. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah. What's going to come into development in 2022 that's not going to have some type of downstream that's going to come into my backyard? And what is the buffer as far as how many uh, other trees are going to remain? Because right now I have nothing but forest behind me. And with my backyard bumping into, it looks like that backyard, it would be bumping into that. What is going to be the, the barrier, the buffer between the two backyards? How many of the trees are going to go away? Okay. I don't know the, the, the answer to that just yet, but I'm, we're writing down your questions. Okay. And I had one other thing in, in this quickly going over all the promises that are being made in here, along with what the gentleman was talking about. Um, there are no sidewalks or the streets over there are good luck in Springfield. They're not wide streets or anything like that. And to put in more houses, the congestion is going to be, in my view, reading this here, it's going to be busier when you get more of the... Um, more of the homes up, more cars are going to be there. It's going to be a greater impact. And the four-way stop that's um, proposed isn't really going to work. You're going to have cars backed up waiting to just go through a stop sign. It would be more beneficial if they put in a stop light. It would be the same thing if you go further down um, Springfield to 564 to Lenham 7 Road. Something would have to be put there as well with the additional traffic and the different and the um, the additional um, backlog of cars that are going to be stopping just to go across and pass. Um, the other concern I had was I noticed in my cola sac there are the little blue markers around the um, I guess they're like the drainage if you have to go down into the bottom and look at the water and all of that. Um, are there water lines coming into Wycombe Park? Will they be, how is their water going to flow? Okay. That is the other thing. How is that going to impact, you know, digging up, will they have to dig up my yard to get to the pipes that are down in the center of um, Wycombe Park? Okay. Those are some other concerns that I had. Thank you. Um, Madam Vice Chair, has a your question. Comment, I, I thought I heard you said there was a drainage somewhere, but I did not hear you say there was a drainage in your yard. Uh, could you talk a little bit about no, that? No, be, behind my yard, further back, where the woods are, it floods back there sometimes. That's the word you use, flood. Yes, it floods back there. So how are they going to control that flooding? But the flooding, flooding does not happen. come into your yard. It's behind you. Right, it's behind me. But once they put in that development, how is that going to prevent the, the downstream, I guess, the, from the water from coming towards my area? Oh, okay. Thank I, you. I, I, I have a similar question. Can, okay, so you're, you, you've got the marker where she lives, right? Um, is time? that Wycombe Park? Okay, so yeah, so I'm right about where your marker is yeah okay and so the flooding the, the water you're talking about is south of that it's right behind where those four houses it looks like there's going to be four buildings going up right there mm -hmm. okay it's, so it's above you i'm referencing the screen right and so it's right behind me it's, so it's, where it's, they're going to build the houses it, it floods sometimes right good luck road floods that's known the flood over there okay yeah Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions right now? No, none right now. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Douglas Harding. Okay. Um, Bernice Austin? Oh, you did not wish to speak. Okay. Thank you. Um, did, that concludes the folks on the sign-up sheet. Was there anyone who I missed whose name I did not call? Oh, come on. Did you, uh, sir, did you sign up? I didn't. I missed it. Yes. You did? Okay. And what is it?
If you filled out one of these blue forms, you said? Yes. Okay, so I think I can have it. What's, tell me your name. Uh, Jimmy Purvis. Okay. Good morning, Madam okay. Chair and okay. staff. Okay, my, <clears throat> my concern is I live at the 11th. Okay, no, just, just state your name and address for us, please. Okay. My name is Jimmy Purvis. Uh -huh. I live at 11700 Lanham Serving Road, okay. which is at uh, Route 564. And uh, my concern is just listen to everyone speaking. Um, I have a couple of concerns. I live uh, right on Lanham Serving Road, which is almost at the intersection of 564 and Springfield Road. And um, my concern is when this 18 lot, development comes up. It's gonna be traffic uh, coming from that location from Good Luck Road all the way up Springfield Road, going up to Route 564, which I live. I own an acre <coughs> of land. Uh, I had a house built in uh, 1997, and at that point it was mostly woods in that area. Now I've seen the area uh, grow. And uh, since then, <clears throat> I had peace and quiet my family and I uh, raised my family there with the traffic going flowing past uh, Atlanta Serving Road. But since that time with the development coming over in a different area, um, the traffic began to build up. So now I notice the traffic starts flowing around 5.30 or something. And it's beginning to be annoying with the traffic. And uh, now with the other development they put in Serving Crossing, the traffic is coming across Springfield Road, going to Route 564, which I live right on that corner. Um, I also noticed that traffic is coming from Crawford, doing a shortcut uh, to get over to Washington, D.C., and get out to the Beltway. Um, and also, they're coming from Annapolis, 50. They're coming down route through Old Bowie, through Route 564, and they're coming to pass my home. So. Uh, my concern is the traffic, the traffic. And uh, I heard one of the young ladies mention about the, uh, the young man that was speaking, representing the, the uh, division, uh, about putting a traffic light around, a stop sign. Well, if you put a traffic light at the intersection of uh, Springfield Road and Atlanta Servant Road, which I ran on that corner, um, you're going to have traffic backing up all the way down Atlanta Serving Road to Route 193, which is the main stretch. 193 and Atlanta Serving Road 564 cross each other. You're going to have traffic backing up all the way from that location, 193, during rush hour and before, all the way up in front of my house with traffic going to actually stop. It's getting to a point now that traffic is actually stopping there at that location because it, it built up with the development and turning left, going on Springfield Road to go back out to Crawford or wherever they're doing the shortcut. So my thing is, uh, we don't need a traffic light there at that intersection of Crawford, I'm sorry, at the intersection of um, Springfield don't, Road don't and Atlanta Serving Road. Okay. And Atlanta Serving Road. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think we need a uh, traffic light there because once you put a traffic light there, the traffic gonna stop Traffic going to back up all the way down to 193 on Lanham Seven Road, and also going to back up with the traffic going on um, Springfield Road. Um, now the traffic is flowing. It's flowing okay. at the intersection. There have been several accidents there since the, um, okay. um, the development had came up, several accidents in the area, but we still we did an investigation on it. I did a report on it. I went to the councilman. We spoke on my, my ward four. Um, we decided we don't need a traffic light there because it's going to make it worse. You don't so, need to worry about that right now because we don't have the authority to impose this traffic light. That's something yeah. that would, a study would be done. If, if well, I'm, I'm just forcing my okay. concern okay. about okay. what may take place okay. if they approve this 18 lot development. Okay. That's, that's my main concern. Okay. Um, so um, other than that, um, I oppose it. Okay. Yes, I definitely oppose it. And um, can I get a copy of the staff report also? Sure you can. Okay. Sure you can. We'll make sure you have it. Okay. Just for everyone, so, so that people, um, everyone knows that you, the staff report is published online. 
um, uh, um, well in advance of the hearing. So just so, so everyone can download and be prepared, just so you know, and we'll make sure you have it. And also, I have you, uh, Mr. Purvis, I have you signed up. You signed up on item five. Is Was that... Um, was that an uh, a error? Mistake? Okay, because yes. I don't know if you're on both of them. Okay, yes. so that's why I missed it. Okay. Yeah, thank no you problem. very much for your time. No, thank, thank you very you. much okay. for coming, and okay. we'll see you about getting some yes. of your questions answered. Yes. Okay. Okay. Was there anyone else who I may have missed? Okay, Mr. Haller. Thank you once again, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, again, Thomas Haller on behalf of the applicant. Um, I heard several c concerns raised. Let me just go through. Can you raise the mic too? I'm sorry. Let me just go through the various concerns that I heard. Um, Mr. Aldeg mentioned the Sandy um, Hill landfill. Um, I, that his comment to me prior to the hearing about that was the first I'd heard of it. Um, so um, it predates even me. Uh, but I will look into. Uh, obviously, if there's any issues there, we're gonna. The property owner needs to know about it. But so we'll look into it. Um, but I'm not, there is, certainly isn't anything that I've seen in the history of this case that references any kind of a buffer on this property, but we'll, we'll definitely need to look into it uh, because it isn't a regulatory requirement if it exists, it exists in some other, in other, some other form, so I'd have to try to find it. Um, with regard to the driveway locations, I mentioned earlier that we've been working with DPI to try to minimize the impact of the driveways. Um, and there's two things that we've done, one is to to have them located next to one another in order to reduce points of access. The other is to design the, lot, the driveways and the lots so that they have turnaround so people don't back out into the road, which is one of his concerns. But what we will also do is, well, while we don't control ultimately the access, it's the DPI that controls it, we can take a little bit closer look um, at the property line to try to make sure to see what we can do about offsetting it so that his concern is addressed even more. It may have already been addressed in our last conversations with uh, with DPI, our last revisions with DPI, uh, but I'll take a, we'll take a closer look at that and see if we can create a greater offset than what, um, you know, uh, w what may already exist. But we, we will certainly look at that. Um, he referenced the sewer. This, uh, we, there, when sewer was installed, uh, as WSSC always does, they provide sewer easements. And it's my understanding that there's a sewer easement that's available for us to tap into that's already uh, been created. Um, and so um, obviously we'll be working with WSSC to make sure that it's done in accordance with any recorded easement agreements. Um, and, uh, but it's my understanding, or it's our understanding that those easements already exist. Um, and so the, the goal would be to obviously not do anything that would be outside any of the existing granted um, easements. Um, Ms. Harding raised a couple of issues, um, and she lives on Wycombe Park Lane. The um, a couple of things that I wanted to point out. First of all, the, um, Glendale Road topographically is lower than her lot. I think her lot is somewhere in the vicinity, according to the engineer, about 20 feet above where the road is. All the stormwater drains toward the road. Um, there are a number of things that we are doing. Um, number one is, is that um, there are a couple of existing uh, substandard uh, drainage pipes, culverts, that run under Glendale Road. They're old uh, metal pipes and uh, DPI has told us that we have to upgrade them and put in a bigger concrete pipe. So we will be improving drainage along um, Glendale Road. So that may address the con one concern she raised. Secondly, uh, we are providing, if you look at the, at the tree conservation plan, I think that uh, David had earlier, you'll see that blue area. That blue area is a submerged gravel wetland that's part of our on-site stormwater management requirements to make sure that we don't add uh, storm drainage. We have one on each road. Um, basically, the water runs to the road and then there are pipes that bring it under the road and so we're going to be upgrading all of the existing drainage in the area uh, as part of this development. Um, and then the other thing is, is that we, you know, we, we've been trying uh, to the best that we can to, pro, to, to meet all of our tree conservation requirements on site. Um, and and uh, one of the things that we, so you see the areas in green are areas of proposed tree preservation. Now staff did raise an issue. There are a couple of lots that are over 40,000 square feet, but under one acre in size, which would be 43,000 square feet. 
uh, where we're proposing tree preservation, but the ordinance does not allow us to put tree preservation on lots under an acre in size. And so they've recommended that we have to provide tree preservation on those, which would have to go offsite. Uh, we'll still preserve those trees, but I, I know that the board is familiar with issues in the past where tree conservation easements have been imposed on smaller lots and homeowners go out and take a tree down and then they get into trouble and so there's a threshold of an acre um, I've talked to the engineer we're going to try to see if we can adjust some of the lot lines to try to to have um, more lots I mean, because we had some lots that are like 42,000 square feet and they don't need much to get to the 43,000 but either way we're going to try to preserve as many trees on site as we can and those trees that you see behind uh, Wycoming Park Lane um, and then you can sort of see the tree line on their lots as well. Those, those are all proposed to be preserved. And the trees on those four lots around the uh, Alagabi Court, um, those lots are over 43,000. So they will be uh, subject to a tree preservation easement. Um, so I think that would address the, her concern there. Um, she, she mentioned that um, uh, Springfield and Glendale are not wide right now. Um, and as you can see, this property is nothing but frontage on Springfield and uh, Glendale Road. And so DPI has already indicated to us that we're going to have to mill and overlay the, our uh, half section of the road all the way down. Um, we're going to be widening the road, the, 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 the travel lane width of the road on our side. We're going to be providing a six foot paved shoulder to allow for bicyclists and, 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 and pedestrians. And all of that will improve traffic. Uh, movement will improve traffic safety will also improve site distance at the intersection all of which has is impeded by the existing vegetation that's in the right-of-way that we're going to end up having to, to, to remove so um, th there will be improvements being made as, in conjunction with this subdivision um, um, Ms. Harding also mentioned about water uh, from Wycoming Park Lane uh, the water our water is going to be coming from Glendale Road we won't be extending water from why coming park lane to get to our property so we won't be doing anything on on that side on her property or the properties adjacent to it to extend water from there um and then um uh and then mr uh, purvis's comments about the intersection i would just point out that because of the relatively small size of this subdivision we provided traffic counts at the request of at the request of the transportation division we didn't do a formal analysis we provided traffic counts to transportation division they did an analysis and the conclusion of the analysis is set forth in your um, in your backup as you know for um, an, a non-signalized intersection like 564 and Springfield Road we now have a, uh, a three-tier test to, to determine whether it's even required to do a tr signal warrant analysis and in as staff has indicated in the staff report uh, it passes the three-tier test so that a signal warrant study isn't even um, indicated as being warranted in this particular circumstance. Um, and so, and as the chair pointed out, it's DPI that controls whether traffic signal can or can't be put in on any of these intersections. But your transportation staff may have more to add to that, but um, that's, that's what we uh, took from the analysis. So... Um before you, before you go, I see we're talking, you um, good job in answering a lot of those questions. Um, I know I call for everyone to speak, and I know we're talking about the Glendale area, the Wingate, and um, um, F Lanham Severn Road, and I just can't help but wonder if there was anyone that I missed from the Glendale area who might have wished to speak. Ms. Medford, okay. No, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. That was just a shout out to Ms. Von Der Beck. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions of Mr. Haller? Does the board have any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, is there a motion? Madam Chair, move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve preliminary plan 4 18025 and TCP 1 010 2019 and approve the variance to section 25 122B. 1G, along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, please, we're going to set up for item five.
about the good stuff. That's a College Park Marriott. Mr. Heller, if, if, if there are any further comments, thank you. Okay, Mr. Simon, item five. Well, let me let them clear out. They're, they're taking a moment. No problem. Okay, Mr. Simon, we're good to go. Um, let, let me do this. Um, we have addition. We're taking item five, which is uh, College Park Marriott a Preliminary Plan 4-18027. We do have um, additional info um, from um, from you, Mr. Simon. So is this something that we we're just getting this, and so we need to um, add this into the record? Um, um, it's, a, it's a corrected table, transportation uh, it, trip cap, trip table. It was submitted yesterday as backup. Before noon or afternoon? Uh, I'm not sure of the actual. Okay, so let's just accept it into the record as. as before, it should be before noon. Before noon. Before, so we're good. Yes, okay, we're thank you. Okay, I just want to make sure. Was there anything else from item five? I know we had supplemental for item eight. I don't think there was anything else for item five. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am David Simon, Planner Coordinator with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Item number five on the agenda is the Preliminary Plan of Subdivision for College Park Marriott 4-18027. The subject prop the applicant proposes one parcel for mixed-use development, including 123,395 square feet of lodging and commercial development. As a matter of housekeeping, an error to a data table was discovered in the technical staff report, and a memorandum dated January 22, 2020, was provided as additional backup, outlining the revisions needed to provide a corrected table. No other recommended findings or conditions are affected by this correction. The site is located in the northern part of Prince George's County, within Planning Area 66 and Council District 3. The subject property is located in the northwest quadrant of the intersection of Campus Drive and Corporal Frank S. Scott Drive. The property consists of 2.11 acres as within the M mixed use infill MUI zone and is located within Aviation Policy Area 6. The site will be subject to height and noise notification standards which will be addressed at the time of detailed site plan and final plat. The property is within the Transit District Overlay Zone and is subject to the 2015 approved College Park, Riverdale Park Transit Development District Plan, TDDP. The aerial photograph shows the site is currently a surface parking lot. The site map shows the topography of the site to be generally flat given the existence surface parking. The master plan right of way map shows Campus Drive a master plan collector right of way south and west of the site, and River Road, a master plan collector right of way extending south from Campus Drive. 
The critical intersections determined to be impacted by the development are highlighted with red bullseyes on this slide and are further described in detail in the technical staff report. Given the proposed development, it was found that the critical intersections would continue to operate at adequate levels of service. Knox Road is a dedicated but unbuilt roadway that crosses the southern side of the subject property. The proposed development will completely subsume the portion of Knox Road. Therefore, the applicant should seek vacation of Knox Road between Corporal Frank S. Scott Drive and Campus Drive prior to final plat pursuant to this preliminary plan of subdivision. Given that this section of Knox Road serves no properties other than those covered by this subject application, staff is in support of the vacation of the section of Knox Road. Adequate transportation facilities will exist to serve the proposed subdivision as required in accordance with section 24124 of the subdivision regulations, subject to conditions outlined in the technical staff report. The site's location in College Park Metro Center requires the construction of off-site bicycle and pedestrian improvements. The applicant has proposed off-site improvements of new sidewalks, including with American with Disabilities Act compliance access ramps at the intersection of Old Calvert Road and Edmondson Road, which is east of the subject site. Staff supports these improvements. This slide shows the bird's eye existing conditions of the subject site. In this slide, the subject property is outlined in red. The roads are in blue, and green represents the site's total coverage by the floodplain of the lower <coughs> northeast branch of the Washington. Anacostia Thank River you. watershed. Thank you. The applicant has requested a variation from 24122A for the decrease in required width of public utility easements from 10 feet to 5 feet along all sides of the property, which all abut public rights of way, and highlighted in yellow. The variation justification is provided in the technical staff report, and staff recommends approval. Adequate public facilities, including water, sewer, fire, rescue, and police facilities, are all available to serve the subject site. Primary management area impacts are proposed to the entirety of the site given its location wholly within a floodplain. A justification for the impact was provided and is supported by staff. In order to mitigate the floodplain on site, the applicant was required to find locations for compensatory floodplain storage. The applicant worked closely with park and planning staff and the City of College Park to find appropriate locations for compensatory storage in proximity to the site. On the northwest side of the College Park Airport is demarcated by the long red rectangle on this slide. A linear storage swale has been determined to be the most opportune site for the location of this compensatory storage easement area. A term sheet has been signed to by the Department of Parks and Recreation and the applicant's team stipulating the terms of this agreement for the use of the College Park Airport's airfield as a location for the de this development site's compensatory storage. The subdivision and zoning staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve preliminary plan 4-18027 and variation to section 24122A subject to the 11 conditions contained in the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Are there questions of Mr. Simon at this time? Okay, Mr. Horn. Good morning, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the planning board. For the record, Can Arthur you raise Horn, the Thank you. Uh, with the law office of Shipping and Horn in Largo, Maryland. Uh, here on behalf of the applicant, New County Hotel LLC. Uh, New County Hotel LLC is really uh, uh, representatives from uh, Republic Properties. Here today, we have Mr. Stephen Grigg uh, and Mr. Stacy Hornstein. And also from the Mark Vogel companies, we have here uh, Mr. Mark Vogel. And uh, our uh, engineer uh, is from Soltes, Mr. Uh, David Bickle. Uh, Madam Chairman, I uh, want to discuss this just briefly. First, Bob, by saying uh, we agree 100% with staff's recommendations, have no changes, no edits. Uh, <laughs> so very pleased to, <laughs> to report that. What was that? I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't believe it. I, I tried, the, the staff will tell you, I tried, but uh, we, we, we came to an agreement. Um, but I wanted to say that uh, is, although we represent the applicant, the property is owned by Prince George's County. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a part of an RFQ that was uh, asked, the county wanted to have a hotel site across from the College Park Metro. 
And uh, when they sent out the RFQ and, and had people bid on it, uh, the property was not listed in the floodplain. And there was a reconfiguration of what the floodplain was going to be. And, uh, and then it, all of a sudden, this entire property was in the floodplain. So, um, the, you know, this applicant could have turned around and run away because that adds a tremendous amount of cost to the development and difficulty. Uh, but they have worked uh, hand in hand with the uh, Office of Central Services, with, as you heard, the uh, Park and Planning Department of Parks, as well as the City of College Park, to uh, recognize, as the city will tell you, that this is an area that they really would like to see developed. Uh, and uh, it's part of a whole revitalization that's going on down in that area. And uh, the county specified a Marriott uh, type of use, and uh, you know the applicant has been you know working diligently to make that happen, and uh, they will make it happen. So, uh, Madam Chairman, I, I will have my team here available to answer any questions you might have, uh, but I just want to say that uh, they are uh, very thrilled to be a part of this uh, process, to work with the City of College Park, to work with the the county to, to make this uh, request become a reality. Thank you. Are there questions of Mr. Horn at this time? Just Commissioner Dorner. <clears throat> not really a question, but just sort of a suggestion. So I actually rode through the, the lot the, a couple weeks ago, um, and I ride through that area quite a bit because we have a lot of facilities around there. So when you guys get to fruition, assuming that you get the, um, the approvals going forward, if you could have like in the brochure section of the hotel a couple of the brochures from the commission because we have right there the tennis complex we have the airport museum mm -hmm. we have an ice skating rink and a hockey and a pool right there we have a bike trail system right around there so not just the college park university of maryland area but we ourselves have a ton of facilities around there that the guests as they come in whether they're going to the university of maryland mm -hmm. if they're coming outside of dc because it's literally across the street from the metro or if they're around and they have extra time that they could use our facilities because we have a ton right there. And there's a couple new bike trails that go around that they can run. There's nice woods. I saw probably half a dozen deer um, back in the woods back there um, just a couple weekends ago. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kind of areas that the, the hotel guests can get into that are all basically linked to our services. So if you could grab a couple of our brochures when you get to final stages, if you get all the way through, that would be great. No question, I can speak for them. They will definitely do that. We'll be back in front of this board for the detailed site plan with reference to this project. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments from Mr. Horn? Um, so you had we had someone sign up in opposition, but it turned out to be a mistake. So, um, Ms. So I don't have anyone other than Ms. Shum. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good morning. Can you adjust the mic down? I am not here in opposition, okay. Terry Shum, representing the City of College Park. I am also here in complete agreement with your staff's recommendation. What a good day uh, it is. And I, so far. So it's far. not going to go too well in the afternoon. Okay. And um, I do want to echo Mr. Horn's um, comments about how excited the City of College Park is to see something happening finally in the metro station area. There's been a transit district development plan here for many years. It's been slow to get off the ground. And we know a huge constraint in this area is the floodplain. And uh, it, it will continue to be problematic for the future development of this area. So we're hoping we can all work together to find a way to, to find solutions to uh, be able to uh, redevelop this this area. So in regard to the, um, the plan and the private road that will be created uh, through the lot, it's, uh, is that shown? It's not, is it shown somewhere? So any, it will basically continue River Road um, north through the site, and this will create a new front for this project, and then also be an important framework uh, for redevelopment uh, in the rest of the area. And it is consistent with what the TDDP called for, so I really want to thank the applicant for um, 
putting that in the plan and helping to realize the, uh, the master plan for this area. Also, I'd like to um, say that we're looking forward to the off-site uh, bicycle pedestrian improvements. It will, there's a number of options on the table. The specifics of those will be addressed during the detailed site plan phase. But I just want to say that they're all very good, complete streets type of improvements that will provide really important connections to all of the facilities that you just mentioned in the area that the commission owns. So um, this project will uh, be a benefit for that as well. So uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Ms. Shem, don't leave yet. Thank you. Are there any questions of Ms. Shem? Mr. Horn, can you please join Ms. Shem right there? So. We, we, um, not only is this good, good because it's, a pro it's proximate to the, the metro station, which is, has been long awaiting some nice development there, but also it's adjacent to our field of first. You know, the College mm -hmm. Park Aviation Airport is the oldest continuously operating airport in the world where they have fields of first. So my question is, do either of you knew, know who, and it's on uh, Frank, uh, Corporal Frank S. Scott. Um, drive. So, so do you know who? That, do you all know who that was? <laughs> you do. David does. Uh, oh. Corporal Frank S. Scott was the first. <laughs> Is the first? Go ahead. You're right. He's, I hear you going. He's the, the first direction. enlisted airman of a uh, non-Air Force to pass away at College Park In an Park aircraft airport. incident, yeah. correct. Oh. Correct. And so oh, if we're going to be building yeah. over there, you need to know that tidbit, Can why it's why that it's on that road. OK, <laughs> that was it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Horn knew that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, that's OK. It's one more. Th it's just one more little tidbit about that area. The Wright brothers flew out of that airport. OK. Um, was there anyone else to speak on this matter? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve preliminary plan 4-18027 and approve the variation from section 24-122A along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I just had to discussion. Okay. Also, just besides the brochures, sometimes in the hotels you can actually have paintings or pictures of like surrounding areas. Incorporating the history around that, that location would be great. So if you can put in stuff maybe about the, the airport, that would be awesome. Um, we can Because it really give like a local flavor. Yeah, and we have staff who obviously are well versed in some of the history, and we have tons of things that we can provide um, if you get to that stage. And I, I'm really happy to see that this is coming in and, and an infill in that area because it's starting to really take off. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so under dis uh, any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Item 9. After item nine, the board's going to take a five minute break and then we, we will resume with item eight. So I got a text from John Rose. Oh, you do. Do whatever you want. Okay, Mr. Rowe. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Scott Rowe with the Long Range Planning Section, joined today by uh, Thomas Lester and Andrew McCray, also okay. the Long Range Planning Section. Uh, okay. We're here today to seek the board's permission to uh, transmit uh, the uh, initiation request to the County Council for a new master plan for Bowie in vicinity. It's a 59 square mile area of Prince, northeastern Prince George's County. Uh, planning area 71A, 71B, 74A, and 74B, inclusive of the city of Bowie. Uh, this plan would uh, replace the 2006 uh, approved master plan for Bowie and vicinity and the 2010 Bowie State Mark sector, uh, Mark Station sector plan. Uh, we uh, included the details of the goals, proposed goals, concepts, and guidelines for the master plan. Uh, in our staff uh, backup package. Um, we'll also be seeking uh, approval of an eight-month extension Station. of the time period to prepare preliminary master plan uh, pursuant to recent practice. Okay. Um, so all the information is in the staff report. It is. That move approval, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, ma'am. I move approval. And I'll second. second. 
<laughs> we have a motion in a second. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Thank uh, you. And, and, and we concur with that extension because you need the, you know, citizen engagement. So we exactly. appreciate it so much. Thank you to all of you. Um, we had a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. We're going to take a five minute break, come back with um, item eight. Um, okay, the planning board is back in session. We have before us um, item eight. And so we're, um, Mr. Lynch and crew, if you'd like to come on forward. Mr. Diaz Campbell, you can get started. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, I am Eddie Diaz Campbell, senior planner with the subdivision and zoning section. Item number eight on the agenda is the preliminary plan of subdivision. I'm sorry, can I hear you quite? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Item number eight on the agenda is the preliminary plan of subdivision for Crane Commons, 4 18016. The subject project proposes 75 lots and 12 parcels for mixed use development to include 75 townhouse units and 9,965 square feet of commercial development. For reasons I will discuss in this presentation, SAS recommendation is disapproval of the preliminary plan of subdivision, as well as the associated variance and variation. As a matter of housekeeping, yesterday's staff received a number of emails from members of the public mm -hmm. giving their opposition to this project. These have been provided to the planning board as additional backup. Okay, so so this was yesterday evening, you said? Um, Yes. Madam, Madam Chair, we had some that were received before 12 noon yesterday, and there were some that were received after okay. 12. Okay. I have the stack that are in front of me, um, and I don't know which came in, so I'm going to accept all of those in, um, and they're all in opposition, I think? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So we're going to accept all these opponents' emails um, into the record as um, a, uh, just a group opponents exhibit number 1A through whatever, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, the applicant has also provided uh, three digital files, which they would like to uh, present uh, after my own Wait presentation. Minute, one more thing. Oh yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so say that again. I'm sorry. Um, the applicant has also provided three digital files, which they would like to present after my own presentation. Okay. Um, okay. No. The site is located in the southern portion of Prince George's County within planning area 82A and Council District 9. More specifically, the site is located on the east side of northbound US 301, about 160 feet south of its intersection with Maryland 382, also known as Croom Road. The subject site is located partially in the rural residential or RR zone and partially in the Commercial Shopping Center, or CSC Zone. It is bound to the northeast by commercial development in the CSC Zone and by Croom Road, with single-family detached residential in the Residential Agricultural, or RA Zone, beyond. Adjacent properties to the southeast and southwest are zone Residential Estate, RE, and are vacant and developed with single-family detached residential, respectively. US 301 bounds the site to the northwest the property beyond zone CSC and developed with commercial uses. This aerial photograph shows the site is developed with two existing single family detached dwellings along Croom Road and a gas station along US 301. These are all proposed to be raised. The photo also shows the aforementioned surrounding uses, which are generally rural in character.
The site map shows that the site has a varied topography. The terrain slopes steeply towards the west and south of the property into the Charles Branch Stream Valley. The master plan right of way map shows the rights of way plan for US 301, Croom Road, Trumps Hill Road, and Osborne Road. US 301 is currently an arterial roadway, but the master plan shows it divided up into a major collector and a freeway, with the two diverging at this site. As planned, the proposed right of way would take up a majority of the subject site. Because of this, staff reached out to the State Highway Administration to ask if SHA wanted to have the affected portion of the site placed in reservation. As a result, staff does not recommend SHA's response was that they had no comments regarding the reservation. As a result, staff does not recommend reservation for any portion of the property. The only proposed right-of-way dedication is a 6,808 square foot strip along US 301, meant to bring the existing arterial right-of-way width to 150 feet. The stars represent critical intersections, including one entrance for the residential portion of the site on Croom Road, and two entrances for the commercial portion on US 301. Because US 301 is an arterial, the applicant is requesting a variation from the subdivision regulations to allow them to take direct access from an arterial roadway. Staff has reviewed this request and finds it is sufficiently justified. However, staff is still compelled to recommend disapproval of the variation due to the project's overall recommendation of disapproval. This aerial shows a closer in view of the subject site. The preliminary plan shows the 75 lots and 12 parcels outlined in red. The existing and proposed pavement is shown in blue. The primary mansion area, PMA, is shown in green. The proposed right-of-way dedication can be seen along the US 301 frontage here. Adequate public facilities, including water, sewer, fire, rescue, and police facilities are available to serve the subject site. During review of this project, staff found that there were few development standards available which could be used to analyze the proposed site layout. As currently written, the RR zone permits townhouse units on this site, but does not provide any bulk standards for townhouses such as net lot area, lot coverage, frontage, setbacks, or density. Passing the council bills which structured the zoning ordinance in this way, CB-122-2017, and CV-75-2018 also ensured that conformance to the related standards of the Subregion 6 Area Master Plan was not required per Section 24-121A5 of the Subdivision Regulations. As a result, staff is compelled to rely on the Plan Prince George's 2035 Approved General Plan as the most authoritative guiding document available for determining appropriate development standards for the site. Staff is recommending disapproval of this PPS because it does not conform to the general plan. Staff finds that the PPS contradicts Plan 2035's Growth Policy 1, Community Character Principle 6, and Policy HD 13.5 in the Community Heritage, Culture, and Design element. The plan is not in character with the existing surrounding low density development pattern, and so is not context sensitive, as recommended by Plan 2035 for established communities. Staff makes these findings because Plain 2035 places this property in the residential low land use category, which recommends a density of 3.5 dwelling units per acre or lower. The proposed density of the site at 7.7 .7 dwelling units per net acre is over 100% higher than this. A much lower number of dwelling units would be needed for the site to be consistent with the predominant character of the existing surrounding large lot residential development. This application is subject to the Woodland Conservation Ordinance, and a, and a TCP-1 has been filed with the application. This TCP-1 shows the parcels in red, pavement in blue, and PMA in green. The approximate locations of PMA impacts are shown by the green triangles, while specimen trees proposed for removal are shown by the circled green Xs. A variance request has been submitted for the removal of the specimen trees. Staff has analyzed the PMA impacts and the specimen tree variance request and found that both are sufficiently justified. However, staff is recommending disapproval of both the PMA impacts and specimen tree variance due to the overall recommendation of disapproval for the project. These next three 
slides show the proposed PMA impacts in greater detail. PMA Impact 1 is located west of the commercial site, close to who US 301. PMA Impacts 2 to 4 are located southwest of the townhouses. PMA Impacts 5 and 6 are located southeast of the townhouses, close to Croom Road. In conclusion, the subdivision and zoning staff recommends that the planning board disapprove preliminary plan of subdivision 4-18016, associated variance from section 25-122B1G, and associated variation from section 24-121A3. The recommendation of, of disapproval is based on the project's nonconformance to section 24-103A, 24-104A2, and 24-121A5 of the subdivision regulations, all of which require conformance to the Plan 2035 General Plan. The major issues of, this of the project are recapped on this slide. If the project were to be approved, staff would recommend a significant reduction in the number of lots on site so that a density of no more than 3.5 units per acre is achieved. With this lower density, the current lotting pattern may be infeasible. This final slide is an exhibit created by staff which shows 34 lots, the maximum number which could be achieved under a density of 30.5 units per acre. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions to Mr. Diaz Campbell? So, just to, Mr. Cla Dorner. to okay. clarify, so the last slide I think was helpful um, in terms of your overall, or the, I guess maybe the second last one where you summarize the points that you have sort of in contention. Just to orient ourselves, since we have opposition and this could go long, um, the issues are not that you're fine with the two variances. Assuming if we were to approve this application, you'd actually be fine with the two variances. You've only disapproved them because you you don't support the application, and you're fine with the TCP. It's just the the conformance of the general plan and the other bullet points you've put here. That's correct. If this project were to be approved, we'd recommend approval of the variance variation and the TCP. One, each of them. one is a variation. Yeah, one one's for the arterial roadway, yeah, the yeah. for the trees, and then you have yeah, the TCP. Yeah, because I'm just saying. Yeah. So, when it's the subdivision regs, it's a variation. When it's the rest oh, of the sorry, zone, the one is a variance. Yeah, that's sorry. what I'm saying. My apologies. Okay. okay thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch, please adjust the mic to you, your level. For the record, Dan Lynch with the law firm McNamee Hosey here on behalf of the applicant. Um, I think it's up a little bit. I think you need PMG, to I'm, I'm going to lean into it, it a little bit too. Up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, here on behalf of the applicant, PMG. Um, as uh, staff indicated, we're here um, on a preliminary plan of subdivision for a property located at Croom Road and 301. Um, just to orient you, it's located directly across the street from Osborne Shopping Center. Um, the property is currently developed with a, an older gas station, um, and um, and we're looking at doing something where we could uh, develop a commercial strip along 301, and then behind that we do the townhouses. Um, just for the purposes of making sure the record is straight, I have. Um, an exhibit which I asked staff to uh, put into the presentation. And if you'd like, the board can either take administrative notice of um, the decision um, or I have copies of the district council's decision relative well, to the subject property. Able to take administrative notice, okay. but if you have one there, it would be helpful for okay. us to see. And we can still take administrative notice. Now, this uh, this exhibit and what I'm having um, handed out to you just goes to the development history of the property, which was missing from the staff report. Um, in 2013, the district council approved a special exception for the commercial portion of the subject property, um, which called for the redevelopment of that, 
the existing gas station with a 4,200 square foot C store, a 1,200 square foot um, uh, car wash, and eight multi-product dispensers under a canopy. Um, this significantly expands the development envelope of what's out there today. And as a matter of fact, our stormwater concept plan associated with that special exception uh, shows that we'd be locating a stormwater management pond on the residential portion of the property. Um, and I just want to make sure that the record included this information because staff talked about what was approved out there, but somehow neglected to include this in the uh, information provided to the board. Now, in addition to the special exception, the district council also approved the permit permission to build within the right away because, as staff pointed out, okay. So I need this is just me speaking. Sure. I need for you to um, to slow down and take us through sure. why. I understand what our staff's position was and why, and um, I. I'm, Obviously, you disagree. So, in order for me to understand why you disagree, please take me through slowly on this, uh, on the purpose of giving, uh, providing the sure. district council decision, and and three well, because it's missing from it's missing from the staff report they provided with the development history, but this is not right. referenced in the development history of the property. This okay. is an approval obtained from the district council in 2013 okay, and the three for the redevelopment okay. of the commercial portion of the property. Okay. Okay. And I just want them to, for the board to understand, and, and I'll get into a bit this in my further explanation, okay. board to understand what's currently approved for the subject property, which is a little bit different than what was presented to you by the staff in the staff report. Mm. Um, this is a 2013 approval of a special exception for the commercial portion of the property. And again, it does incorporate um, a storm management pond on the residential portion. But if I may continue, mm -hmm. um, I'm bring this to your attention because I want you to understand how we got to where we are today with regard to the proposal to redevelop the commercial as well as the residential portion of this property. So in 2013, we had uh, the special exception approved for this site as well as the departure and the uh, authorization both in the right of way. Soon thereafter, we had discussions about what alternatives um, could be developed on the site. My client, PMG, owns a number of gas station sites um, throughout the county, throughout the region, throughout the United States. And in situations where um, they own adjoining property or have the opportunity to purchase adjoining property, they look at alternatives to developing those with gas stations and coming up with something such as proposed here today, which is a mix of a residential and commercial development. So in this situation, as Staff indicate to you we not only own the, the commercial portion, but we also own the adjoining residential portion. And then we also have a contract to purchase some additional residential that fronts on Croom Road. That being said, we worked with the council and um, in and in twenty seventeen the council enacted C B one twenty two two thousand seventeen. This is an amendment to the table of uses for the RR and CSC zones that allow townhouses in the RR zone under specific circumstances. We thereafter filed a preliminary plan of subdivision with staff um, in 2018. And soon after that was filed, we were informed by staff that we'd also be required to obtain an amendment to the subdivision regulations um, to allow private roads in the RR zone. And was, as you'll remember, um, when we filed the original preliminary plan, um, at the time that preliminary plan came before this board, that bill had not been signed by the county executive. We thereafter withdrew our preliminary plan and then worked again with the council on a private roads bill. The council, um, and it's contained in CB 81 2018, um, enacted a private roads bill that allowed private roads in the RR zone, and that was thereafter signed by the county executive. Based upon that um, action, we refiled a preliminary plan of subdivision for the subject property, which is before you today. Um, one other thing I should note, um, based upon the staff report in the prior preliminary plan of subdivision for this site, one of the concerns raised by staff um, was that there were no development standards contained in the 
uh, legislation allowing townhouses in the R zone. Um, the council looked at that and then enacted another piece of legislation, which is CB 75 2018. And then CB 75 2018 did provide some standards for development of townhouses in the RR zone. And this preliminary plan of subdivision was filed pursuant to um, the council's action on CB 75 2018. Now, I've gone through the um, staff report, and as staff indicated, uh, which I think we took a lot of time um, after the SDRC meeting on here, and amended our preliminary plan, and I think we've addressed, as indicated by staff, most of the technical issues with regard to the preliminary plan. Um, staff is satisfied with the normal issues such as adequacy of public facilities, it seems to be satisfied with the issues with regard to the um, environmental issues, but for their position on the overall preliminary plan of subdivision, they'd be recommending uh, support for our variations, um, and there would be actually no other issues. So it really comes down to, um, in reviewing the staff report, um, their application of plan 2035 with regard to this plan, and their position this, that this proposed preliminary plan does not comply with uh, plan 2035. Uh, the points raised by staff with regard to um, this application are compliance with plan 35. Um, if you note, for instance, on page five of the technical staff report, they note that the plan contradicts the growth policy one, which concentrates most of new development in the regional district and local centers that are not near the application site but are mostly located near the western edge of the county, away from the rural and agricultural areas. Um, this finding by staff, this conclusion by staff, I mean, it completely ignores Plan 35. If you look at Map 11 contained in Plan 35, okay, there are regional districts and local centers located in the central and eastern portions of the county. I mean, you're familiar with some of these. There's a center located in Bowie. There's a center located in Brandywine. So for the staff to state that um, this contradicts the plan because most of the growth is to occur within the western portion of the county completely ignores the plain reading of Plan 2035. Now I understand that this property is not within a center and I understand that this property is, uh, is um, not in a transit district, but again, Plan 35 merely encourages development within those areas. It doesn't require development. So that conclusion by staff completely ignores the plain reading of Plan 2035. This property is located in the slide behind you because it's in the yellow area. It's located in an established community. And Plan 35 encourages redevelopment in established communities, and that's what we're doing. Now, I think where we, staff and we disagree is as to the density that is being proposed for this. And they feel that the density exceeds that recommended by Plan 35. Now, staff's conclusion <coughs> with regard to the density it's based upon based upon the maps contained within Plan 35. And Map 10, which is found on page 101, and I have a copy if the board would like to see it, or you can take administrative notice of Map 10. Okay. Even though we're capable of taking administrative notice, we're going to um, accept um, the three decisions that you have referenced into the record as applicants exhibit number one, A through C, and then um, okay, I always feel we'll, it's a little bit better to have the paper in front of you. Okay, and then we're going to take um, <clears throat> The future, um, generalized future land use map 
that was in the approved general plan. Uh, specifically, we're looking at page 101. We're going to accept that into the record as applicants. Exhibit number two. Thank you. Now, map 10 is entitled Generalized Future Land Use Map. And it shows the subject property being located within residential low land use category. I didn't, okay, residential low what? Land use category. Oh, land you use, look at okay. the land I use category. Hear you, okay. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this map, if you look at the text below, it specifically states, the map generalizes future land use de designations shown in approved sector and master plans. It does not follow parcel boundaries and its land use categories do not identify permitted uses or imply dimensional standards. By definition, this map should be interpreted broadly and is intended to provide a countywide perspective of future land use patterns. To identify the future land use designation for specific properties, please refer to the property's relevant approved sector or master plan. This property is located within subregion six master plan. And in the subregion six master plan, it is also recommended for rural residential land use category, okay? And is designated in a rural residential zone. Did you say low? Yes. However. Do you, have, do you have an exhibit for that? No, I do not. Okay. I'm just, yeah. However, and the reason why I don't have an exhibit is because of the following. Okay. However, this basically is telling us that we need to look to the subregion six master plan for land use recommendation for this property. Okay. However, Okay. Um, that land use recommendation is superseded by the council's action with regard to the amendment to the zoning ordinance. Okay. And that's the action taken on CB 75 2018. So regardless of land use category that is recommended in the master plan subregion six, that land use category is amended by CB 75 2018, which allows townhouses in the R zone under specific circumstances. And I base that now. So which was CB 75 2018, is that allowing the townhomes or is that, that setting the standards for them or both? It allows townhouses in the R zone and contains some standards with regard to development of townhouses okay. in the R zone. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Do we have that? And I base this, and I base this not only upon my understanding and the application of text amendments that have occurred in the past, but I also base it upon. Do you have a copy of, the, of a CB 75 to 2018? Yes, I do. Can you pass it up to the mm -hmm. board, please? It's in the back up on page 76. It's referenced in the staff report in a couple of places, but it's actually okay. in, the back, in the back up on page 76 out of 118. So it's indicated. It, it's been my understanding um, for, I'm not even going to say how many years, how amendments to the zoning ordinance are applied. But also, I'm going to look to the board's own prior actions and prior decisions. And I refer to Planning Board's decision in uh, preliminary plan 4-13030. Okay? And this is contained in uh, resolution number 14124. I have copies of that if you'd like, or you can take administrative notice of it. Um, let me ask you this. Let me ask our legal counsel. Have you gone through all of these um, exhibits that, that um, Mr. Lynch is um, discussing now? Hello. This is Deborah Borden, Deputy General Counsel. No, this is the first time we've seen these exhibits, actually. Okay. Same for staff? Okay. Yes, first time. But that's fine. Okay. So, um, all right, go ahead. Okay. So, so when, we, when they're being distributed, are you getting copies now? Yes, ma'am, we are. Okay. Would you like a copy of the... Oh, There's no action. I'm saying it's a bill. I don't see what's happened. It's not signed. That's what I said. So, 
Um, so we have before us um, preliminary plan 4-13031 uh, 13030. Um, so the Palisades development. So you're submitting that to us, and we'll accept it as opponents and as applicants exhibit number three. And the purpose of your submitting this is, is well, you made a determination. The microphone. This case. Microphone. You made a determination with this case, which is um, relevant to the determination I'm asking you to make on, which is relevant to the determination I'm asking you to make on this case. And one of your findings, I think, is very important to my position relative to the general plan. It, it, it's fine. It's Rel this relative is to the general plan. When you print it, yeah. If you look to page eight of the decision, number five, community planning. Under community planning, and again, this board determined that the application, and I'll just read the whole thing for you. The application is located with designated established communities per plan, Prince George's 2035 approved general plan. Uh, and in parentheses, Plan Prince George's 2035. Plan Prince George's 2035 defers to the sector plan for specific land use recommendations. The 2010 Glendale Seabrook Land Amendment Vicinity Approved Sector Plan and Sectional Map Amendment um, and Sectional Map Amendment designate the, the subject property for future commercial land use. The subject property is identified in the green. Belt Executive Center, one of the four employment designated in the sector plan. However, the proposed proposal was submitted pursuant to an amendment to the zoning regulation, CB 80, 2013, to allow townhouse development in the CL zone in certain circumstances, which supersedes land use recommendations for the site in the sector plan as provided for under section 24121A5 of the subdivision regulations. This just supports my point that the recommendation contained mm -hmm. in the master excuse me in the in the general plan is superseded by the recommendation contained in the master plan which is then superseded by the legislation adopted by the county council it, but isn't this applied to the greenbelt executive center though? that's correct but it it's is. the same analysis the analysis is my my, my point commissioner is that the staff is relying upon the general plan to deny this case. Okay. My point is that this general plan is superseded by the master plan by the terms of Applicant exhibit number two, which is Applicant exhibit number two, okay? And that the recommendation contained in the master plan is superseded by legislation adopted by the county council. Okay, so let me stop you for a second. I, I, I see your point. And, your, and basically your point is not to say that this case is identical to um, um, the Palisades development, uh, um, but, you're, but you are saying, or which was preliminary plan 4-13030, but you are saying that the analysis should be, um, should be the same. The analysis should be the same. That's yeah. correct. Um, in terms of the, um, the fine tuning of, with, the, with the master plan. And That's correct. Okay. 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 And I think it's also correct because one of the concerns raised by staff, and I find this very interesting, is one of the concerns raised by staff is that there are no development standards contained in the legislation um, that allows townhouses uh, in the R zone, or there are not enough uh, standards, and there's no density contained within that legislation. In the Palisades case, the legislation basically said that those standards we have determined at the time of detailed site plan. There was no density in the CO zone for townhouses. So it's the exact same situation we have here, but we're doing townhouses in the R zone. In the Palisades case, it was townhouses in the CO zone. Exact same situation. But in situations with Palisades, the board approved that. Staff even recommended approval. Community planning recommended approval. But in our case, they've taken a different position. And the facts aren't that aren't different. The facts aren't different at all. If you look at it from the broad perspective that the general plan is superseded by the master plan, 
the mass plan is superseded by the council action pursuant to the tax amendment, and therefore, that's what controls in this situation, okay? Townhouses are permitted in the RR zone under certain circumstances. Would you consider it the term, I'm gonna ask our legal counsel, the term superseded or, um, or refined, I guess? In reference to uh, section 24121A5? Just generally speaking from the, um, the general plan, I, I, I always consider each one a refinement, I'm always, like, more specific. Well, the general plan is our county comprehensive guidance. plan and, it's, and it may, set a new direction yes. um, for a, a particular area or, or you know, make a new uh, uh, planning determination. It's a policy document. It's, a, it's the general overriding policy document for the county and it's supposed to be then, uh, just like you go from the general to the specific, it's, it's supposed to be the general guidance under which we then do master plans. So then when we do subsequent master plans, they should be in general conformance to that general plan document. Okay. So my question then is, are you, would you concur or not concur with Mr. Lynch's statement um, or the statement as set forth in, in this um, preliminary plan? 4-13030. And I know no two cases. Each case has to be evaluated on its own merits. I know that. But as a general rule, I'm asking um, about um, the uh, master plan and the sector plans. And right here in this, in page 8 and 9, it says supersedes. But I don't know if I would use the term supersedes, but it, but it becomes more specific. Right. And I think that... Um, it's like you have a um, um, conceptual site plan, and then you go to a detailed site plan, and it becomes more specific. Correct. So I, I don't want to jump in the middle of uh, the applicant's presentation, but I, I want to answer your question. The staff has looked at the, um, the different... Uh, parameters under which the proposed development has been set forth in this case. So the facts in this case are really quite different mm -hmm. from um, putting townhouses in a, in a CO, which is a commercial office uh, development. Commercial office generally has dense buildings associated with it, dense, dense development associated with it. Rural residential does not, by definition. It is rural. It is large lot, low density uh, residential development, which is a very different character. And so what uh, the staff is saying is, we concede that the text amendment would have superseded the specific recommendation for RR um, in, in, in this way, because really townhouses are not an RR use. Right. So, yes, they will concede that, and they, and they did so in their presentation. But what they're saying is, but there are so many other things that we have to look at, and there are so many other considerations that we have to, that we have to take into account for every particular development. Every particular development is different because it's in a different place. It's in a different location. You have different issues surrounding it, both transportation, um, utilities, other, other existing communities. And so to say that that is not something that we can look at at subdivision is just not true. That's what we're supposed to look at at subdivision. We're supposed okay. to look at the, the entire picture. But my, that, thank you for that, and it, and it did, does elaborate. My question really was, generally speaking, you concur with this statement that our staff wrote in, in, in um, pages, pages eight and nine of that. Um, yeah, so you generally speaking, that. I generally would speaking. concur. I simply am now, suggesting the staff is looking at other I, factors. That, I would get That's to that, correct. but my question, I was taking it step by step. My, yes. my first question was, do you concur with this I as do, a general and, statement? I do, and so does staff. Okay, and the, okay so, then you're, so then you're taking it to the next step, but there are other factors that we're looking at, so these cases, wait, wait. and you are- uh, Pardon me, Madam Chair, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Staff does concur with that statement to the extent that it's referring to the specific property that the legislation was designed to address, not the general CO zone. Mm -hmm. No. No, that it superseded my, the recommendation. Not, that was oh, not my question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, 
that's you do concur with that as a general statement um, that what in this preliminary plan okay okay but there are cases there are, there are circumstances there are other factors to be considered absolutely. and therefore it, they, the situation is not identical absolutely okay that's what I'm getting at okay that that's their position okay I'm just making sure I'm clear okay. with that okay. and, then, and just a response and to for comment. the reasons um, as as Ms. Borden so indicated okay okay ahead. and then can't help but be prepared for this. Um, Ms. Borden said that <laughs> that the um, townhouse is not a, permitted in the Arizona or there's other facts that need to be considered. I do have two other cases where townhouses were placed in the Arizona pursuant to tax amendments and I can distribute those to the board too. Similar That's circumstances. Why a, that approach is not a great approach, but okay. <laughs> well, no, my, my point is this. My point is this. I mean, I mean, the bottom line is that there are two other cases that were approved by this board, okay, where Townhouses were allowed in the R zone pursuant to an amendment to the zoning ordinance. Okay, and similar findings were made in each of those cases to the finding that was made um, in the um, case that I've cited to you. Okay. So if you'd like to have case those, if you'd like to have copies of that, that's fine. But you can also take administrative notice of it, and that is um, four dash zero five one one three. Okay. Okay. And, and what was the other one? I'm gonna, we're going to take administrative sure. notice of it because I don't doubt that. I mean, I mean, you can look at it, but I don't doubt that. But it's that. also 4-05116. Okay. 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 And these are properties located um, um, in Westphalia, um, one's along Darcy Road, but also similar circumstances where there's an amendment to the zoning ordinance to allow townhouses in the R zone, okay, which is not in keeping with the um, land use recommendation for the plan for the property, okay. And then staff made a finding that um, the proposed development conformed to um, the master plan. You mentioned West Philly. What was the other one? Well, they're both um, they're both in the same area. So they're both in the, in the area. same area. Both in the R zone. Okay. Um, You're talking about the the entire West Philly. No, 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 not the entire West Philly plan. That area of West Philly. That's what I'm saying. So let me tell you this. Um, um, we're going to, you know, they don't come to us. We're taking administrative notice. Legal can get that. Okay. Um, we're going to have you go forward with your case, and you're going to do what you need to do. Um, but we're breaking it at 1 o'clock. And if you're not done at 1 o'clock, we will resume with you, and we'll let Mr. Gibbs know his case will be pushed back further, and you all can deal with that separately. <laughs> 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 but, um, and, um, I, and just complete the record. I do have one That's fine. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Okay. Okay. Just one more case, and again, you can take administrative notice of this. And Excuse me, Mr. Lynch. Could I just, Madam Chair, did you want to mark these for um, exhibit purposes? I thought you took administrative notice. Or just? I did. I just said administrative notice, because we're not, I, okay. we don't need to look at them. I don't, I, I, you know, I don't doubt what he, what Mr. Lynch in, said, is that we, those were instances where we approved townhouses in the RR zone. I just, you know, you can take a look at it, but Thank you. Thank you. And then I just ask you to take administrative notice of one last case. And, and I was just trying to pull cases that occurred within the last five years, six years. Okay. I don't want to go back too far, but one other case. Um, and that is the board's decision, again, similar to here, but it's um, 4 16031, which was again um, the uh, townhouses were developed in, again, the CO zone. Uh, pursuant to an amendment to the zoning ordinance and similar findings were made by this board um, okay. that the uh, text amendment superseded the mass plans recommendation for okay. the so we'll take administrative notice of that if we can let council take a look at that and um, also I w you have to make your case I understand that um, we would remind you that each case must be approved or, or evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And so there may be some nuances. I'm not saying that there are, but I am saying that there may be some nuances. Um, and at some point, you're going to get to the issue of, of, the, of the standards here, because that's, um, you, you said one of them, CB, I think you said uh, CB 75 2018 started um, provided some standards. That's correct, yes. Okay. Okay. And what about, but yeah. I'd be interested in that because I, I follow your logic in saying that 
the master plan is just sort of a, a guide in terms of plan 2035. The sector plan gives additional guidance, and then the CB 75 2018 actually makes sort of tweaks to that. And I think in your case, it's I don't know if this is written for your property, but it, it's pretty darn close because it's a, it's a gas station. Yeah. Um, there's residential stuff that's attached to the gas station. You have just slightly less than 16 acres, which are the footnotes that are needed to have a permitted use in that place. What I don't see in here are actually standards, and that's why I asked that question earlier. Um, and I know that the other cases you've you've cited have said that at the time of DSP, for at least a CO zone, that at that time you can consider um, density requirements and other sort of standards as, as are laid out that are potentially consistent with the general plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I'm getting tied up a little bit, and I think that's what I've, I think our staff is are, are also getting tied up in a little bit in terms of what are the standards and whether or not the, what you've laid out actually conflicts with that. Because um, in my mind right now, I don't see any conflict with allowing townhomes of this nature on a property like this. I just don't know if the, the density and, and the other standards are actually consistent with what um, would be recommended by the general plan or other other cases. So that's what I'd be interested and, and in hearing more of. Commissioner Dornan, were you referring to CB 75? Yeah, CB okay. 75 2018 has a table of uses, and there's a there's a permitted use in the R zone that has a footnote within there that actually calls out a property that's almost case point this this kind of property. If, if I'm not mistaken, I, th I think Mr. Lynch did indicate that um, this was a text amendment, it was site specific, and so uh, therefore, um, when they were when subsequent to the passage of CB 122 2017, they were told by our staff that there were no development standards. So he then said that you went back to the council, and then council um, enacted um, CB 75 2018 That's to provide right. standards. So that to me means it was site specific. This well, I mean, it, the, the council, the legislation's not site specific. It's not well, site specific. It's not okay. site specific. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, but it just happens okay. that. It just so happens, okay. This Let's go back property there. falls within the criteria <laughs> okay. set forth in that legislation. Okay. okay. Um, just yeah. like the, that the, the private roads bill was not site specific, but it just happened to. Just happened, okay. Okay, yeah. But the bottom line is, is this, with, and to answer Commissioner uh, Dornan's question, yes, so what occurred was with the adoption of, of CB 75 in 2018, uh, the council amended the language um, to, in terms of allowing townhouses in the R zone, okay? And um, it specifically said that the property, um, to, that the dimensional requirements for the R zone, the CSC zone, wouldn't be applicable um, here. And that the dimensional requirements or bulk regulations shall be approved um, in accordance with such requirements applicable to a regional urban community and the MXD zone is set forth in sections 27544F2E and G of the subtitle by the planning board or the district council after review in the detailed site plan. Okay. The detailed site plan shall show commercial development and include architectural review to ensure high quality design and construction materials compatible with the surrounding area. So those standards that it's referencing, okay, are E states, the maximum number of townhouse dwelling units per building group shall be 10. No more than 30% of the building groups shall contain nine to 10 dwelling units. All other townhouse building groups shall contain no more than eight dwelling units. G states, any units on townhouse buildings groups shall be a minimum of 20 feet in width, and the minimum building width of contiguous attached townhouse building groups shall be 16 feet per unit. A variety of townhouse sizes shall be provided with a minimum gross living space of, of townhouse units shall be 1,500 square feet, except that 10% of the townhouse units may be reduced to 1,200 square feet. So those are the two development standards that the council put in place for development of townhouses in the R zone when it adopted CB 75 2018. But I think what the staff's concern is is that the council didn't place any density 
um, when it adopted um, that legislation. But again, I refer you again to um, the other cases which I cited to earlier where density bulk regulations were all to be determined at the time of detailed site plan. Okay? But here in this situation, the density would be determined based upon development that conforms to the standards that I cited you to. So as long as your development conforms to E and G, and whatever you can get based upon those standards, that's what the development of, of the community would be. Okay? And it's no different than, for instance, um, when you're in the MXT zone. You don't necessarily have a density MXT zone. It's all based upon how you develop the site. And that, for the most part, is determined, that, again, at the time of detailed site plan. Yes, there is a conceptual site plan phase. There is a subdivision phase. But really, what really comes down to is the detailed site plan and how it ends up. And that's why, for instance, a lot of this legislation that you've, you know, you've had subdivisions approved under in the past, you've approved the subdivision, okay? But even at the subdivision phase, the, sub, the density wasn't determined. It wasn't determined until we went to the next phase, which was detailed site plan. And that's the way the legislation was drawn up. Most, I mean, most of the time in subdivision, we're looking at lot layout. So that's correct, yes. So we are looking at, you know, at, at the number of, of units, right? Yeah, you are. But again, that's not the final determination with regard to density. Remember, it's a preliminary plan of subdivision. Yes. It's not the final plot. Okay. okay. So again, that lot layout can be adjusted it based upon what occurs during the detailed site plan yes. phase. But it gets a, a tad more difficult mm -hmm. to detail site plan once you approve the uh, It is. Plan. It is. But again, it's not like this is the first time this board has ever done it. I mean, again, I, I, I've had four cases that I cite to you where the determination with regard to density was determined at the time of of detailed site plan, even though you were approving a preliminary plan before that point, okay? okay? Still, density wasn't approved until the detailed site plan phase of development. So your argument, your current argument right now, is that given the standards that the council set forth um, in CB 75, then we can go forward with this density as proposed in your preliminary plan. Correct. Uh, which um, because it's in conformance with CB 75, and should we need to refine it some more, it can be refined at detailed site plan. Correct, and then ultimately, the ultimate ar arbiter, okay, okay, you know, could ev could eventually be the district council on that detailed site plan. The district council could come back, okay. keep in mind, and say, we're not approving this density; we're approving a lower density. Okay. They could do that because we don't believe it. Did. So ultimately, that could happen. But again, and then you wouldn't come back and say, "Wait a minute, you approved this density at, at preliminary <laughs> plan, and now you're trying to decrease it." And that, once that again, <laughs> it's the plain reading of the language. Okay. Okay. Density is to be determined at the time of detailed okay. site plan. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's the density, right? It's actually the composition and okay. the design. Okay. And not like the density, we can punt on until DSP. It's more the composition and the design that are outlined right now. Okay, yeah. I'm at, okay. Can Ms. I board um, to say something? Yes, I'm sorry. Deborah Borden again, um, Deputy General Counsel. Actually, no, we can't punt on density at, at subdivision. Uh, density is a really important part of subdivision because you know, lotting out a single a single family development it, it looks completely different from a lotting pattern for uh, uh, two over twos or, or townhouses or multifamily. It's a completely different lotting pattern. So it really matters what your density and your housing type is and what your land use is at, at subdivision because you know, it, it really drives everything about the layout. So there is that. And then there's this issue of density and, and, and having the board um, in the position of not knowing what the density is. It's just, it's, this is not the way zoning is supposed to work. The zoning is supposed to be set by the legislative body, not by the planning board. That is a, a very simple, well-established rule in the state of Maryland. The planning board has no authority to set the density and to set the development standards um, for a zone. That is something that is squarely within the district council's authority, and we would be overstepping our bounds to simply pull a density out of the air and say, oh, well, that looks good. That's not the way this is supposed to work. We're supposed to base it on something that the, that the district council has actually approved, whether it's a master plan, a general plan. We have to base it on something. We cannot just make it up. And that's the problem. You know, 
one of the, the central problems with this application. Mm -hmm. Not only are we sort of in the position of having to make it up, but we're in a position of having to make it up in an area that just is, is very <laughs> not conducive to this kind of development in, in terms of the way the planners look at things. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a fundamental, you know, sore thumb at a wedding kind of, kind of situation. And that's, that's why the, the, the planners have had so much trouble making this work from a recommendation and how do you, you know, how do you fit a square peg into a round hole? Okay, so Ms. Boyd, this is what I am perceiving, so I, I can't say this isn't etched in stone, but what I am perceiving is that the council somehow supports this development. They've, they've enacted CB 122-2017 when it was brought to their attention that there were no standards, no development standards. They then go back and, and do CB 75, enact CB 75-2018 to provide some semblance of standards, but not enough in terms of density. So, and you're saying that we would be overstepping our bounds by, um, um, taking on the density of that is in their purview, but they didn't do that. And so therefore, you're, you're saying, I think I hear you saying that it would have been better had they included that in CB 75 or did a subsequent bill um, providing the, the density. And so that we would have some guidelines that wouldn't be overstepping our boundaries. That's correct. That's okay. correct. And without now. that, we have to rely on the plan. We have nothing else to rely on. We have to rely on the general plan. Okay, so no, now you I'm can't rely upon the general plan. Okay, hold on, now I'm coming back to you. That's I had to. <laughs> I had to hear what our council had to say. Now I'm coming back to you, Mr. Lynch. Okay, and, and that's where staff is. Staff is saying, well, without that, you have to rely upon a general plan. But again, the general plan, as pointed out to you, even says you need to refer to the master plan. Okay. That, by, by the general plan's very language, okay, it says refer back to the master plan, okay? The master plan says rural residential, but then by the plain reading of your subdivision regulations, under 2412185, -E you must refer to the legislation that was adopted, okay? Which is the action by the council. So the council's action in that legislation basically I wouldn't say amends the master plan, but by 24121, you have to look to what the council did when it adopted CB 75. But the council did not provide the one item that we need. Our council just said they have to, we don't set yes. density. That's right. they didn't done go far okay. enough. But, they didn't go far enough. But, but wait, the council didn't provide you density on any of the cases that I provided with you today. The two cases in the R zone and the two cases in the CO zone. Density was not provided. What they specifically stated was that density, bulk regulations, would be determined at the time of detailed site plan. Okay. There is no density for townhouses in the CO zone. There is no density. Well, there is density in the R zone, but there's no density for residential CO zone. And what did you do? You approved townhouses in the CO zone without the density being provided by the but council. those were already dense areas. Okay, let, let me do this for a second, Mr. Lynch. Okay, because um, you have, let me run this by you. I won't, I won't, I don't want to mess up your, um, your flow too much more than we have. Um, <laughs> but I, we have citizens who have been sitting here and we will be breaking for lunch. And I would like to, if possible, get the citizens heard because I'm getting the sense that we might not be finished this case before we break. Maybe no, I still have my expert to present too. Excuse me? I still have a witness to present. Okay. Well, how, how about if we go forward with the citizens so they, if they, they can go on their way if they so choose? Okay. okay? And fine. then you can come back and present your witnesses, assuming all of that takes place before one. If not, it'll be after lunch. Okay. okay. Thank right. you. So, so I'm going to start with... Um, and I can't read everybody's handwriting, so please forgive me if I get this wrong. Um, Dave Rose Rosene, am I close? Close enough for work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for giving me a chance to stand. Let me see. Yeah. And then um, Preston Mears. Mears. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, Rosa now. Is that it, Rosa now? Well, it depends if Okay, well, you know, I'm just going to be quiet. You can tell <laughs> us, okay. I pronounce it different than my wife, who pronounces it different than everybody else. So. Okay. <laughs> How right, do you well, pronounce it? Please identify pronounce yourself. It? Well, I'm, I'm, go with Dave. Okay. No, we have to please identify yourself Rosenau. and state your address. Thank you. Like the flower, and no, I don't want to do it. Rosenau. <laughs> okay. Uh, I live on Croom Airport Road, 15403, uh, and I have been a community activist here, probably going on. 27 years when the CVS at this situation, the area used to be a former fruit market, then it became a batting cage, then it became a Rite Aid fight, and Rite Aid finally gave up on that fight and they sold the property rights to CVS who were successful in getting it pushed through. Okay. Now, so that's, I'm jumping ahead of myself, yeah. but Mr. Lynch mentioned CB 75-20. 18? 17, mm -hmm. I think. 17? No, 18. 18. 18. 18, yeah, 18. And that bill went through, thanks to our illustrious elected officials, right after this very same case was running into difficulty getting pushed through the, this process earlier. Uh, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that they were not, that this one particular councilman was not specifically thinking about this particular lot. So. If there was any doubts in your minds, he's talking about the very specific lot. Now, <laughs> going down my list, uh, let's see. First of all, I'd like to thank the staff for their work in putting out this package, and I definitely concur with the staff's conclusions. Uh, let me give you a picture of what that particular area is. Croom. Everybody basically has at least five acres, 15 acres, 25 acres, 100 acres. I mean, they have some small acreage lots, but basically everybody out there lives on a well and a septic tank. And my greatest fear is when WSSC is able to get a pipeline in there mm -hmm. because all hell, um, all, all the poop's gonna hit the fan. Um, I myself, proclaimed community activist who picks up trash in our area to make sure we have a nice neighborhood. Um, and I am kind of anti-stupid and against poor development. Mm -hmm. I don't mind practical development, but what I see being presented here is the same stupid development that was proposed earlier and many times. This, this plot of land has been fought over for many years here, at least two decades. Uh, oh, recent news. Development without infrastructure led to the death of a woman and severe burning of two of our county's constituents here in the last week or so. Okay. You cannot have development without infrastructure. That's just a, a two cents worth. Now, getting to my point. The plan appears to be the same as the previous plans. Both plans, the previous and this one, is trying to cram 20 pounds of potatoes into a 10 pound bag. 75 townhouses in that small area, you've got to be kidding. plan would kind of interrupt Charles Branch as we know it. School kids used to go down to Charles Branch for school, out of school activities where they got to pull fish out of the water and, and do things like that. Um, traffic. I have been telling this council for over 27 years that all you need to do before you develop land down there is get a lawn chair and sit at that in, sit, sit halfway between Osborne, South Osborne Road and Croom Road. You sit there with a lawn chair and wait for the accident to happen. It is a disaster as it is. Coming in on Croom, coming inwards on Croom Road, there is no right turn lane onto 301. So if one person wants to go straight through to the shopping center across the street, mm -hmm. everybody else behind there has to sit and wait. Or, heaven forbid, what they all do is they drive through the gas station. 
UK. We shouldn't be using a gas station in order to turn right. That's what that intersection's like. Let's see, I also wanted to say, uh, if you look at the, 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 the name of this development is Crane Commons. And you know, when I think of a commons, I think of a you know, Boston Commons or whatever commons. There is no common in Crane Commons. And I have to give credit to my cohort in crime here okay. as far as coming up with that. I didn't come up okay. with it. Um, I also happen to be anti-politicians. Oh. And their use of special exemptions drives me crazy. Whenever, whenever, whenever somebody comes up with a plan that somebody that's making probable money off the side. Okay. Anyway, I can't let's, go let's stay, Let's go back. You know, let's stay focused on the issues. I, we I understand will, that you're opposed, and, and we appreciate everybody's I will go comments. I my conclusion. But we have to be, um, stick to the issues at hand, though. Okay. It goes back to 20 pounds of potatoes in a 10-pound bag. There's no way this many units should ever be put into that small of an area. Okay. Our properties out there are all three to five to whatever acres. They are cramming 75 units into 15 point whatever acres. That's, that's five lots at the most for outside there. Okay. They're cramming 75 units plus the commercial development into that same amount of space. This is ridiculous. I mean, we, we, lost, we, all, we lost the fight with the rural tier. I okay. mean, the 301 used to be the rural tier and they couldn't develop it. And then they got a special mm -hmm. exemption that allowed the CVS to take over what used to be rated okay. for, a, for okay. a fruit stand. We're going to leave the CVS out of this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank the staff once again for their conclusions, and I support their conclusions. And what I heard was a lot of lawyerese here. Okay. 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 Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Rosenau. Um, were there any questions? Okay, so Preston Muir. Did I, am I getting yours right? Yes, Preston okay. Mears. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mears. Um, I have a written copy of Okay, can we show, it, can we show the statement? Um, Mr. Cosby, can you show the statement to Mr. Lynch first? Okay. Um, First of all, let me, my name is Preston Mears. I live on 15101 Candy Hill Road, which is right on the intersection and of Candy Hill and Croom Road. Okay, okay I need Marlboro. you to, to adjust the mic up a little bit. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to make you aware of is I'm 79 years old. My wife and I have been living there since 1994, and we love it here. Uh, I happen to be a theologian by academic training and an ordained Episcopal priest, and that'll be some credentials for what I'm going to say in a minute. Uh, first, uh, I wish you all well with the convolutions that I had trouble keeping up with, and I'm used to a lot of theological convolutions. <laughs> I wish you well on that. Uh, and I'll come back to the common point but it does relate to the idea that what we do as a community is out in the open and seen and visible. The text amendment process was not this hearing is. All right, my first point. There will be loss of wetlands along a very important piece of water called the Charles Branch. Uh, and Constructed collection pools and such do not work as well as nature's own wetlands. Be very clear about that. Uh, come down to where I live on Candy Hill Road, just past the Methodist Church, and the bottom of our property is a stream. That stream comes out of wetlands and woodlands behind the old Rogers School, it comes under Croom Road, and then on down towards the river across our property. Uh, I checked it last yeah. April when we had all those rains and a lot of rain, a lot of water was running muddy and red. Excuse me, excuse me. Could you help, could Green you tapes. show staff where your property is in relation to what we're looking at on the, if you uh, can help us. We're just trying to see where you're located relative uh, to the property. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought everybody here would know where 
Croom and Candy Hill Road intersect. Croom. Well, I'm, I'm I not right there against the property. <laughs> okay. It's not uh, so much I'm, further down Croom Road. It's not visible on this map. It's not yes. it's, no, oh, no. it's quite a bit distant off this map. Uh, yes. Candy Hill Road is approximately six and a half miles south of 301 on Croom Road. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I was speaking then the, to use the example of where we have water and a stream where it comes out of woodlands and wetlands that's over behind the Roger, old Rogers School when everything, a lot of streams were running brown last April when we had all the rain, that stream ran clear. So I'm just emphasizing the point that this development does damage to the Charles Branch. Okay, okay. Um, second, there's been enough said probably already about the traffic situation. There will be teenagers trying to get across 301 to get to the Popeyes. Mm -hmm. There'll be accidents and they'll be serious. Uh, what was not also mentioned is we have no walkways down to the Frederick Douglass High School. We occasionally have teenagers walking along that road now and there's no real room for that. This is going to aggravate that problem. Third point. I have been struck by the care and attention that this whole area has in terms of how people take care of their houses, big houses, little houses, how thought out some of the development has been. To have this townhouse thing plugged in there just close to the Marlton, which is a large planned type of development with a variety of housing, this proposal is an insult to them. West End, you know, you name it. There's a lot of thought out development in our area. This is an insult to that. Now, the final word I have to say goes back to the word common. It's a very old, old word. In the Episcopal Church, we have the book of common prayer. That means it belongs and is something that is of value to everybody. I'll make the point. It's rhetorical. Uh, the idea that's being called Crane Commons is disingenuous. Sir, I have to stop you on that because, I, because by law, I have to make sure that the testimony that we hear t today is actually germane to the criteria that we have to analyze for this. And I understand you have okay. a point, but, okay. but if this gets to court, I have to make sure you're, you're that... N you're not here to pass on their name. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. It, it, it's a reference to the character I, of it. Yeah. That's okay. I, but we got uh, that part. So that's my, that's my testimony. But the last thing to be said about it, there were a dozen people here for the March 18th last 2018 presentation. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the, for local feeling and reaction, and citizen reaction, to refer to that record. At that time, the staff uh, moved against, the staff have recommended against it again. But there was a lot of testimony at that time, okay. and it's still relevant. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so then we have one more. Um, D'Angelo Purdy. Okay. Yes, hi, my name is D'Angelo. Can you hear me? Yes, but lower the mic just a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is D'Angelo Purdy. Um, I live at 8400 Crane Highway, which is about one. 0.1, 0.2 miles south of uh, where the development is proposed, uh, right on Crane Highway. Um, I'm actually not exactly opposed to the development or the density or capacity of the development. I just have a problem with the lack of infrastructure. I think that's the biggest issue. Um, this area in particular, there's issues with traffic, uh, there's issues with uh, storm management. Uh, there's issues with the lack of uh, sewer and water uh, infrastructure. Uh, the area reeks of hydrogen sulfide. Um, it's just, I think, I, I, I don't know how you do it strategically, but I think somewhere there should be some type of infrastructure development that is in accordance with this type of development, whether it's done beforehand or 
in lockstep with the development. Um, I do know that that area, particularly my area, was considered the S4 planning stage where there was uh, plans to do uh, water and uh, sewer uh, connections. But I haven't heard anything about that. And, uh, and then, you know, whenever I inquire about it, I'm told that that, that that won't happen unless someone comes in as a major developer um, in that area. So um, I'm not, not entirely opposed to the development. I just don't think the, develop, uh, the infrastructure is there. So I, I don't know what that plan is. Um, I'm reading through the staff report, and I noticed that there's also plans to uh, change Crane Highway to a freeway. Uh, which is also concerning because that means that there would be a uh, right of, uh, or pretty much assumption of, of, of property lines uh, for that expansion. So, I mean, it's just a lot of things that I'm, I'm just worried about um, that should be taken into consideration. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Purdy. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, yes, ma'am, did you wish to speak to her? Did you sign up? Yeah, no. Okay. okay. Come wait, don't speak till you get to the mic because it's being recorded. Okay. And adjust it. Thank you. Please. My name is Pam Marty. I live at 9108 Croom Road. Um, I am probably the closest to 301 because I'm only 2.4 miles from there. I bought the home in 2008, my first home. Love the area. Hate the idea of the congestion there um, because it is bad now. There are times that I'll go to Giant instead of Safeway because I just don't want the traffic there because everyone's going straight forward. The other thing is the kids. You have kids walking, not once in a while, every single day along that road to try and get to their school, to their home. They walk here like I used to walk to school. And you're going to have all kinds of traffic, all kinds of mess, and I think it's a disaster. So I am against it. Sorry, Mr. Lynch, we've talked about this before. Um, but no, I th just wanted to say that. It's, um, I think it's, it's not a good thing. Ours is a very unique area. I know we're in this little cubby hole here, but um, I think it's a valuable cubby hole for the entire county. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marty. Were there any questions? Okay, so Mr. Lynch, um, you have a witness. I told you we're breaking no later than 1 o'clock. It is now nine minutes to one o'clock. What do you want to do? Okay, want to break now? I don't want to keep on jumping around. Okay, so we're going to break now. Um, we will alert Mr. G so we'll be back here by, let, we can probably be back here by quarter to two then, okay? Um, and then, but we'll be finishing with your case before we go on to the next case. So someone needs to alert Mr. Gibbs that he is after you, and I'm sure you will feel the pressure. I want to get behind that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> A planning board is in recess. Thank you. Okay. Prince George's County Planning Board is back in session. Um, we were hearing item eight, and uh, um, I think Mr. Lynch had not finished his case in chief because he had a witness to put on and decided that that was an optimal time to break. So you wanted to start with your witness now? Mr. Again, well, for the record, Dan Lynch here on behalf of the applicant. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to have the um, Scott Warford, our plan planner, okay. uh, testify um, as to the issues raised by staff um, on um, the Plan 2035 compliance. Okay. Scott. Thank you, Scott Wolford, with Thank Mazer Consulting, for the record. Is this okay? Yeah, I just want to make sure, because we, we want to make sure that everyone hears us. So, okay, so that's good. All right. A um, and everyone, just adjust the mic to your height. With, okay, thank you. So I just have uh, two brief points to make. Um, in the staff report on page six, it's the second bullet item at the top, um, and it's from the 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 plan 2035 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a recommendation refers back to the master plan and it says that the the development as it's proposed is not in character with the existing surrounding low density residential development pattern i just wanted to um, point out on the exhibit that you're looking at which is on the screen right now which is the existing land use from prince george's <laughs> atlas um the the property is located uh, in the center of the exhibit 
uh, where the, the red area is, that's the commercially zoned property at the intersection of Route 301 and South Osborne Road and, and Croom Road. Uh, it's the white square that's, uh, or triangle that's just below that on the, the southeast corner. And you can see from this map that within a short distance of this development, on the same side of 301 southeast of here is the Marlton development, which is substantially higher density than what we're proposing. So this perception of what happens east of Route 301, at least in this particular area, um, may not hold exactly true. I, um, I'm sorry, but okay. staff, could you please keep following along as he's pointing out different areas just to help us orient? Um, okay, so the, the pro yeah. The subject property vis -a -vis That's in white, and he, he has the arrow on it right now. Okay. Um, just below the red. Um, and then just a, a several thousand feet south of it, um, you can see all the lots. And just, yeah, the, those, the, the, what's in brown are, are, is another townhouse portion of, of Marlton, and it's completely surrounded by single family detached. It's one of the higher density residential communities in, in Prince George's County. So, um, I just point that out that um, it may be townhouses as a buffer um, against the commercial that is around that intersection of Croom Road and Route 301 might be, a subst may, might be in character with the neighborhood. Um, the second brief point is, um, and if you could go to the, the site plan. Um, so th this is the plan, uh, the residential or the commercial is the, the yellow box surrounded by purple um, at the top center of the plan. And then the townhouses are the red boxes uh, with the, the purple road around them. And the, and the green is our portion of the PMA for the Charles Branch. So the Charles Branch is a substantially wide PMA. Um, in some portions on our property, it's five or 600 feet wide. The black dotted line that you see across the portions of the bottom of the exhibit is actually the center line of the stream. So the same amount of buffer that is on our side of the stream exists on the other side of the stream. So there is between this node around the intersection of South Osborne, Croom Road and Route 301 where there is a, a decent amount of commercially zoned property and single, smaller single family detached homes on smaller lots where this is proposed, um, there is a substantial buffer that completely isolates this proposed node from the other parts of the development that are um, east of there on Croom Road. So those were just my two quick points. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Let me see if there's questions. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Wolford. All right, it could, could you go back to the other master plan? Or the, 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 the yes. So I, the other, the one last thing that Dan asked me to point out is on, on um, Trump's Hill Road, there, those are single family detached lots um, that really back up to us, but they're um, substantially. Staff, could you please keep up? That, that's Trump, Trump's Hill Road. Um, and those are all single family detached homes and they're buffered from this proposed development by the Charles Branch PMA that comes through there that is in some cases, um, you know, well in excess of a thousand feet wide. So there's substantial buffer between the proposed development and everything else that is to the, to the south and the east. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Mr. Lynch. <laughs> Again, for the record, Dan Lynch here on behalf of PMG. You know, again, I wanted Scott to point that out to you, um, some of those things to you, because we were looking at this site based upon a much smaller map, not showing what's even a thousand feet from the subject property. And based upon my reviews of staff report, it almost appeared that, you know, this project, okay, was kind of like an ice, in an isolated area, a very rural area where if you look at the actual land use map, you know, as Scott pointed out, 
we're within 1,000 feet of Marlton, which is in the RPC zone, which is one of the higher density zones in Prince George's County. So the characterization with regard to, you know, what, th that this property needs to be a transition between um, the retail along 301 and a rural area, it's not quite what is happening out here. What this really is, is this is transition between the retail along 301 and then single family development, as well as a high density re, um, residential uh, community known as Marlton. Um, another point that I want to make, um, just to go back to an issue that was raised earlier, um, is with regard to um, planning board not establishing um, densities. And again, you know, as I pointed out to you, and I provide you with a number of cases, um, you know, there's many situations where the zoning ordinance in Prince George's County allows for um, allows for um, the density to be determined at detailed site plan, which again is going to come after the subdivision process. So what you're being asked to do under CB 75 is not unusual. It's occurred before, and let me also point out that it's not unusual without some of these tax amendments. I mean, even in the MUI zone, okay, MUI, okay, if you're proposing a mix of uses in the MUI zone, your density, again, is not determined until detailed site plan. That's the way the MUI zone works. And I'm just looking for the specific section that I have here in front of me. And that is under 27546. 18B. So in situations where you're developing a mixed use development in the MUI zone, okay, your density is not determined until you go through the detailed site plan phase. So in this situation, okay, we had approved on the subject property a gas station and car wash. We looked at alternatives for development of the subject property. Text amendments were approved by the district council, an amendment to the subdivision regulations was approved by the district council for the purposes of allowing private roads in the RR zone. We have put before you a preliminary plan of subdivision that complies with the standards set forth in the council's legislation. And we believe that based upon that plan, this is an approval preliminary plan subdivision. Given the planning board's actions on the cases that I presented for development in the CO zone, development in the R zone under those tax amendments, you do not need that legislation or that provision of zoning ones to contain a density in order to move forward. Each and every one of those developments was approved, okay, with the density to be determined at the time of detailed site plan. And I'm asking this board to do exactly as they did in the past. Now, I understand the chair's position, okay, that you know, every case is different. But the bottom line is, is that even though the legislation's different, some applies to the R zone, and some applies to the CO zone. What I'm asking you to actually apply on a consistent basis, I'm asking you to apply 24121A5 consistently. You applied that in the case of the Palisades. I'm just asking you to apply it the same way you applied in the Palisades. There was no density in the CO zone. Yes may have been located in a dense area of the county, but there's no residential density for the CO zone. So this board had to determine that density, okay, at the time of detailed site plan, but was able to approve a preliminary plan without that density being put in place. So I'm just asking for this board, I'm just asking for this board to follow its actions in the past, that it's done in the past.
because otherwise, in my, in my, from my position, okay, the board doesn't do what it did on past cases. The board's action would be arbitrary and capricious. I'm asking just for consistency to apply that provision of the zoning ordinance. In this case, as you did on past cases, such as Palisades. And I'd happy to answer any additional questions you have. Thank you. Are there any questions of Mr. Lynch? I have a question. Okay. So I think most of the questions today have gotten to, for me, the, the main issue left seems to be density, but it has to be consistent with what's, pre, what's approved in the preliminary um, plan. If you read the cases that you, the, the initial case that you had cited, yeah, it was done at detailed site plan, but it was consistent with preliminary um, site plan or, or plan for a subdivision, preliminary sorry. Plan, yeah. um, so if we were doing that, I don't have a problem necessarily with townhomes in this area based upon the legislative change that the council made. Um, and they sort of left us in a bind by doing the site zoning that they did to try and interpret or figure out what to do with the density because that's kind of a question mark right now. Our staff had said 3.5 dwelling units um, is sort of the number that they're, they're looking at, and I think you're at 4.6 or somewhere around there. Um, is there a way that you can get it down to that amount? Because I think that's, main, that's one of the main sticking points here. So, staff, can you go to... Um, Slide nine, I think, as a site plan. Just doing a quick count, I think there's 21 or 22 units in that center island, and then you could get up, or, or no, I think it's a little bit less than 20. And then if you knock that out, and then maybe one of the four unit thing um, on the right hand side, I think you would get to the density that you're looking at. Um, you don't have to cut out an entire stick on the side, you don't have to knock out kind of weird shapes in the middles. You could put in other amenities in that center or other things. I think there's ways of you getting to the density if you were to be a little bit more open to that. Well, I don't disagree with you. As a matter of fact, when we were at SDRC, okay, this issue with regard to the application of the legislation didn't even come up. At that point, we were still talking about how can we make this better. Okay? The conversation ended as soon as we were told we can't approve this at all based upon the fact that the district council didn't provide us with any density in the legislation. So if staff wants to have a conversation, we're open to a conversation how to make this more of an approval plan. It doesn't necessarily have to occur here. It can occur at detailed site plan. Remember, whatever approved here, okay, is the most lots we would get. That doesn't, move, that doesn't mean it doesn't go down as part of the detailed site plan. It has many occasions. So this was, whatever was approved here was the most. But how much? How much? How much has it decreased in, in other cases? F like the number of the density? Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, you're, that's your argument, yes. so I'm just trying to get clarity I, from your argument. Well, well, well my, because, my point, Because yeah. one of the things that, that Commissioner Dorner mentioned is that the site plan has to be in general compliance with the, with sure. the, with the preliminary plan. So um, w w it's no, we're trying to see what it is that we can do, if sure. anything, um, um, pursuant to the, the situation in which we find ourselves. And so we, if you're saying that you could have had a conversation, that they could have a conversation with you, that conversation could have been had before today from both sides. It could have sure. been initiated by either side, number one. Number two, while I'm talking, I'm going to jump into this thing. You said you understand my position about each case must be evaluated on a case by case. But that's just not, that's not just my position. That's the law. That's the law. Okay. So we, I'm going to recharacterize that. Okay. That's the law. However, I, I also understand that um, we can't jump all over the place without um, um, willy-nilly, without some specific rationale to why we would act one way in one case and another and decide another way in another case because there, there are other factors that come into play. So I would say that we go very far to ensure that we are not arbitrary and capricious. Sure. So I have to take exception to that term okay. because you said that's your view, but I assure you it's not mine. Mm -hmm. and, and um, so I wanted to put that out there. There are, there are other factors that must be considered. And that's what we're doing here, trying to consider them. Maybe we agree with you, maybe we don't. That remains to be seen. But we're, you know, we're, tr we're trying to wrap our arms around the issues that are presented to us. 
understanding that to some extent we're, um, we've been put in somewhat of a trick box because our, at least our, our, our technical staff, and they have expertise too, we don't always agree, just like lawyers don't always agree, um, but they are saying that, that um, and, and so are our lawyers, that we don't have the, the we don't have one of the necessary tools that we need. And so when the council did go back and correct it by coming up with um, CB17, is that what it is? 75. CB, 75, 75, 75, excuse me, CB75, 2018, um, they endeavored to provide standards, but perhaps it didn't go far enough. At least that's what our technical staff is saying, that is what our legal counsel is saying. And, and maybe that's true, maybe, maybe not but we're trying to address this problem, so I'm sure. gonna take exception. We are, you hear all this debate, all this discussion, so in no way, shape, or form are we being arbitrary and capricious. So thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I mean, I think it, right now I'm just sort of posing, like, is there a way you can retool this site a little bit just to get closer to the density? So I'm trying not to be arbitrary or capricious. I'm trying to give you an, a way to be in conformance with the form and the design that, that is kind of in this area. I do see that there's higher density in some, some other parts, but that's not adjacent to this lot, so you don't have sort of a slow kind of downgrading in terms of the density or the use or the intensity of the use. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a way that you can lower some of the intensity of this use so it be in more conformance with the area around here and that we get staff potentially to more agreements with you? And the other thing is you only have, um, the, there's one more week before the expiration sure. of 140 day, 140 days. So it expires on, on February the 2nd. That's correct. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that we can look at this and come up with maybe some alternatives that may be more appealing to, or more acceptable to the planning board and staff. But I, I don't even know, I still need to address legal because I, I don't even know if it helps their argument or not. Okay. Uh, we, I'm sorry, Deborah Borden, uh, Deputy General Counsel, are we talking about um, the expiration of the second to 70 days? And no, I think what he's saying, well, is let me not put words in your mouth. Commissioner Dorner is suggesting some semblance of a compromise. Um, I'm pointing out that you only have one more week in order to, to make that happen. Right. But and even if they come back with a compromise with a lesser density, does that even address the fact that the council didn't provide a density. But, does it, but maybe it helps in terms of if consistency. It, huh? if, if they can get closer to yeah. the density that we have yes, in the general plan, yeah. I, I don't know, but that, that would be an argument that they could make. Um, the issue here is that yeah, they, the applicant has a couple of options. They could withdraw and file a new plan. They could take a week and see if there's something that they can do in terms of getting the density down. Um, and they could go forward with the denial and take their chances. Okay, so when they get a denial, so, you don't know what that would what Well, they could be. go forward uh, with a, with a uh, decision, I should yeah. say, and take their chances. So all of that's very true, and I concur. But it would seem to me that we should have been closer to this before today. Mm -hmm. OK. So. Mr. Lynch, what do you want to do? I'd be more than happy to take this back to my client and see whether we can come up with a, a layout where we So in terms of a week or in terms of withdrawing? A in week. terms of a week. Okay. Um, okay. So we've heard from everybody. Was there anyone who wished to speak who, I, who, who did not, um, whose name I did not call? Okay. I believe, let me just say this, your client can, can read, your client can hear, your mm -hmm. client can see. We, we, we haven't taken this to a vote, but you can see the concerns that are being raised. You see the, the position of our professional staff. You've heard our counsel. Um, so right now, this week is opportunity knocking. I would take that back to my client and, okay. and, 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 and see what you come up with. Okay. Okay. Right. So is, is there a motion to continue? So moved. Second. We have a motion to continue for one week, which is January 30th. Um, I don't know how we're looking that day. Maybe we can set it in for a time specific. Um, um, if you can hold on for a few minutes, we can figure out when. Because right. I know we have all of our January days are kind of rough. Yeah. Or, we can, or, if, or if it makes it any easier, we can hold harmless until 1 o'clock at least. Is that, do you need a few minutes? We need much more. Okay. 
Okay, hold on. It's until <laughs> 2 o'clock. <laughs> we'll make sure you get fed. Okay. Madam Chair. <laughs> okay, hold, okay. So, so we're, yes? It's a, it, to us, it was a really good date for that because we only have one uh, development review yeah, item so on I'm there. looking at, okay. So maybe, how, how, but, but what case is that? Well, you don't need to tell me now on the record we're taking. How much time do you think we need for what's already on the agenda? Yeah, I'd say uh, no more than an hour for everything. Okay, so let's hold you harmless until 1130. That's fine. Okay. That doesn't mean precisely 1130, but you don't need to be here before 1130. Okay? All right. So, um, did I have to vote? It's not um, No. So we had a motion and a second, and we had discussion. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Yes, have it. Thank you very much. held harmless until okay. 1130. Okay. On uh, January 30th. Okay. Number 10. Someone need, uh, need to find Mr. Gibbs. But you know what? It's just lights. Ready. See those lights? I'm getting ready. <laughs> uh. 
Good afternoon. Okay, Mr. Hartlett. <laughs> good, good morning, Madam Chair and good members. Good morning. Of, or afternoon. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Board. For the record, I'm Jeremy Hurlbut with the Urban Design Section. Um, the Planning Board will be considering two items today with item 10, um, or two requests, I should say. And the first is an amendment to the table of uses to allow consolidated storage use and the DSP to construct, um, or the detailed site plan to construct 133,000 square feet of consolidated storage with office and retail uses within a development design overlay zone. The property, there, the site is located in the northern portions, portion of Prince George's County in planning area 69, Council District 5. More specifically, the subject property is located on the south side of Maryland 450, also known as Annapolis Road, immediately across from 68th Avenue. The subject property is zoned mixed-use infill, or MUI. The central Annapolis Road Development District Overlay Zone requires the use within the DDOZ shall be the same as those allowed in the underlying zone. Um, in the case of the MUI zone, uh, it refers to the CSC zone use table with the exception of miscellaneous uses, <coughs> which include consolidated storage. For these uses, the MUI zone points to the R18 zone use table to be used, and the proposed consolidated storage use is not listed or permitted in the R18 use table. The applicant has requested the district council change the list of allowed uses, and the applicant is required to show the proposed development conforms with the purposes and recommendations of the development district, as stated in the master plan, master plan amendment, or sector plan. Meets the applicable site plan re requirements and does not otherwise substantially impair the implementation of any comprehensive plan applicable to the subject development proposal. Staff finds that this application will impair the sector plan. The proposed property, as before mentioned, is in the development district overlay zone for the 2010 approved Central Annapolis Road sector plan. The sector plan places the subject property in the mixed use transition character area. Uh, the vision of the character area is to establish a low and moderate density mixed use multifamily neighborhood to serve as a transition between the existing single family neighborhoods to the north and south and retail to the southwest and to encourage infill opportunities for workforce housing by providing new opportunities for the for the development of multifamily residential units. The aerial photo shows the one acre property, which is surrounded by commercial uses uh, and residential uses. The property is bordered to the west by Maryland 450, um, including the Landover Hills Volunteer Fire Station and the gas station, commercial properties to the east, and east, or further to the east, um, multifamily medium density residential zone property known as the Ashford at Cooper's Crossing Apartments. South of the subject site is the Crestview Square Shopping Center, and beyond the immediate property in the general vicinity are single family detached residential properties. The rear, the, this shows the site topography and natural features. Um, the rear of the property is currently wooded and contains steep slopes that fall off to the east towards the, the multifamily. The, the front of the site is generally flat and mostly impervious with the existing development. This shows the master plan right way of Maryland 450, um, also known as Annapolis Road that the property fronts on. The sector plan character area map shows the location of the property with the blue star. The property is located in the mixed use transition character area that is envisioned by the sector plan to separate big box uses 
for the, the retail town center zone to the southwest from the existing residential to the east. And the Purple Line station will anchor the transit uh, village um, at the northern end of the sector plan. The mixed use character area looks to implement multifamily development with limited ground floor retail and activate the street frontage and create more pedestrian friendly environment that will add density to the corridor while buffering and preserving the surrounding neighborhood for more from the more intense uses. This bird's eye shows the existing residential, uh, which can be seen here at the bottom of the page, which is approximately 60 feet from the proposed building. Uh, the building will be about 80 feet from uh, the proposed property line, and these uh, residential properties are about 20 feet below the finished grade of the proposed building. Is, are they condos or apartments? They're, gar they're four level garden apartments okay. with balconies, as you can see on the corners mm -hmm. um, here. It's a large complex of them. Um, the balconies, driveways, and parking will have direct sight of the rear of the proposed building, as well will commercial properties and parking areas to the north and south. The site plan shows the ex that the existing building is proposed to be re removed and the redevelopment of the uh, consolidated storage to take its place. The consolidated storage will have 1,300 units of consolidated storage and just 824 <coughs> square feet of associated office and retail with, and 1,000 square feet of incubator space that will front on Maryland 450. A stormwater pond will be located at the rear of the property and the proposed 12 parking spaces and two loading spaces will be on the south side of the, the building. The site has a wide single single vehicle access to the parking lot and a single five foot sidewalk provides access to the entry points of the building from the attached sidewalk on Maryland 450. Staff notes that the use in the designs do little to activate the pedestrian environment. Although in continued conversations with the applicant, the applicant provided a color rendering on January 17th, along with uh, additional architecture that the applicant plans to present at this hearing. Um, the color rendering shows the, re the revised design with a plaza feature in, in front of the building. Um, um, this was all received after 35 days limit. Um, the landscape plan shows landscaping in the rear of the property, as well as limited landscaping on the southern property line near the loading area a single tree in the in the parking area as the DDOZ requires and trees and trees and shrubs along the frontage. The applicant proposes three channel letter signs on top of the west, north, and south elevations in addition to a freestanding sign that is proposed near the vehicle entrance. Staff has commented, commented throughout the review process on the proposed building, was not in conformance with the DDOZ standards, which lay out specific conditions for the type of materials that should be used, such as masonry, metal, and wood, and those which should be minimized, which include EFAS. The lack of fenestration, the lack of context and cohesive design, and how the building did not address the surrounding context or the sector plan's vision. These points were made at SCRC and in meetings with the applicant after the applicant submitted plans at the 35-day limit, which added more, uh, the plans that you will see added more cement fiber board paneling, um, which are shown in the, the gray areas. Uh, EFIS elements are shown here in the north elevation in the white tan inlaid gray elements in the back third of the building where two tones of EVIS are used to break up the facade. The building proposes a window tower along Maryland 
450 frontage with square windows and a, a door for the incubator space. Um, there, the exception, with the exception of the southeast corner windows and a window above the loading doors, uh, there are, is no upper level fenestration on the building. Uh, EFIS makes up a large part of the south and north elevations, which can be seen, which I forementioned as the white, tan, and in some cases red on the, the south elevation here. The entrances to the consolidated storage are all oriented towards the parking lot and highlighted by the green canopies in this rendering. The building will present its four stories on Maryland 450, uh, which is shown here as the west elevation. Um, this is a recessed elevation. Um, and seven stories on the east elevation or the rear of the building with three subterranean levels on the east elevation that will face the existing garden level apartment complex. The applicant proposes this frontage to be, or, or the east frontage is 75 feet tall, blank wall composed only of EFIS. The north and south elevations are approximately 494 feet long and with the rear being 75 feet tall and the front that fronts on Maryland 450, for, uh, 49 feet tall. The architect provided limited, or the architecture provides limited fenestration on, in articulation, but it does provide a split block base um, uh, along the frontage of Maryland 450. Um, and the rear, as well as brick elements that elevate on the southern facade and faux windows on the north facade. Um, to highlight the, the major issues for, for this application, um, just to recap the major issues for the board is, for, for the board to remember when making their decision is that there are two request before you today. The first request is to allow consolidated storage to be added to the allowed uses in the DDFZ. Staff does not support the request as there has been significant resources and public involvement that went into the developing of a clear and agreed upon vision for the sector plan and the character area specifically. Allowing this use on this site would significantly impair the sector plan as proposed you, as the proposed use does not match the recommended land use. Second, in the detailed site plan, which staff also does not recommend approval of, it does not meet the DDOZ design standards and does not transition or relate to existing or the envisioned residential and would significantly impair the vision of creating a multifamily neighborhood that create that the character area envisions. With that, um, the urban di design staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings of this report, recommend to the district council disapproval of the property owner's request to permit consolidated storage use on the subject site, and disapprove the detailed site plan DSP 19001 and tree conservation plan TCP 12-034-2. 2019 for JSF Annapolis Road. This concludes staff's presentation. The applicant will be presenting alternative design that was provided to staff on January 17th. Staff has reviewed the materials and is prepared to address any questions you may have. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Hobart. Let's see if the board has any questions of you at this time. Yeah, just to be clear, the additional design that was um, you said submitted on January 17, does it factor into still your final decision? I would want to understand. Uh, in, in terms of does it disapprove recommending? Yes, we still recommend disapproval okay. of application. Okay. Are there any other questions, Mr. Gibbs? Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Hewlett. Good afternoon members of the board, Edward Gibbs, an attorney with offices in Largo. And uh, 
I'm here this afternoon pleased to represent Johnson Development, JSF Management, LLC. Um, I, I will take a moment of personal privilege, though, to uh, remember uh, Mr. Wooten, Coach Wooten. Um, you know, I had the pleasure to uh, appear before him many times uh, when he was on the board. Uh, but I also had the distinct pleasure of um, playing against his teams because I played and, football, and basketball, and baseball at St. John's. Well, we, uh, in football, we did pretty good. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, the, basket, the, the math of basketball program was quite, uh, quite ominous. Um, so, but, I, but I did have that pleasure to uh, appear before him and with him as a contestant. And then later, um, my oldest son played football, basketball, and baseball at St. John's. And, um, was an all-met player and, and competed uh, against the DeMatha basketball team. So we ended up having two generation of Gibbses who were able to compete against Coach Wooten. And then I had the added pleasure of being able to appear before him when he was on the planning board. So it's a, uh, it is indeed a sad day, um, a, a sad time. And uh, quite frankly, I'm just wondering how I'm going to get into the church because there are going to be a lot of people there. Um, let me, let me start by saying what an odyssey this is to be here today. Um, Johnson Development is out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. They are the uh, owners of JSF Management LLC. It's the entity they created, created for this project. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have six witnesses who are going to testify today. Uh, I know the board has had a long day already. Uh, I know you're tired, uh, but this is a very important case for my client, and uh, we need to get all of our evidence before you uh, in the hope that your uh, recommendation is not going to be what your staff is recommending. And, and of course, we also have a record to compile because the district council is going to be the ultimate arbiter and decision maker relative to the use table modification and indeed as to the site plan. Mr. Lat Peak from Johnson Development is going to testify shortly. Uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about the history of the company. I will say that they have been already extremely active in Prince George's County. Uh, they have uh, built one hotel already at National Harbor. The Hyatt Hotel, which is under construction, is theirs. They manage a hotel in um, Inglewood Business Park. They are in the process of seeking approvals to build a huge distribution facility in the county. And they have, have built and been before you on two separate consolidated storage facility applications. The first was on Apollo Drive in Largo, and we came before you in 2017. We sought a use table modification and a detailed site plan approval. Now, in that, in that case, staff recommended approval of the use table modification, uh, and as did the planning board. That facility is now built. It's beautiful. Um, it is approaching 65%, I think, uh, totally leased up. It's one of their fastest running properties. And do we have the capability to bring up the first uh, item on our drive, please? There it is. There it is. That's the building that's built on Apollo Drive um, in the Largo Town Center sectional map amendment. Uh, it was not a permitted use. Uh, we came before you and uh, you recommended approval of the use table modification. I would add that building has more EFIS than the building that's being proposed today. Okay? But it looks great and it's been incredibly well received by the neighborhood. Uh, as you will find in this case today, we came before you in that case with uh, total neighborhood uh, uh, support, and that's what we have today as well. Um, so that one is built. There, you and your staff both recommended approval of the use table modification. 
And I'm going to bifurcate my personal presentation because when I come back up, I'm going to tell you why that's so important. Because it is an amazingly analogous situation. Which is why Mr. Lynch is back there we're listening. But Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. So that's the first one. Now, the second one that we came before you on was in College Park, Route 1. That was an incredibly contentious hearing, if you will recall, because we had lots of citizens in opposition to that proposal. Um, and there you see the building, that one. Uh, and and here's, here's where the evolution starts, because we came before you on that one, and executive staff of the Park and Planning Commission advised planning board, as a matter of policy, will not make a recommendation on a use table modification going forward because that is the sole province of the district council. Now, I could quote you the, sex, the transcript page from that hearing where that statement was made, and that is indeed what the board did in that case. No recommendation on the use table modification, but you did recommend approval of the site plan, which again has very similar amounts of EFIS as the current proposal does. That, that building is approved. It is now under construction. And we hope to be taking renters there in the not too distant future. So <clears throat> when we went to file this application, that's before you today, I fully expected I was going to get a no recommendation. I told my client that. And lo and behold, we find out we're going to get a disapproval recommendation on the use table modification. I said, well, is this change in policy? I didn't get a uh, bulletin. And, you know, I just said, well, this is, this is what I was told by staff. We're going to get a disapproval. So we get a disapproval. When, when was the, what date was the College Park one? Uh, about a year and a half, uh, less than a year and a half ago. Okay. It was, uh, no, no, it, it, yeah, but it was approved by the District Council in October okay. of 2018. Okay. Uh, the residents filed a motion for reconsideration. The District Council Maybe it was 2019, the district council uh, then can, no, it was 2018, the district council considered the reconsideration in January of 2019 and disapproved it. And so the case went forward, it was approved, it's now under construction. So, so you said it came before us on July 23rd, 2018, okay. Correct. The mm -hmm. infamous, okay. Yeah, the infamous, okay. the infamous. And so, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's surprising. It's surprising that we ha hear these change of positions, uh, especially when my client thinks we're going to get one position. They invest a quarter of a million dollars to go forward with a project, and, we're get, and we get slammed with a recommendation of disapproval. Um, <clears throat> so let me, let me tell you what we did in this case, because <clears throat> the very first thing we did, because we had not filed a case, we met with uh, Councilwoman Ivy in December of 2018. She had not yet been sworn in as a council member. We explained to her what our proposal was. We have also had no fewer than six meetings with representatives of the town of Landover Hills. This property is located within the municipal limits of the town of Landover Hills. We have met independently with the town manager, with the mayor, with the mayor and one council member. We have been to one work session of the town of Landover Hills, and we have been to two public hearings of the town, with the town of Landover Hills. They have filed a letter of support. The mayor and town manager are here today to testify in support of this application. And I think that's a, a telling comment when you look at page nine of the staff report when uh, Mr. Hurlbutt says that uh, you gotta deny this because you're not gonna fulfill the wishes of the community. But the community is here and they're supporting this. So it's a little hard to understand that recommendation. Um, The property itself, it is extremely small. It is 1.09 acre. It has very narrow frontage. It is rectangular in shape, very little frontage on 450. It's a recorded plat. Um, <clears throat> in 1961, there was a McDonald's restaurant built on this property. It closed, and approximately 1991, the early learning center daycare facility opened 
on the property. And if we go to the next slide, this is the aerial. Yeah, this is the aerial photograph. So you see the, the building there. The daycare center is operating out of the old McDonald's building. Um, to the left, which I guess would be southwest, that is a Pizza Hut. And the large uh, building is the Crestview Shopping Center. Uh, extremely successful, extremely well operated, uh, and very busy. To the east and northeast uh, is a car wash. Also vibrant and very busy. Beyond that is Pep Boys. Again, a very successful functioning business. Uh, the point to be made here is that these businesses are going nowhere soon. Uh, th this is a, uh, like I said, a very vibrant and a very busy uh, thoroughfare on um, Annapolis Road. Uh, Mr. Hurlbut, if you could go to the next slide, please. This is uh, a topographic map of the property. As you can see, our elevation is 219 uh, out at the front. It begins sloping gradually back and then right, but right there, right there, stop right there. At that point, it precipitously goes downhill to an elevation of 158 feet. The slope there is two to one. It is like that. I know because I have walked it. I have been there. Okay? And that's going to bear, that's going to bear upon whether or not any of the recommendations of the sector plan can be fulfilled as to this property. Because our, our case is going to, going to establish that they cannot. They cannot. Um, <clears throat> so, go to the next slide if you could, Mr. Hurl, but I just want to take the board through. This is a photograph of Crestview Shopping Center. By the way, these photographs were taken last Saturday. Crestview Shopping Center uh, to the southwest. Next one, Mr. Hobart. Across the street, directly across the street from the property, a gas station. Next one, sir. The Pizza Hut within the Crestview Shopping Center. Next one. Uh, this is a picture of our site from the street. Um, as you can see, there's a bus and a van used to uh, ferry uh, students and uh, daycare children back and forth. The building is behind it. As you can see, it's constructed a substantial distance off of 450. Mr. Hurlbut, the next one, please. Again, a front-on picture of the Early Learning Center daycare. Next one. Um, at, we're sort of moving to the, to the, uh, to the uh, east there, I guess you would say. Uh, there are two access drives on the property. Now we're going to consolidate it to one. And the next one, that's the car wash. That is immediately uh, contiguous to us on the left as you're looking at us from 450. The next photograph, sir. Now you begin to see the drop-off in the property behind when we come back. When that daycare parking lot ends, there's a fence, and the property precipitously falls off at a two-to-one slope. Next one. There, there you get an idea of the slope. You, I think you can see the roof of a building in the uh, background of the, of the uh, photograph. Next one, sir. Gives you an idea of what's happening back there. Um, trash, litter. Uh, next one. There we go. Water. Okay. so. We went out to the site with the Maryland Department of the Environment and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and your environmental planning section because our environmental folks looked and said, we, we see running water on the back of this property. What is it? Everybody thought maybe we had a, a spring on the property. So we went out with those three jurisdictional entities. We walked the property. I was there with them. And lo and behold, what we found is that the car wash immediately adjacent to us had an open pipe beneath their parking lot. And their water was being expelled down the hill, but because of the topo, it ran onto our property. So we have running water from the car wash coming across our property, coming down. Let's go to the next slide. That's an, uh, I don't know how that one got in there. but That's the Pep Boys. Keep going if you would, Mr. Hurlbutt. There we go. So what the apartment building had to do was, on their own, install riprap on their property to accommodate this water running off from the car wash that was coming across our property. Keep going if you could, Mr. Hurlbut. There it is. There's more of it. And again, 
more of the water coming down the hill. There it comes underneath the fence. You can just go to the next one if you don't mind. Uh, there we go, up the hill, another photograph. Again, up the hill with standing water at the bottom. And there we go, you get a sense of the slope. A photograph can't do justice to the two to one slope on that property. It can't do justice. Next one. There's the water coming down to the apartments. And the next one, another shot of the slope. You'll see in the right hand uh, portion of that photograph, that's a, uh, a roof and a, a, of a building on the car wash property. Another one, next, uh, next slide please. Same thing. And there's a pipe. Next one, another shot of the slope. And again, we're coming to the end. Now we're out on, we're back out on, on uh, Annapolis Road. This is just some of the adjoining uh, properties that have very vibrant uh, commercial uses that are uh, uh, permitted as a matter of right. If you go to the next one, Mr. Hurlbuck, there's the 7-Eleven within the community shopping center, which is the next one down. Uh, next slide, please. And now we're at our, our, our new site plan. So that gives you a sense of, um, of what we're dealing with relative to the topography of the property. Um, and that's gonna have an impact on, when I give you a copy of the map from page 87 of the sector plan, which the staff is relying on for what the use on this property should be. Um, I have a, uh, I, I have a witness, I have a witness who has to get onto a big conference call at three o'clock. I hate to stop my presentation to let him come up here, but, it's, but That's I, fine. it's very important to have his testimony because one of the things we're gonna prove in this case is that you cannot develop a multifamily product on this property. You cannot develop it. Evidence that was gonna come in before um, Mr. Varga uh, would establish, and it's gonna come in after he testifies, that uh, the maximum uh, multifamily building you could build, if indeed there was a market, was is 28 units, a 28 unit multifamily building, which of course is not marketable. Mr. Varga is, going to, is a well-known uh, multifamily broker in Prince George's County and the, uh, the Washington metropolitan area, and he's gonna provide some testimony right now uh, about his knowledge of this property and his opinion as to whether or not it could be developed with multifamily residential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, the members of the board, thank you for your time and your consideration, and I appreciate the accommodation to allow me to speak out of turn. Thank you. For the record, my name is Steve Varga. I'm principal of a firm called Enterprise Realty Services. We are a commercial real estate services firm that specializes in the sale of multifamily development sites throughout the greater Washington area. Um, and over 30 years, I've done a lot of work in Prince George's County. Uh, I was first asked to look at this site to give my opinion on what I thought about its viability for multifamily development. Um, and for a number of reasons I'll go through, uh, it's not. Um, it is a very challenging site. Uh, first of all, just the site itself as that is addressed. I mean, it's just too small. It's only one acre, um, you know, and about half of it's unusable. In order to justify new multifamily development and obtain financing, typically you need at least 200 units. Um, in addition, it depends on the construction type. Um, the rents don't justify new construction at this location today, uh, where hard costs have been and where returns on cost in, in, uh, institutional returns, required returns are. Um, the adjacent Verona apartments, rents are running at about $1.72, $1.73 seventy-three a square foot, which is about $1,450 a month. In order to justify new uh, multifamily wrap construction with structured parking, you need well north of $2 a foot, ideally 220 to 230 a square foot, which is about 1,900 to $2,000 a month, uh, which is pretty far off from where we are to justify surface, uh, surface park uh, multifamily. I need about $1.85 or so, um, which typically would be about 16 to $1,700 a month. So even if I had enough acreage, 
is just economically where the rents are there today is very challenging. Uh, in today's market, in order to get new multifamily development uh, financed, you basically have to have one to three, you have to have three components. You have to have metro, you have to have proximity to new vibrant uh, high quality retail and dining, or proximity to major employment. Uh, 6801 Annapolis Road doesn't possess any of these characteristics. Um, the ch challenging location makes financing very difficult. Um, you know, worked on a site uh, in Landover off Sheriff Road and Bright Seat, and we couldn't get that financed. We went to HUD, thought we would try to get HUD to finance it. They turned it down uh, because there is a competing project, the Landover Metro, that Jamal is doing. So HUD is not an option. That would typically be your fallback for financing um, for multifamily development in a location like this. Um, in addition, the prospect of ground floor retail and multifamily uh, is really become difficult. Uh, institutional multifamily developers loathe it. Um, it's very challenging. Basically, there's just it adds additional cost to construct that concrete on the ground floor, but you typically can't lease it, and there's no firm revenue to offset the cost of doing that. So what we've been seeing throughout the Washington area is really a pullback from requiring ground floor retail and multifamily projects. For instance, if you go to Arlington, the roslyn Boston corridor, for years they required it, and you go there and now, there's hundreds of thousands of square feet of vacant ground floor retail and brand new high-rise buildings over there. So even Arlington has been dialing back on that requirement. Um, you know, it can work in, in certain locations, um, limited, limited sites, limited uh, areas where you know, there's complementary uses in supporting retail, such as College Park. Um, but in general, it's not an economic and multifamily buildings, and developers will allocate very little value to it. So, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, based on our 30 years of experience, this site in no way, shape, or form uh, could support or justify new multifamily development, in our opinion. Thank you. Are there questions at this time? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, picking, picking back up, if I could, let me tell you a little bit about our proposal. This is a uh, rendered uh, copy of our site plan. Um, so our proposal is, my client is the contract purchaser of this property. Um, Ms. Tyree, who operates Early Learning Center, uh, really wants to close the business down. And my client is proposing to purchase the property from her. We will raise the 2,300 square foot old McDonald's building, and we will construct a new consolidated storage facility on the property. Um, it will have about 1,300 individual storage units. Um, many of the units will be five by five, five by 10, uh, 10 by 15, really smaller units because that's the nature of what's happened in the consolidated storage industry today. Um, there is nothing, and Mr. Peak is going to address this, and he has a photograph of the only storage facility in anywhere close to what you would call a market area, uh, and it is a very small um, you know, asphalt driveway, one story, roll up doors, the kind of mini warehouse that the county didn't want anymore, um, and which is really used by businesses to run their business out of. Uh, so there's no there, there's a there's a demand for this use in this area, a crying demand. Um, we will have a building which will present itself. It will be four stories. You look at this building from from uh, Annapolis Road. It will be four stories. Um, so, so it's really seven, but because oh, it's not, we don't think it is seven. Oh, it's think, not seven. No, we don't okay. think it is. Not under the not under the code. Okay. Not under the code definition uh, of storage. Um, and we'll get to that in our presentation. Okay. We'll get to that in our presentation. But what we did is this: because of the severe topo change that we have. Okay, we have four stories, and we get back to the topo, and we put three basement levels mm -hmm. on the back side of the hill. Okay, so, so the basement levels aren't aren't the entire depth of the. Cor that's absolutely the, correct. Okay. Absolutely correct. To take advantage of the topo mm -hmm. and to fulfill the need in the community for this use. I mean, th this this is going to be an immensely successful building, which is which, quite frankly, 
incorporates high architectural standards and is going to kickstart development in the 450 area. Do you realize this sector plan was adopted in 2010? Two years maybe to work on it? I don't know. 2010? Nothing. <coughs> nothing. This is in character area C, which basically runs from Cooper Lane down to 68th. There's 25 acres in character area C. <coughs> Not one thing has developed in character area C in 10 years. Not one thing, let alone multifamily residential that staff argues is what the plan recommends. And we have a lot to say about that too because that's, we take vigorous exception to what the staff's interpretation of the sector plan is. But <coughs> be that as it may, we, uh, when we met with uh, Councilwoman Ivey, and, and I'm just relating what happened, um, we were asked if we could provide a community space on the first floor of this building. So we started out and we proposed a community meeting space on the first floor of the building. We talked to the town about it. The town said, oh, that's going to be a real maintenance headache for us because we're going to have to administer it. So then we fell back and we decided that we were going to create a uh, community incubator office space on the first floor. So we have 1,006 square feet allocated on the front of the building. It's the left side as you look at it, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. That will be for community incubator space. We're going to work with the town to try to find a startup business uh, who can utilize that space uh, for office purposes. Immediately next to that, we have our office for the storage facility, which also will have retail sales of items. Uh, within within that space and then we have the uh, storage facilities themselves um, we went uh, let me let me just finish security wise everything is cameraed all the corners of the building on the exterior interior halls have cameras um, we're not going to fence the structure because we don't think that looks good we don't think we need it uh, we will have a a personnel, a person, a staff person inside the office building uh, between the hours of 9.30 and 6 p.m. Patrons who have a unit will be able to access their unit between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. with a keypad, with a keypad. After that, no access whatsoever. No access after 10 p.m. and no access again until 6, until 6 the next morning. What, now, what are your staff person hours again? Staff hours would be 9.30 to 6 p.m. Okay. And access is 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. So you, we're going to consolidate the two access driveways. So we just have one, and that's going to be directly across from the traffic signal on 450. Patrons are going to come in. We have 12 parking spaces uh, along the uh, side of the building, and then two loading spaces right there. That is the access for loading. No access to units from outside the building everything has to be inside uh, elevators in the building to take you to all floors climate controlled uh, every inch of the building is going to be climate controlled so th this is a state-of-the-art facility uh, and identical in operation to Largo and to College Park identical in operation we um, you know, we, we filed the application. We felt, quite frankly, the building was attractive. And if you look at our architect's matrix that we filed with the application, the architect has many opinions about uh, the articulation, uh, uh, about, about how it meets high architectural style. Mr. Hurlbut doesn't agree with that, but he didn't feel that way. Um, we filed the application. We went to Subdivision Review Committee on November 19th, and we were told application would not be supported for a use table modification, and that our site plan would also not be supported. Okay, so this is what I want to know. You mentioned that in the very beginning, mm -hmm. and you talked about the, um, the July 23rd, in contrast to the, uh, the, um, the College Park. Um, um, uh, self-storage and that we made no recommendation on the use table but uh, we did um, recommend a, approval of the detailed site plan mm -hmm. and so my question is when you brought that to 
our staff's attention, what was the response? Not anymore. Worse to that effect. Okay. Change in position. Okay. Change in position. Okay. Because I do remember that day. I remember the, the 20th, July 23rd of 2018. Right. That was a very bad two weeks. It wasn't just the 23rd. In, in, it the 23rd indeed, and indeed it was. Because because when, when I was for, I, well, the first time I talked to a staff person about this proposal, you know, I said, well, I guess it'll be no recommendation on the use table modification. And I was so not necessarily. If we don't think it's a good idea, we're just going to recommend denial. Okay. So I'm just, that, that, that's what I was told. Oh, yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Because the conversation was not with you, Ms. Green. Okay. Um, so, um, so anyhow, we filed the case. We go to subdivision review committee. No on the use table modification. No on your site plan. What's wrong? Well, you have way too much, for the most part, for the most part, way too much EFIS. Wait, I'm sorry, way too EFIS, much EFIS. EFIS, the stucco, the stucco. So one of my client's representatives, Mr. Jones, I think it was over on the side there, asked, how, how much is too much? Someone, someone said 50%, someone. I don't know who someone said 50%. I have it in my handwritten notes. He heard it. And by the way, it's in your staff report. It's in your staff report too. And you're saying this is less EFIS than? Yes, oh yes, substantially less than 50. Now, now it is, okay? So, so here's what happened. Let me give you the chronology, okay? So at SDRC, you're told you have 35 days. You know, you have to get your amended plans in within 35 days. So what we did, Pull up the uh, elevation again, if you could, Jeremy. That was submitted? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The side elevation is probably the best. Didn't hear you, Mr. Gibbs. The, yes, the side elevation. I'm asking Jeremy to pull up the elevation. <clears throat> Sorry to make you do that. apologize. Okay. So, there we go. So basically, the middle third of that building was where the EFIS started when we filed. Okay. If you could, it was in front of there. Yeah, right in there. There we go. Uh huh. There and there. Where? There and there. Right there. Between the column. Between the between the brick columns. Yes, sir. So, um, so I scheduled a meeting with Ms. Cossack. and I said our proposal is because Mr. Mr. Hurlbut was not in. And I was, we were coming up on our 35 days. And I said, what if we change that EFIS to hardy board, the cementitious siding? And I got, an, I got, I got a favorable, she didn't say, you know, I don't want to say that Ms. Cossack said, oh yeah, we're definitely going to approve that. She didn't, but, but I got a favorable <laughs> response. That makes sense, worse to that effect. So we amended the plan and we filed it that way, the way you have it. Okay, I'm still hopeful at this point of at least getting a staff report that recommends approval of the site plan. I mean, because, because here's how we look at this. If the, if the use table modification is approved, then the site plan should show architecture for an acceptable consolidated storage facility, not for an apartment building. And we've never been able to cross that line with staff. So I get a staff report and it recommends denial of everything. So after that, we continue our first planning board hearing date. We continue. And we say we're going to try and work with staff to come to an acceptable solution on the architecture of the building. So at least we can get a recommendation for approval on the site plan. We have three meetings with staff, three meetings. Our architect calls in. We, have, we talk, we have this, we have that, we have recommendations. The first one was, if you could go back to our site plan, Jeremy. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, no, the next one, it's, on, it's actually on our, yeah, I'm sorry, you gotta go back to our thumb drive now, I apologize. Yeah, there we go. So, we were told, okay, you have to do something to enhance the pedestrian experience on 450. So we talked about putting a patio area out there with benches, enhancing the landscaping. We did that. 
we did that. We have a nice, I, th I think community planning would say this is, this is an inviting pedestrian front to this building now. Um, we had met with Fred Schaefer before he retired, the trails coordinator on a BPIS statement. We, we did not feel that there was any linkage between BPIS products and a consolidated storage facility. Notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that, we agreed to, there's a bus stop. We agreed to provide the, the pad for the bus shelter and the bus shelter itself. So you see that bus shelter is there. That's something that we're gonna provide, okay? Um, then we started working on the architecture and we got down to a final meeting with staff uh, Friday a week ago. And um, we brought in new architecture and Mr. Hurlbuck can speak for himself, but we got a lot of compliments on the changes that we had made. And I'd like you to move on to that if you could, Jeremy. I think it's next one. There we go. Okay, so. So we have, these are, these are, it's a two sheet set of rendered elevations. Really perspective drawings. And as you can see, the building has changed dramatically. We need more confetti. Basically, uh, when you're looking at these two drawings, uh, and I'll let my client correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the EFIS that you see, there's a band of EFIS at the top. Okay, let me, let me Mr. Gibbs, let me do this for a second because I wanna make sure that, um, so th this, is, this is an excerpt from the, this PowerPoint, is that? That is correct, and, okay, and so, so to, I, I wanna give you a hard copy. A, no, no, hold on, hold on, I need to know the PowerPoint was just provided today. Yes, sir, so yes ma'am, yes ma'am. I need to have that marked and ex I mean, just accepted yeah. into the record as applicant's exhibit number one. Okay. And then, okay, so that's the first thing. So the, that will be the PowerPoint. I got this. Um, all of this, all, okay. So, and, well, I, and I just wanted to give you hard copies so that you might want to refer to it because you can get it up close and personal. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. And, so, so these, these are just excerpts from it. I don't know that we have to specifically right. introduce that. And, and, and basically, what you see now. All right, you know what? This, <laughs> is, this is going to be applicants exhibit um, 2 A and B that show the, uh, the facade. And then uh, the first one are two pages. Um, 2 uh, A would be the facade, which is an excerpt from applicants exhibit 1. But that will mark that 2 A. And 2 B will be the. Um, Detailing the the EFIS right right well to be I mean to be huh pardon me to be is no. is just a different no. side of the building okay got it okay okay yeah and so and so basically what has happened now that's accepted into the record is that thank you very side. much thank you is that EFIS is now nothing more than an access treatment yeah. on this building we have brick okay we have concrete masonry units we have metal paneling we have spandrel glass. We have a hardy board. Um, we have brick, brick uh, okay, columns me, on the sides. Let me stop you for a second. Mm -hmm. It's it's it, um, it's a storage unit. We don't want ugly storage units, but it's a storage unit, and it, and and it's and it's a decent looking storage unit in my in my view. Um, the one on Apollo Drive, I see the one on on um, it's right next to the Rite Aid. It's right next to some my old law offices. So I know um, it's. Uh, the one in, at College Park, I see, and it's got the nice red. Okay, and then, um, um, so my question now is, I need to know, help us get there. I don't have, I don't particularly have a problem with the looks of the building. Mm -hmm. 
and, and I need to know, tell me how this doesn't thwart the plan. Give me, give me something, an argument that tells me. Well, I, quite frankly, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out what the staff's objection is at this point to our architecture that we've revised here. Okay, and but I'm I mean, not, right now I'm not talking about the architecture. That, that, that's what you're trying to figure out, but ultimately we're up here. So here, here I'm past the architecture. Okay, okay. I am. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's and fine. I, and just to be clear, staff, you all have not seen this, correct? If you just received it today? So we received it on Friday, so we have seen right. it. Right. Okay. Yeah, we, 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 get, we left it with them last Friday. Right? Okay, well, so wait a minute. The PowerPoint was given last Friday, or just this? We put the PowerPoint together for the hearing. But okay. But the, this part was given last week. The perspective and then the revised elevations okay, that are the next it. thing on the, uh, okay. on the PowerPoint. Uh, they, they were left with staff last Friday. Okay, help me. And I, I want to put a push pin in that part, the architecture, if I can. You can come back to it if you feel you need to come back to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm past the architecture okay. right now. That, I'm one person. But okay. I, I, I'd like to know, help me. So I'll, I'll say I am also past the architecture. I think it looks yeah. good. So I would rather move on to more substantive issues. Yeah, I, want, I, I need to tie this. It, you want us to approve this and recommend approval to the district? Council, I provide us the way to get there. Well, first of all, I, I, I think we are there. I think this, in terms of the site plan, uh, we have a lot to say about the use. But in terms of the site plan, I mean, I think we're there. Staff, to my knowledge, has not said that they have any problem with the site plan other than that they contend it's a seven-story building and four stories are permitted in the sector plan. But in terms of okay, the so layout of back. the site. Okay, stop for a second. I'm, I'm going to come back to you. Take a deep breath over there. Okay, I need to come back to the, how does the zoning ordinance define the story? Because I know, I understand our, our, if we've said seven stories, if our staff said seven stories, and you're saying this is four stories, but a portion of the three subterranean levels are below grade. Yeah, are indeed subterranean. Uh, Madam Chair, we will look up the, the definition for you and read it to you. The, 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 the difference, I think, that we have is that we have in some places in our ordinance and in our plans where it refers to height by stories, uh -huh. and then we have other places where it refers to height by feet. Okay. And so what we need so to do is- So this is why the zoning rewrite, one more reason why that was so very important. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I can address this yes. issue for Okay, you. okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, all right, so you're gonna look that up. Okay, all right, so, okay, tell me, you just passed out something else. In order to accept this into the record, I need to know what this is. Okay, These are, uh, this oh, is, from the, the first page is a page SMA. from the uh, 450 Central, 450 Sector Plan. Uh -huh. And the second page is uh, from the Prince George's County Zoning Ordinance Definition section. Okay, so on page, um, do you have this? Can you turn to the second page? All right, so. Okay, thank you very much. So, the first page, uh, you know, we're, we are in character area C mm -hmm. in the sector plan, and that's called mixed use transition. So, you, you see here this table, and it says building height maximum four stories in the mixed use transition. Got it. Mm -hmm. Turn over to the next page. And that is the definition of a story from the zoning ordinance, and I've highlighted the pertinent section where it says a basement shall be counted as a story if its ceiling is over five feet above the average building grade or it is not used exclusively for storage. Our basement is used exclusively for storage. Those basement floors are not counted as stories. Now, now look, oh wait, hold on, hold on. We, 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 we dealt with this issue at College Park. We dealt with this issue at College Park, and it came before the district council. In that in that case, in that case, um, we were dealing with the Central U.S. One Corridor sector plan. They had definitions for stories in the sector plan, okay. and it said it had to be habitable space, and consolidated storage was not such. So the district council in the approval, I have all these documents here, in the approval specifically found 
that the storage was, was not subject to the height limitation because it was not habitable space. Okay, that, that, that's a finding in this, in this approval. Now, it's not using this section of the code. I want to be totally transparent. Mm -hmm. It's using the definitions in the Route 1 sector plan. Okay. okay. And I have copies of all those to put into the record, too. So, now, your attorney is looking at me and saying, Gibbs, how could you be so silly as to make a... a, a, she, a I, didn't, I heard no such words. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I, I see the raised eyebrows and the okay. sarcastic smile that, that I love, by the way, that I love. <laughs> but, but, but look, it is what it is. The definition is what it is. I know, I know, because I talked to Mr. Hurlbut about this yesterday, and he says, oh, well, clearly that means accessory storage or storage in a basement or something. That's not what it says. That's okay. not what the definition okay. says used exclusively for storage. And, and, you know, sometimes the definitions help you. Sometimes they hurt you. If, if you want to change it. Can you, well, do, can you do me a favor? Can you mm -hmm. just take a deep breath for a second? Okay. Sure. You are making a case, which you're known to do, and I commend you for that. I respect that. I understand when you, why you have to do that. At the same time, I need, when you make such a statement, I also need to go to our council as well. 100%. But stop. 100%. And I also need to hear, but you also need to hear and see where people, where, where, when yeah, people are fine. trying to get you where, where we may need to go. You heard us, several of us say we're not concerned about the architecture at this point. So we're trying to figure out where we can go with this. So don't work against us, work with us here. Okay, Ms. Borden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Deborah Borden, Deputy General Counsel. Yes, <laughs> I, I agree that the wording says, or it is not used exclusively for storage or the mechanical elements of the building. Mm -hmm. That list, storage or the mechanical elements of the building, is talking about something that comes with a building, that comes with, you know, you have mechanical, you have storage. It's not talking about a building that's used exclusively for storage, for commercial purposes. That is a completely uh, different thing. And that, I, would, I, would suggest, I, I would suggest that, um, that that would be a very unusual reading of the definition uh, uh, to, to say that it's not a story, because basically you would have a zero-story building. Right. Mm -hmm. You would well. have a, a, a building that, you know, it, it looks pretty tall to me, and it's basically a zero-story story building because it's all storage. And that doesn't make What's any that? sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, the definition to us applies only to basements, not to every story. If you read it closely, it applies to basements, and these are basements. So they are basements used exclusively for storage. But I'm sorry. I was asking if you all had looked up the definition yet, now, other than the one, if you didn't have enough time. I was trying not to disturb you. I was trying to ask him, David. OK. OK, OK, fine. See, because it says, you got to read the whole sentence. It says, a basement shall be counted as a story if its ceiling is over five feet above average building grade or it is not used exclusively, exclusively for storage or, or equipment. These are basement levels. They are beneath the grade. These are basement levels. We meet this definition. It's, it, we're not trying to say the whole building is storage and therefore we could build a 100-story building and it, and it wouldn't meet, it wouldn't have any height requirement. We're not saying that. It's a basement and the, and the definition limits it to basement. The other thing I would note is that even if you didn't agree with this, even if you didn't agree with this, anything that is below the average building grade is also not a story. And so I have a, I have a document here that we prepared, and it shows that even if you didn't agree that that sentence applies, which we think very clearly it does because it is a basement used exclusively for storage. If you didn't agree with that, under the average building grade, we would have in the back a five-story building, not a seven-story building. Okay? Now, if you recall, if you recall, College Park. So wait Park, a minute. In the back, you would, oh, because of, because of the test of the, yeah, the drop. Because it's right. below, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the, the only reason the third one isn't is because the average building grade for this site is 204.3, and the, 
And the, the top basement, we have three basements, three levels of basement. The top basement is at 206.33. So we you're just saying missed. under either definition, it doesn't constitute seven stories and, and, and under both of them, and that we can just pick one. Yeah, under any, any way we well, look well, at no, it. Well, no, 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 no. But no, any way be, we look at it, right. it but to be fair, okay. But to be fair to your staff, okay, to be fair okay. to your staff, because if you, if you don't agree with the storage definition, all right, then use average building grade, it would be a five-story building. Okay. Four in the front. Okay. But if you looked at this definition, five, five in the in back, the back. Okay. using average building grade. Okay. And, I would, and I would ask you to recall, you know, it's really uncanny how things come back. But if you remember the site at College Park, it was just like this. It okay. fell off dramatically okay. down to uh, an environmental area from Route 1. And we had a six-story building there. You approved a modification from the height standards because of the topography. I have okay, a so let me do this because the the um, the chapter eight for the sectional map amendment and the de and your definition of two twenty three and um, the story, the definition of a story, including the um, the term basement. Mm -hmm. We're going to accept that into the record as applicants exhibit number three. Okay. Thank you very much. And okay, then we so have the uh, average building grade document here. That'd be Mr. four. Well, where's that? It's coming up. Oh, unfortunately, okay. I didn't make a bunch of copies of okay, that. Okay, that's fine. Um, Mr. Cosby, I'm going to give these back to you. To, to Do we have a problem? No. What's number three? This is the one I just gave you. Okay. I'm getting ready to send them over there. Okay. Okay, and so now we have... Um, now what is this? It's the definition. This is from the zoning ordinance definition, section 27 107.01. Definitions. Uh, terms in the zoning ordinance are defined as follows, and it is uh, section A223 um, provides but, um, when a basement shall be counted as a story. But, but that is the same definition. It's just that we have put the average building grades for our site on that piece of paper. Okay, so the average building grades, and we're going to mark this and, ex and accept it into the record as applicants exhibit number four. Right. So, so if you didn't and agree, and then I'm going to hold on. I'm going to pass this down illegal. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So if you didn't agree with our definition of storage, which we meet, um, we would ask you for a modification of one, one. floor. Okay. Which is exactly what you did for the same exact reason at College Park. So I'd like to put a copy of your resolution in the College Park case into the record. Michael. So as well as a copy of the district council's. This is your resolution. Oh, on the College on Park? On the College Park case. Okay. Where so you, we you can take administrative notice, but to be consistent, we're going to accept the resolution of the um, College Park um, a, a storage, um, which was a, which was approved. Uh, it was approved. Um, on Thursday, July 26th. Um, and we'll have it um, accepted as record as applicants exhibit number five, right? Right. And then I'm putting into evidence a copy of the district council's order of approval of the College Park case where they discuss the, uh, the storage definition. Okay, and we will accept it into the record as applicants exhibit number six is the final decision of the district council. So, okay. okay. I have the copies. To legal. Okay, where are we going with this? Yeah, sorry, um, Madam Chair, uh, Deborah Borden. I have to add another wrinkle to this. Um, the definition of basement, which is what the height <laughs> definition refers you to, right? it says, quote, basement. So that means basement as defined in the zoning ordinance. That definition would seem to indicate that you can't count these partially yeah. under, under grade levels as a basement because it says the portion of a building below the first floor, floor joists having more than one half 
of its clear ceiling height below the building grade on all sides. So that would seem to indicate that it's possibly not considered a basement for the zoning purposes. Therefore, you can't consider it uh, as not a story under this exception. Say that again about the all sides. It says the portion of a building below the first floor joists, other than a crawl space, having more than one half of its clear ceiling height below the building grade on all sides. All sides. So um, I'm just okay. suggesting. No. Okay. But if, how, why is the more than half say, yeah. if it's all sides? I'm trying to reconcile the, if it's if more than half, but then it speaks to all sides. Yeah. More than the, half of its clear ceiling height below the building grade on all sides. Ceiling height. I'm and all sides are height. more than a half. Right. But ceiling height. That's right. what, yeah. That's right. Right. And then we'll give you a chance to respond, Mr. Gibbs. So I, 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 I'm, I'm simply suggesting that it is possible that the staff got it right the first time, that, that they would need um, whatever it is, four, four floors. Um, to be as part of the amendment to the requirement for it not to be in addition. Uh, I think it's the, the maximum height is four stories. And they are proposing in the back seven stories. Mm -hmm. So they would need three stories as part of their amendment. So, so it, it would probably be better if, if the board were inclined to consider this, it's better to just consider the amendment for the three stories because we don't want to consider it and then, and then still have that fall right. short. Exactly. Okay, here's what I'm getting ready to do. I'm getting ready to take a little break. Attorney to two attorneys can have a discussion on the best approach. You hear some sentiment that up here, at least three of us who've mentioned that we don't have a problem with the architecture. You, you, um, I do want to know that in the event this is in the event this is approved, because our staff never knows which way we're going to go, in the event that this is approved, you may have some ideal conditions or not. So it, um, in the event that it is, we'd like to, to see that. And number two, uh, uh, also I'd like to know, um, I, I need for us to get past the finding and, and maybe the requisite findings. Um, and I'd also like to know, um, and maybe, we may, and maybe we don't comment on the use. Yeah, I don't know. So, but I'm going to pass this case Madam and have Chair, attorney to attorney discuss. Yes. Just, I'm just having a hard time getting to putting a, a storage facility there in view of our plan 2035 and all the work that was put in by staff to develop 2035. I understand the comment about nothing's been there done in 10 years, but out of those 10, eight were people were recovering from the economy. So I'm having a hard time putting a, a, a storage building in an area that we want to develop in a certain manner. It has to start sometime. And if we don't, then it'll be a storage building, then it'll be something else. Say, so, well, you did it here. And I'm just afraid of establishing a precedent in an area we want developed. We, we, we I, have would, I would concur, generally speaking, with your comments, but I guess my, because I was somewhat similar in terms of the hurdle, it's how do we develop a multifamily, um, uh, yeah, on a one acre lot? <laughs> right. We can't I've get there. It. I've seen it done in Alexandria. Okay, so. I've seen it done in Arlington. Well, so we haven't so. put this to but. a vote yet. Okay, sir, don't communicate with us that way, because. Okay. okay. Um, we're we're going to take, a, a, take maybe a 10 minutes or so, 10, to, um, 10 or 15 minutes to, um, for you to have a conversation with our staff and with our council. And we may or may not agree up here, but that remains. That's why we got five people up here, and we'll see what happens. Right. Okay. And, and I would just say to Commissioner Geraldo, I mean, we believe me, we have a ton of information to present to address your concern. A ton. Okay. A ton. Oh, the rest of your evidence you'd like to submit? Okay. Well, I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. I'm just to, saying. If I, if I knew right what the now. sentiment of the board was, it might be a little easier for me, but I have to put my case on. I, uh, I do understand. You know, well, we and, we and uh, you have to put your case well, on. We have a ton. We definitely need a break. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Touche. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll make use of the time. Okay, we're going to take. Uh, let me ask this question about how much time do you need? 
10, 10 to 15 minutes. Is For that this? Right? Yeah. Nope. Five minutes max. Okay, well, we're going to take on 10. The, on we the have story a, issue. We have a one, at a, a one at a timer back there. We're okay. All right. Straight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. 10 minutes. We're at Central Wilmington. I know. Okay. Um, planning board is back in session. Um, I know you have some things to work on, Mr. Gibbs, but there are a number of people who've signed up to speak. Do we have any that, that we, you need to speak so they can yes. go on their all, merry way? I would like to ask the mayor of the uh, town of Landover Hills to come up right now. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Good, good, good afternoon. <laughs> Almost <laughs> evening. Yeah. Thank Hopefully not evening okay, yet. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff Shomish. I'm the mayor of Landover Hills. Thank I live you. at 4207 70th Avenue in Landover Hills uh, for the past 33 years. Um, as uh, Mr. Gibbs had indicated, uh, myself and the town manager and several of the individual council members have had at least a half a dozen meetings uh, or you know times when we've been able to look at this plan. Uh, it's come before the council twice where we uh, looked at the preliminary plans and we uh, entered a letter of support uh, saying we would like the project to move forward from the preliminary plans. I believe you have that in your record. And then uh, just recently we also had a uh, letter of support uh, for this particular meeting. Okay. Uh, and then also we did conduct a public hearing to, to see gauge what the interest in the community was. Um, and in addition to the usual ways that we uh, publicize our uh, public hearings, we did put this one specifically in our newsletter to gain interest. And I know at least Council Member Ivy and I think Galeros also put out notices uh, in their regular uh, email communications with the people that they have uh, notifying people of the uh, public hearing. Uh, unfortunately, the public hearing wasn't well attended. Uh, but the people who were there uh, did not indicate any concern with the uh, uh, architecture or with the project. One of the things that had come up was concerns about trash. We felt we had that taken care of because we have our own code officer who would be watching the facility. And if there was a problem, we could take care of it. They also had the security cameras so they can track anybody if, if that does become a problem as far as you know, leaving stuff and that kind of thing. Uh, we also did appreciate the uh, loss of the uh, second driveway to this area. Uh, there's the area driveway that they have right at the traffic light, which is going to remain open. Uh, but the secondary one has been a problem just with traffic. Um, it, the facility that's there now doesn't have that much traffic, but it's still on occasion having the two entranceways uh, had posed a problem for getting in and out of, for 450, so we appreciated that. And, uh, you know, we looked at the project as well and we supported it. So if you have any questions about our side of things, the, um, I don't know that there are any questions. There may be, but I do want to thank you for coming and saying it. <laughs> you see that we, we you, you probably struggle in the town as well with different right. uh, matters that come before you, and that's yes, what right. we're doing uh, here. We, we fully understand. Okay. <laughs> so, so thank you so much for coming and okay. staying, remaining. Well, thank you for, uh, for having us, and uh, I think we're going to be leaving to make sure the town <laughs> is still there. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> so were there, uh, did anybody have any questions? No. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Next. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, any in particular order? Well, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have to have some evidence in the record relative to the use modification simply because... Can you okay. have the microphone? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. No. I have to get some so evidence. you need to go forward. Well, That's I think fine. I can do it quick, a bit That's more fine. abbreviated, but I think because this, I have a staff report that recommends denial, and if... If, if the board is inclined to just take no position, I still have to have something in there. That's to, fine. We understand. Okay. But I, I didn't know if you wanted any people, any of these folks to speak yet. Yeah, you want uh, to go yeah I do. I do. Um, I, I'd like Mr. Lat Peak to come up. I, 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 he has in the thumb drive the uh, PowerPoint. He has a series of photographs uh, where consolidated, and to your point, Commissioner Geraldo, where consolidated storage facilities in the greater Washington metropolitan area are, are built in the same block abutting multifamily uh, residential uses because they're complementary. 
uh, and they're deemed to be that. And I'm not going to have him go through the whole PowerPoint. I would like to, the PowerPoint's in evidence. I would just like him to come up and identify himself and say that for the record. Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record, okay. And it's, uh, did, it's Mr. Peek. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I'm uh, Lat Peek. I'm a real estate manager with Johnson Development Associates, and I know time is sort of of the essence here, so we won't go through the multifamily presentation that we put together today, but the main objective was basically to show that multifamily and self-storage are not mutually exclusive from a land use perspective. In fact, we strongly believe that self-storage and multifamily have a symbiotic relationship where one benefits the other. And the reality is that these Class A 100% climate controlled um, self-storage facilities that are not um, conducive with just the drive up non-climate where there's cracked concrete. This isn't what we're planning to build here. This is multi-story class A. These act as actually as amenities to surrounding multifamily uses. And um, there's a variety of examples of that in DC and in Prince George's County where um, there's a symbiotic relationship between the two from 14 and U and DC to the Florida Avenue corridor and New York Avenue corridor. So. Um, yeah, I guess that pretty much covers it. Yeah, Thank thanks. Very much. Uh, I, do Thank. have, I do have hard copies of his presentation. Okay, so why don't, um, Mr. Cosby, can you give uh, Mr. Gibbs the other microphones if, so that um, um, if his folks are going to be using that one? Yeah, that's okay. good. Okay, so let's have the presentation then. Uh, what are we up to for applicants' exhibits? This would be seven? Okay. I'd next like to call. Okay, Ms. hold on a second. Let me sure, just. Sure. Um, oh, by the way. So this this um, exhibit, um, which would have been presented in more detail by Mr. Peak, um, is is accepted into the record as applicants' exhibit number seven. Cube Smart Florida Avenue. Oh no, more than that. Okay. Okay. Mr. Cosby. Um, I would like the uh, board, if they could, to take uh, administrative notice. I have a copy um, of uh, CB 26 of 2018. The standard articulated by the staff on page nine of the staff report for judging a use table modification is wrong. I have no idea where it came from. Uh, there's no ordinance citation to it. I, I, I don't know, but it's not what the zoning ordinance requires. What's the reference again? Is it, uh, on paragraph, I mean on page nine, yep. uh, t first full paragraph, At the bottom, uh, the staff says the last sentence. In so doing, they must Which find paragraph, I'm so sorry. top paragraph, carryover paragraph from page eight. It's the very got it. Okay. okay. So the last sentence. Uh, first of all, that uh, the top part talks about modifications. I see it. In so doing, they must find that the proposed development conforms with the purposes and recommendations for the development district as stated in the master plan, master plan amendment or sector plan, meets applicable site plan requirements and does not otherwise substantially impair the implementation of any comprehensive plan applicable to the subject development proposal. That test appears nowhere in the zoning ordinance or to my knowledge in the sector plan. The test, the test for an applicant to request a modification to the use table is contained in section 27548.26b of the zoning ordinance. And that test that test was just added to the zoning ordinance in 2018 pursuant to the adoption of C CB26 of 2018. Um, I, there's also in the legislative record of that file, um, a letter from the planning board 
actually recommending that specific language, which is which is very much different than what staff has in their report. Okay. Um, okay. So. Do you? Okay. Okay. So what, what, what do you want to do now? Um, well, I want to put a copy of that in the record as soon as okay. I find it. Um, okay, let's do that. We're up okay. to eight. Then, yes, then I want to ask, uh, then I want to put, this is page 87 from the sector plan. That's not, what is, what's 87? Applicants exhibit number eight or no, yes. the letter? Uh, th we'll make this eight because I got to find CB26. Okay, um, so wait a minute, the, what is this now? Okay. It is a table from, oh, the, from sector the sector plan. plan. Okay, so it's, this will, okay, go ahead. Okay, it shows mixed use transition area composite of key recommendations. And basically this shows character area C, okay? Okay. And you will see a legend at the bottom. Yeah. The retail? Where it's, well, we're hashed. Okay. We're, we're, this property is outlined in red on this exhibit. Right. I outlined that property. Okay. okay. And so the recommendation is mixed uses, housing, comma, offices, comma, store. stores. stores. Okay. There is no recommendation that every property have residential. Okay. Okay. So let me stop because we only have one copy here. So I want to make No, I, I have copies for everyone. Okay. okay. Make sure legal has it. Did, I don't know if you heard if you heard the argument. The earlier you heard, one or what he just made? No, just now no. in regard to applicants exhibit number eight. So the mixed use section of this exhibit, applicants exhibit number eight, is um, um, detailed in, in red. It's outlined in red. And he's showing that that's a mixed use area. It says mixed use housing, office, and stores. Correct. Um, and, and I. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now, at this point, I want to also direct your attention to. Mr. Gibbs, before you go, can you just repeat what we're looking at here on this one? Oh, this uh, yes. Yeah, this please. this is character area C, mixed use transition. Okay. Okay. And basically, it's a schematic. Mm -hmm that contains land use recommendations. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm bringing to your attention, w which is, it says, it doesn't say it ha has to be apartments. It says mixed uses, housing, office, stores. Right, right. housing, well, I, I, comma, I see comma, that. Comma, 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 comma. It doesn't, if you look at staff's page nine <laughs> of the staff <laughs> report, staff is saying that. Block. You see the red block? That's, mm -hmm. that's the proposed site. Right. Mm -hmm. Staff is saying on page nine on multiple occasions that the sector plan's recommend, recommendation is multifamily, mixed use multifamily for this site and indeed for all properties in character area C. That's not what it says. And I have another section, uh, another page from, from the uh, sector plan, which will be page 142, which will talk about character area um, C, which says the same thing. So. With that being said, I want to also note for you that the red, the red box for our property goes beyond the strike recommendation, mm -hmm. and behind it, there is a recommendation for a service road and a park, okay? Park open space. Right. And the sector plan text document says this is to be an accessible pedestrian park for active use and safe. So I'd like to have Mr. Todd Majera come up at this point. He's our site engineer. He is going to authenticate a drawing that he prepared, which confirms that if you did a multifamily use on this property, given the topo, okay, we've already heard that you couldn't uh, do structured parking here economically. Uh, you would get 28 units on this property, and no one can build a 28 unit building. Uh, he's also going to authenticate an exhibit that he prepared that shows where the park area comes in on this property and at a two to one slope, you could never build, a, build the park 
and the service road in the back is entirely problematic because of the grades. But you would agree that under the mixed uses, it's just housing, office, and stores. Does not stay. Does not say storage. No, but but but. No, 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 so yes or no. I 100% agree with that. But we have a mixed use building. We we have an office in our building, and we have retail sales. The office is, is de minimus. Well, uh, I, I would just say that at, Col at College Park, you found that was mixed use. Same thing. I'm just going to say that, that's in your resolution. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Mr. Majero, please. Todd McGarrett with Kimley Horn and Associates, uh, registered engineer record engineer of record for this project. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gibbs is passing out uh, two exhibits. The first one that he's given you is an exhibit which is supposed to uh, delineate a multifamily building. And I'll walk you through our thought process and how we got to. Uh, okay, what, wait a minute. What are we what? up to? Nine? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. No, this is nine. No, no, no. I'm, I'm one. Okay. And tell me why we have this again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Two minutes. This, this exhibit is to uh, show what a multifamily uh, mm -hmm. building would look like on site with at grade parking, without the structure parking. Um, to, to determine the yield that we could get for the dwelling units. Thank you. So what, what we see here is, is, uh, is the building and then the parking. What really de uh, determines dwelling units is the parking count. So keeping the parking at grade, uh, we were able to get 19 parking spaces uh, with it using the zoning code definition of required parking per dwelling unit which was 1.33 for one bedrooms in a one mile radius of the metro. Um, you back that out and then add the 50% reduction for the parking per the sector plan, you would be able to allow, you would be allowed to have 28 one bedroom dwelling units for a multifamily with, within the four story building. Okay, and exhibit 10, please, is the microphone. 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 Exhibit 10 is a blow up of, of this is not, that's correct. 10. That is exhibit 10. Okay. That is again the site with the park area shown in green scaled off of page 87. That is, that is correct. So this exhibit, the green is the park area just left of that park area or page west you would have the access road that Mr. Gibbs described. This is to show that an accessible, safe, and attractive small park would be set on a two to one slope, uh, falling about 30 to 40 feet. So it, wouldn't, it would be highly, it would be very unfeasible to provide those accessibility and that for the park. And then also to construct the road, this would show that about a retaining wall, about eight to 10 feet, plus the grades between the adjacent lots uh, would be pretty problematic to build the access road between the lots. Question that I have looking at applicant exhibit number one, which is the Microphone. Annapolis Microphone. Road. Microphone. With, with the, uh, how many stories building? Exhibit one? No, nine. Oh. Applicant nine. Nine, that, that would be proposed for a four story building. Did you guys, were you actually considering multifamily development and was this just like part of a choice set where you're considering this or did you just prepare this for this case? Uh, let, me, let me just say that Johnson has a multifamily component. They're highly diversified. They built multifamily all over the country. Um, th this is just not a feasible site for multifamily and that's why we had Mr. Varga uh, come in and testify and we have one other witness about that as well. So no, we were just trying to respond to yeah. St staff's position is that the sector plan recommends multifamily over retail on this property. And th this part of our case is just simply to establish that that's not a feasible recommendation in the master plan. And 
Or, and, and what's even more concerning is that these, these, this t topography didn't appear overnight. It's been there for years and years and years. And you have to question the wisdom of the initial recommendation um, as to whether or not the, the topographic challenges of not just our property, but the properties on either side of us were ever considered in making these recommendations. So, no, we're not considering multifamily, even though we have a multifamily component. It's just not feasible here. Okay. Um, I'd like to put into evidence uh, CB 26 of 2018, which is the bill that established the actual legal standard for a use table modification, which is quite different than the one that is contained in the staff report for which there is no attribution of any statutory um, progeny. Uh, the yeah, this was the adopted draft. Okay. I, I also have a copy of Mr. Gibbs, I know it's hard, but just try to keep the microphone. Okay. I also have a copy of the planning board's letter of June 14th, 2018, which suggested the very language that the district council Okay, adopted. so let's get um, CB26 into the record as applicants exhibit number 11. Okay, so 11 goes to um, Marie. I wasn't a math major now. I'm trying to keep up here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have the letter that I, I guess I signed, dated um, June 14, 2018. Uh, did, did you get CB26? Do you want the letter too? Okay, we're going to accept this in the letter, um, my letter to the chair of the council as um, applicants exhibit number 12. Okay, um, I'd like to bring Mr. Josh Woldridge up to the podium for some very, very brief testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Ed. My name is Josh Woldridge. I'm the Vice President of Development with the NRP Group. The NRP Group is the ninth-ranked multifamily developer nationwide, sixth ranked multifamily builder, and we're actually the typically the first ranked affordable housing developer throughout the country as well. The NRP group is currently working on three projects in Prince George's County. Uh, one is under construction within walking distance of the Largo Metro Station, and we have two more, one within walking distance of the Greenbelt Metro Station, and the last one in walking distance to the Prince George's Plaza Metro Station. We also have active projects throughout the remainder of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area and all the other jurisdictions that make up the region. We've had the opportunity to evaluate the viability of residential development at 6801 Annapolis Road in Hyattsville and wanted to just provide some thoughts for you as you evaluate the site. Uh, first, location proximity. You heard some of this before from Mr. Varga. As a rule of thumb, in order to finance any new multifamily residential project throughout the entire DC Metro. This is not just Prince George's County. This is the entire region. It has to have one of three key ingredients. Walkability to Metro being the first one or walkability to destination retail, not neighborhood serving retail, but destination retail. And lastly, walkability to a major employment center. Uh, the site being about two miles from the New Carrollton Metro really doesn't meet any of those three criteria, it would be very challenging to finance a multifamily project in that perspective. The size of the site is really the biggest impediment at one acre. We understand the site could accommodate somewhere between 20 and 30 multifamily units without structured parking. Uh, 28 units is just not a viable size. Uh, Mr. Varga mentioned 200 units. I would actually suggest that 250 units is typically our minimum size to attract institutional uh, lender and investor to a project. 
Uh, one could consider an alternative of a smaller tax credit finance project for the site. However, I'll point out that um, the tax credit program, the low income housing tax credit program is a competitive process. The state of Maryland awarded 15 tax credit projects in 2019. The average size of those projects was 62 units each. So uh, again, as our company is a, uh, a tax credit developer as well, affordable developer, uh, 20 to 30 units would not be uh, nearly as competitive as those other projects that were awarded tax credits. The site design, in, in recent years, the layering of additional requirements, particularly with stormwater management, have greatly reduced the viability of a lot of sites that we look at. We essentially need a lot more space to work with really stormwater management regulations that have evolved over the last year being the largest portion of that. And then income and rents, uh, Mr. Varga touched on earlier, the rents needed to support structured parking would need to be greater than 2,000 per unit per month and, uh, and or greater than $2.30 a square foot to support structured parking. Uh, those levels of rents occur in, say, National Harbor or student influence projects uh, by the bed projects in College Park. The rents at the adjacent apartments, the Verona at Landover Hills, are just fourteen fifty-seven, dollars about $1.73 per square foot. Um, and, and then, frankly, when you factor the, uh, all of the soft costs, hard costs, uh, the, the rents really don't even support surface parked uh, new construction in that location. And then just to slightly go off uh, script, the, um, this is the first time I'm seeing the design. I think it's a pretty creative use for the topography. And uh, we can work on the multifamily side, we can work with uh, challenging topography, but I can't say we've ever worked with anything more than 10 to 20 feet of grade change. Uh, so that's, that's in our wheelhouse, but beyond that, would, would be a, uh, a real challenge for us to make a multifamily project work with the construction type. So uh, I think it's a pretty creative uh, design to take advantage of the topography. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Maggiera? I just have one question. Okay. You, you guys are in an opportunity zone, aren't you? Yeah, I think you are. It's, it's, no, it's not. It's enterprise zone. Well, well, well a, let me, yeah, let me take that back. An opportunity zone. Let me take that back. Um, my understanding, I don't, not, uh, Commissioner, I'm not so sure about opportunity zone. We were in an enterprise zone, and we had many meetings with, um, several meetings with economic development and conversations with them. The enterprise zone um, program expired. It has been refiled, but new maps have to be approved. We're hopeful that this property will be continued in the new mapping. We have not received notification of that yet. Yeah, I think you're in an opportunity zone, though, so you could tax harvest that at some point as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I stand corrected. I didn't know about opportunity. Yeah, thank you, you very check much. it out. It's, it's right around in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, another exhibit to mark, please. It's just a compendium of pages from the uh, sector plan text document. Okay. And yep, no, okay. I have highlighted some language there, but I, I just would like to uh, turn, have you turn your attention, if you don't mind, um, to uh, the fourth page back, which is a copy of page 80 from the sector plan. Um, oh, where it just, it makes it clear that by the use of the conjunctive, that every property in character area C is not recommended for multifamily residential. There are other uses that are appropriate. And if you go to the last page in that section, which is page 142, uh, there's again a discussion of mixed use transition where it makes it clear that you, you know, you don't, you don't have to have multifamily on every property. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, the thrust of our argument on our use table modification was that, you know, th this is a use which is 
compatible and supports multifamily. All right, this property is one acre, one acre. Character area C is approximately based on our planimetering off of PG Atlas uh, is 25 acres, 25 acres, okay? So it's hard to envision, even if you accepted staff's recommendation or their analysis, which says this should be, everything is recommended for, for multifamily residential in character area C, it's hard to envision how using one acre out of 25 acres for a complementary use frustrates the purpose of the sector plan. And your action in the Largo case is particularly relevant for this analysis. And I have excerpts from that case that I'm gonna put into the record. Because there, there, Johnson's site was 2.24 acres. It was part of a larger parcel mm -hmm. that was 10.94 acres, okay? The sector plan recommendation for that property was office, institutional with a focus on medical office, okay? That's what the sector plan said. Your finding, your finding and your resolution was allowing a consolidated storage facility to exist on 2.24 acres of, a, of an 11 acre parcel didn't frustrate the recommendation of the sector plan for office because it was only a small part of a larger parcel and those objectives could still be achieved on the balance of the land. That is in your resolution and in your finding, and I'm gonna put that into the record now. And so that's the exact analogy that we find applicable in this case. We got one acre out of 25 where we wanna put a use that is entirely compatible with any use you can imagine, with commercial, with residential, single family or multifamily for that matter. So. Uh, we, we, we think that that helps us in this, from the perspective of establishing that this use table modification is quite frankly warranted and, and, and again I think helps you hopefully get to the point where you can say that this site plan does not frustrate the purposes of the sector plan. Okay, so we have to have this exhibit marked and accepted into the record as applic applicant's exhibit number 13. And how much of the one acre is build, buildable? Pardon me? Is how buildable? Of, yeah. Um, uh, three, half, a half to maybe 0.6. I mean, the slope, we're building in, we're make, we're right. able to put basements on part of that slope. So I, quarter of an acre, three quarters of an acre maybe? Three quarters of an acre from Mr. Randy Jones uh, of Johnson Development. Thank you. Uh, well, wait, sir, sir, if you're going to speak, you have to speak on the microphone or, or consult with uh, no, Mr. The point, the point on the multifamily was that you can only use basically half of it because you can only surface park. And even surface parking doesn't generate the rents needed to carry the debt in this area. Um, I'd like to put a copy of your resolution in the Largo case into evidence as well as I'm just putting one copy of your resolution into the record. Okay, so this is number 14. This is the resolution. I'm just curious about how many more exhibits do you have? I think that's just about it. Um, and then I have the words the, just about then it. I have, that scares me. Then I understand. Then I have the excerpts from the Largo Town Center sector plan, which say the very thing that I just explained to you about how using 2.24 acres there for consolidated storage didn't frustrate the office recommendation in the sector plan because you still had okay. nine acres. Hold on left. a second. We can take it. Okay, we're accepting the, the um, resolution into the record as applicant's exhibit number 14. We have the Largo Town Center. <laughs> I don't have it. No, wait a minute. Was that, what was that? That was 14, it was right? 14, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, we can take administrative notice of it, but you've submitted it. We're going to accept it into the records applicant exhibit number 15. And we, we ran into the double digits now. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think uh, okay. what follows is my last exhibit. And this I don't is know that we need all of these if you want some of these. 
Uh, we, we have the one for the record, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have a memorandum of law. Um, because who's memorandum of law. Because when you who's look law? at. I mean, whose memorandum is it? You said. This is mine. Okay. Oh. This is, I prepared this for you. Okay. Thank um, you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. And basically, what he's, this memorandum. It like it was like a, 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 a dozen roses or something. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for it, this memorandum that you it, prepared. It does, I, I, if I do say so myself, it does present a rosy picture for my Okay, <laughs> okay. touche, touche. Okay. But, but let me just say that if you look at the sections from the text document that I gave you, everywhere there, there, there is no language that says character area C shall be developed with multifamily residential above retail. Everything in there is like encourage, attempt, strive. They are all aspirational goals. They are not requirements. And what we say respectfully to your staff is that what they've done is they've taken the sector plan and they've said, we can't recommend approval of your site plan or your use because you are doing something other than multifamily residential on this property. That's a straight jacket. We know that language. I understand. That's a so straight you got jacket. the board up here listening. Okay. So, so this is nothing more than a guide. And we've cited the Pringle case out of Montgomery County, 2013, where they clearly say aspirational language uh, in a sector plan or a master plan is not binding. It's not okay, binding. Okay, so let me find that because that, that, is that, that's a Court of Appeals case? Yeah, court of Special Appeals. Court report, of Special Appeals. Report opinion. I have a copy. Court of Special Appeals. I have a copy of that if okay. you'd like to have it. Okay. Here it is. A little different from Court of Appeals, but it's okay. Is it, is it a published opinion? It is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's published and it okay. is uh, stare decisis. Okay. No cert taken. So. All right, hold on a second. Okay, so now your memorandum of understanding, um, your, 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 not understanding, your, but your legal memorandum is, uh, um, is accepted into the record as applicant number 16. Okay. Thank you very much. Hold on a second. Okay, and then hold on a second. Oh, no, go ahead. This, this is 16. And the, well, I need to read it. And then the Pringle versus Montgomery County Planning Board will be um, case is um, applicants exhibit number 17. And I want to send these two over to legal. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I think that's all my documents. My last witness is Mr. Mark Ferguson for some very brief testimony on the land planning side and also for a rather startling uh, uh, piece of, of, of uh, documentary evidence to put before you as well. Thank you very much. You know. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chair. Mark Ferguson. Well, it's uh, evening anyway. The good part. You can go ahead. Offices on Medical Center Drive in Largo, Maryland. Okay. Um, Mr. Gibbs gave you CB26 earlier that contained, thank you, the, uh, the findings for approval of either a use change or a modification to the development standards. There are three standards. First is that the modification will benefit the proposed development. That's, to me, okay. self-evident. Can't okay. go forward without them. The second is that the modifications will further the purposes of the development, the applicable development district. So this whole district doesn't have a purpose statement. The, the uh, transitional, the, the mixed-use transitional area does. Mr. Gibbs gave that to you. The statement of purpose is on page 22, and that is, and I'll, I'll uh, excerpt, to promote medium density mixed use with a residential character, and specifically the mixed-use transition area will include a mix of commercial, mixed use and multifamily development. And the controls for this area aim to, con aim to create viable blocks, residential blocks, and active commercial uses that are responsive to local needs and access. And you've heard from the locality. Um, the standards go on to, to then regulate bulk yard setback, parking and access management, and building design. And I believe your staff is working to those right now, right? So 
to talk about form. Now, use, the purpose statement asks for a mix of commercial, mixed use, and multifamily development. We are commercial, and we are mixed use. Now, the development district standards, Madam Examiner, did not, Madam, excuse me, I've been in the zoning and hearing examiner endlessly over the last, uh, the last month, Madam Chairman. The development district standards didn't have a use table. If use was so important to the master plan's vision, one would have presumed that they would have put in a use table for either the zones in the district or, or specific character areas as you find in other sector plans with development districts. That wasn't done. So the sector plan was approved without a use table. 2013, the district council did pass an ordinance that said you need use tables. So three years thereafter, this DDOC was amended to add a use table. Now, that was just for the CSC and CM zones in the DDOC. MUI didn't get its own use table. So therefore, we're at staff's analysis, which leads you to um, 27546.17, which says the MUI uses are the CSCs, the CSC uses, except for miscellaneous uses, which we're describing, and residential lodging uses. Now, that's germane, and Mr. Gibbs, let me give you this to pass up if, if I could, because you substitute the R18 uses for the, for the CSC uses in the MUI zone. So I went down and looked at dwelling multifamily, and there are seven subcategories of multifamily dwelling in the MUI zone. And the last one is multifamily dwellings with ground floor retail uses, with ground floor commercial uses. And that is what we're hearing again and again, is what the master plan seeks and what everybody would like to have on the site. And that is permitted, but subject to footnote 131. And what footnote 131 does is lay out eight more conditions, and there's one of them which I've highlighted in red, mm -hmm. which you need to meet, that says you can only have that, provided the property is located adjacent to an existing or proposed light rail transit station. We're two miles away from New Carrollton, and we're a mile away from the proposed Glen Ridge Center. So by the terms of the zoning ordinance today, the use that the master plan seeks, multifamily dwellings with ground floor commercial, would not be a permitted use at this site. Okay. Say that again. So it, the use of what? Multifamily dwellings with ground floor commercial uses, which is what the master plan seeks, what the staff report says over and, again, over and over again, what should be happening here, would not be a permitted use at this site. Okay. Just a, just a multifamily use. Well, multifamily dwellings, again, seeking to create the multifamily neighborhood no, with this saying, ground floor. I, I understand that point, but multifamily yeah. by itself would. Multifamily is dwellings by itself is a, is a permitted use. But that's not what the master plan says. When you look at that exhibit on page 87, mixed use, and you look at another uh, of the land use maps further down in the uh, development district standards, specifically hatched for ground floor retail, it's not a permitted use. Okay. Here. All right, let me do this. The, the section that you have, um, um, that you've just handed out from section 27 um, uh, 441, the use is permitted, and, and the section 27 uh, 546 uh, point 17 uses. Um, we're going to accept this into the record, even though we can take um, administrative notice. We're going to accept it as applicant's exhibit number 18. Thank you. So, to go back to the approval standards, we have a benefit to the proposed development. We have furthering the purposes of the development district. And because and, and the, those purposes talk about a mix of uses like commercial. So now we go to the final that you not substantially impair the master plan. Now, an impairment is anything that doesn't conform to the master plan's recommendations. But that's not the same thing as a substantial impairment. 
And in my practice, I've been told by the attorneys what the case law says is you have to apply a balancing test. Do the positives of the, the matter that's before you outweigh the negatives. That's your job as the, as the planning board. But it's not sufficient to say you don't meet that one requirement, therefore the master plan is substantially impaired. Now, Mr. Hurlbut read you the goals of the master plan. He didn't read you the vision of the master plan right before those goals. And that is that it's a transitional area which comprises new multifamily housing and limited amounts of neighborhood-oriented and pedestrian-friendly commercial development. So we've heard testimony about the, commercial, about the pedestrian friendliness. You've just heard testimony about how it can be neighborhood friendly and complements multifamily uses. And as Mr. Gibbs mentioned, there is other language. Mr. Holbert read you the goals. He didn't read you the strategies to implement those goals. The first strategy is encourage multifamily dwellings on the north and side, south side of the corridor. Not require, but encourage. So if we have a proposal which meets the more specific statement of uses and the perfect purpose statement, and by providing complementary use as the vision describes, it's difficult for me to see how it would even impair, let alone substantially impair, the master plan. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Madam okay, Chair. hold on. Oh, Mr. B Mr. Balazs, do you have something to add? Um, this will be very brief, but there were two statements made about the staff report which simply are not correct, so I want to okay. make sure that the record is correct. Um, one that's been made numerous times is that staff is somehow indicating that multifamily is the only appropriate use on the site. Staff report did not say that. It said that self-storage is an inappropriate use on this site. And the reason the staff report says that is the county council prohibited it. And the sector plan, um, in our view, uh, recommendation, the sector plan which prohibited self-storage as a use at this location, the reasons behind that uh, were sound then and they're still sound. And we understand that people may, the applicant and the board may take a different point of view. Um, but the, the point was that self-storage is an inappropriate use because it is prohibited by the county council until and unless they change their view. Um, the second correction I'd like so to So let make, me ask yeah. you this. Let me know before you go to the second. So this, this is our dilemma because we, we've got an applicant here and, and, and we take everything on a case-by-case -case basis because there are always nuances. So I'm, we're not talking about precedent setting. Um, Mr. Gibbs, Mr. Lynch, everybody can raise um, potential analogies, but um, you still have to get down in the weeds to see what the various nuances are. So um, in this particular case, you, you're saying that this use is not allowed um, because the county council prohibited the district council prohibited it. That, that's correct, and, and, and because and so, it was not. And so now we've got all these, now you've got everybody coming out in full support of this, including right. council members, but not, not the council itself. Right. There is a mechanism, and the applicant Correct. is using it, Correct. to ask the council to change its mind Correct. and allow the use, and that's what they're doing through this Correct. application. That's and they're, they're asking doing. that you recommend to the council uh, that we change. We got that. We got that. Okay. And we may or may not do that. You know. Exactly so, right. So, um, and, 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 but that doesn't preclude us if we happen to not have a problem with the site plan itself. It doesn't help preclude us from addressing the site plan. Correct. And I think I just wanted to correct. It was said okay. multiple times okay. that we had taken the position that the only okay. appropriate use was multifamily. Okay. There are many appropriate uses, the ones that are allowed under the code. Okay. Thank you. Um, Honestly, thank you for that correction yeah. because um, um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, distinction that needed to be made. What was your part two? And the second correction is uh, Mr. Gibbs indicated that the standard that we laid out at the top of page nine for how you would decide whether to recommend a change in the use table, his words were, I believe, it doesn't, I can't find that anywhere in the code. It is in the code. It's a 27-548.26B5. It's near the section that he's been quoting, but it's, it's a different section. And I asked counsel if they could confirm that. Uh, we do believe that the standard we laid out and that we used in our analysis is, in fact, the binding standard. 
and it doesn't okay. exist. Thank you very much for that. Okay. I think, give just on that, any more exhibits. I think the only thing in there that's not verbatim that's in the actual bill is that it, the word shall is the word used in the bill instead of must. Otherwise, it's verbatim what's in the exhibit 11, I think, it was passed out. I guess I'd ask the legal counsel. I don't, I know that. I don't have the code in front of me if they can comment on that. Yeah. The, All right. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Borden. Thank you. Deborah Borden, just very quickly. There are actually two sections that talk about a finding. One of the sections is under the um, uh, subcategory B, where it talks about if you're changing the use or the zone. And, and of course, if you're changing the use or the zone, or asking for a change in the use of the zone, um, that has to go to the district council, and it sets forth a finding that the district council shall find that the amended standards will benefit the proposed development. That's the, that's the language that the applicant is relying on, okay? But then further down, it talks about generally if the um, site plan and any uh, associated amendments, which these are associated amendments, um, they can be subject to approval, approval with conditions, or disapproval. Um, and then it has this general language that the district council shall find the proposed development conforms with the purposes and recommendations. So slightly different wording, but basically that means they have to, they have to comply with both standards, you know, to the extent that they're really any different. Um, and they really do have to comply with both, that, that it, that it uh, that it will benefit the proposed development and that it will conform with the purposes and recommendations of the development district as stated in the master plan or sector plan, that it meets applicable site plan requirements, that it doesn't otherwise substantially impair the implementation of any comprehensive plan. All of that is in the code. It's possible that it all wasn't necessary to be in the code, but it's in there and it's in two different paragraphs. Okay. All right. Well, in response, I would just note that the test that we articulated in CB 26 of 2018 is in fact the test for a use table modification. That is the test. And at page nine at the top, the staff says, to change the list of allowed uses, you have to prove the following standard. That's not the test for changing the allowed list of uses. I mean, that's okay. all I'm gonna say. And then- So what's your next point? My next point is this. Look at page nine, staff says, staff opposes, second paragraph, first full paragraph, second paragraph, staff opposes the applicant's request to allow a consolidated storage facility on the subject property as it will not be consistent with the mixed use residential land use recommendation. Okay. They're saying that, they're, that's what they're okay, calling. We got for. that clear. Yes. Okay. okay, so. Thank you. Moving right along. Okay. That's it. Thank That's you. it for you? That's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm biting my tongue. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So, does anybody else have anything else to add? I have a question. Okay. No. 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 Bar Council. Okay. So, my microphone. My concern is precedential value if we do something. Well, you know what? We don't have to do anything. Okay. This is going to the council. Okay. 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 No, okay. Do you, oh, Ms. Borden, do you have something? To, I was just, if there's a question, I can, I can answer. Are you, are you satisfied? No, I, want, I do want to hear you. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. You um, review every application on its own merits. Every property is very different, as we know. It has different uh, characteristics, topography. Everything around it is different. So it's very difficult to, um, to say that uh, if you make a decision in this case, that that will um, generate decisions in other cases, because it's, it's always a different look at a, at a property. Um, but that said, you know, we do try to be consistent. We do try to look at things in, uh, in, in interpretation matters um, consistently when we, um, when we look at plans. So, you know, I, but I do think that the planning board has a certain level of discretion to, ex to um, exercise its expertise, its expertise in reviewing these plans and, um, and in applying these 
sometimes esoteric ideas um, in, in master plans and in master planning. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. I, I do think that the, the, um, both the district council and, and the planning board have a certain level of discretion um, because they are making these decisions based on you know, the vision for, a, for an area. Uh, and that can be a little nebulous I, at times. I Mr. Harrell, but, oh. Okay. I'm sorry, I was just, my concern was to, to, like the case we had this morning and then they start bootstrapping about with prior decisions that we made. Yeah. Well, um, people can try that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Let me just say this, it's a, it's a balancing act. I mean, we have, we can't, we can't be willy-nilly willy and we can't be arbitrary and capricious, but sometimes there are reasons for distinctions in how we handle one case versus another. And the case law is very clear that we take things that we evaluate on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. There are some, um, there are some, people can make the argument that we, that some of these are precedent setting, and if they're fully analogous, then maybe they are. But sometimes there are nuances, so we have to use our professional judgment. We're put here for a reason to make, to evaluate each matter that comes before us on its own merits, bearing in mind decisions that we may have made previously, and, and, and whether there are any nuances to those particular decisions. And now I'm going to turn to Mr. Hurlbut because a while ago, a good hour and a half ago, I asked you <laughs> if, there, if, in fact, we were to go forward with the detailed site plan, were, were there conditions that you might have that, we, that would be of, of help to this? Hey, and staff, uh, hearing that message, uh, if you, you so choose or the district council so chooses to approve the dis detailed site plan, we've drafted uh, conditions for you to consider. Okay. Um, we've shared those with the applicant as well. Um, they've had a brief time to look them over and has, have asked a couple questions on the side, but I'll enter those into. The re the st the, okay, so, the, so your staff um, proposed conditions on the site plan will be entered into the record? Okay. Um, and then, Mr. Gibbs, did, did you have some? You, um, Mr. Hobart said indicated that you've seen that. Did you have I, some? I, I just got them uh, w with uh, huge disappointment. We can't accept all these. Um, I'm sorry. We're we can't we can't accept all these conditions. What, what's frustrating for us is that Mr. Hurlbut gave us a set of conditions two weeks ago, and that that's what led to the revisions to the elevations that we submitted. These are more conditions and asking for more things than what he asked for the last time. And so, uh, I mean, I can go through them real quick. I can what's, go through them. What's, what's new and different? What are the conditions that you have a, a problem well, with? Well, for, first of all, he's, but, he's, uh, you know. he's still recommending disapproval of a seven-story building on the front. Okay. You're saying it's not seven stories. That's correct. But 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 you have to make a decision. Is it is it no modification that's needed, or is it a modification of one story that is needed? Okay. So when you both went outside to have the conversation, <laughs> I thought it was to reach agreement. So do we have it or not? We tried. Well, apparently, we don't. <laughs> I mean, that, that would have been something helpful for us to At understand coming beginning. right back into the room. We, so we, we could then, we, as I, part of your presentation, address those. I, we could have been I, in front of this. I understand, but I didn't even get this. I'm not really okay, okay. comment, you know. Well, because for, for one thing, when we took a break, you know, we asked you to just go have a discussion, and then it takes, I guess, time to put it in writing, I guess. Yeah, okay. If I could tell you. You can. I, when we went out, staff had the same conditions they gave us two weeks ago. And you were okay with those? With the exception of one. We, we felt we had addressed them. We thought they agreed we had addressed them. They said, well, let us take your PowerPoint and go up and reorganize the conditions. And we come back with different which conditions. Which one do you have a concern? No, because we were just seeing them the first time today. So which one do you have a problem with? Of the new ones? Yes. yes. Of what okay. was just handed out. Okay. First of all, all right. First of all. Um, as to the as to pass in this case again, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so I know sorry. I'm, I'm I understand, but I'm saying I apparently right. we don't have clarity here. Uh, well, I mean, okay. we we need we we can't go forward and accept a, a, a recommendation to deny which ones are they, Mr. Gibbs? Okay, first one, seven stories. We think so as, C1, as, so as in a bunch of that how number, many you've got a problem with first before we C1. discuss them. So, C1, C1, C1. What, which other ones? Um, 
C2 has already been addressed. It's irrelevant. It's, a, it's in so our it's PowerPoint. Disapproval. You're asking for it to be to come well, out. It just has to come out, yeah, okay. because it, we have 12 feet. I just feet. want to go through a bullet okay. so we okay. know how many right. we're dealing with. Um, okay, that comes out. Uh -oh. okay. hold, on a, hold on a second. The applicant is you know requested. what? Wait a minute. I, I want to hear your list, and then we will come back to you for your comments, okay? Let's do okay. it orderly. Okay. And then we'll be taking right. a break. Um, right. C3, so, we have a problem with. So you're saying what? Um, well, their staff, report, their staff report said reduce the use of EFIS to 50%. Tell me what you, what's the action, Mr. Gibbs? Eliminate it or delete it? Or, ch or, or, change, or change it to approval. 50% in each facade. That's what the staff report where? says. Where? You well, said C3. It, it, right now, it's just as open-ended. It lets the staff decide what they're going to do. Okay, it's on the second page. You're saying add 50% yeah, to the No project. more than 50% on each facade. No more than 50%? Correct. It's in your staff report. This is what you said. C, C, is C3. It C3. C3. It's on the back. It's on the back. C3. Page. Okay. What else? D. Um, 1A, we have no objection. We have proposed that. Um, 1A one, is okay, is that what you said? It's good. It's okay. You it's okay. All the way through H right. now. One, you only one, A? Just give us the ones you got a problem with, Mr. 1B. Page, please. 1B, I have a problem. Okay. 1C is fine. One, one D, no. Um, one E, we can do faux windows. I don't know what they mean by windows. We can't do real windows any more than what we did. So no for one E. Um, this is ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I get it. One F, no problem. Uh, one G, no problem. Uh, and 1H is a non-starter for the project. If we have to step the building back, we are going to lose units in the building barely pro forma today. So we cannot agree to lose units, and cutting the building back results in loss of units. We okay. explained that to staff. What about 2A, 1, 2, and 3? Um, two, 2 is fine. Two a, a is fine. Two, i I got to get the... Uh, huh? Good. 2 is all good all the way through. Everything under two. Okay, let yes. me just say this, and then, then we got to get to. Quick? So I'm going to make a motion in a, in no, a few minutes, hold on a potentially. Second. Hold on potentially, a second. I just wanted to say where I'm at on some of these issues. So I'm fine on the height issue. I'm totally fine with it. I don't care what we call it. I'm fine with the height of the building. That's not an issue to me. When you look around the neighborhood, it doesn't look any different than any of the other ones. You guys need to figure out how you talk about the basement and how we classify that. Because I, I could care less how you how you talk about it. It's not a problem to me, given the slope of this particular parcel. I think it's a very, very different kind of parcel than we have anywhere else, and I'm perfectly fine with how it is. We just need to figure out how we work that into language if we go with that. Okay. I'm also fine with the facades. You've done a really good job at coming back with the facade treatments. I think the EFIS has been reduced totally, and I would be fine with the language that we have in here. I don't think we should have a ton of like, extra windows on it just because of the, t the type of the building it is. That's just my personal preference from what I do. Okay. Um, and I think that covers most of this stuff. I need to stop you for a stuff. second because yeah. I need to say something. I need to say, um, clearly, you came in here with a recommendation of denial, period, across the board. You can see that this board is trying to to um, to wrap our, our arms around this and get somewhere. You know, your your statements that I can't agree with this, I can't agree with that. I mean. You, Sometimes you, you may not agree with all the conditions, but ultimately this recommendation, whatever we do, is going to be this board's decision. I understand. And then it's going to get to, so. I, I understand. Okay. So then, and then we'll transmit to the council, and then they'll, they'll deal with it. Um, so I guess I hear what you're saying. We, this is not where we thought we were after a, a very long time. You had to put on your case. I am going to take a, a break, another 10 minute break. I'm going to have council and staff meet with you again and see what, where we are. Because even if we don't, even with the, the height issue, I mean, we still would have to have the rec make the requisite finding if we deviate from. Uh, okay. So I'm we also, there's one other issue that's not anywhere in here okay. is the departure from the loading spaces. That's, that's not in here. The what? And that needs to be covered. I'm, I'm also fine with that, with, with actually approving it. I don't think it's a big issue for this particular site, but I think you also need to figure that out with the applicant. It's, well. it's, it, it's in there. Oh, is it in one of these? It's in D. Uh, D. 
the header to D essentially approves the loading spaces. Okay. okay. So implicitly, it's there. So, okay. so since we're talking about things, uh, our preferences, I kind of like the idea of more windows, to be honest with you, because I just think it, it just makes more sense. If in the event that there's a development later, there's a shopping center right next. If that shopping center flips and they decide to, to, to put a building there, you know, let's have it consistent. At least look like an office building. Are you Same? mean faux windows? Yeah, oh. faux windows. I, okay. I don't care about real because windows. Because I've, I've seen parking oh. garages. When you go to Alexandria, oh. you yeah. go to Arlington, you do see those faux garages. Yeah, I like that. Um, let, us, let us talk with staff about okay. that. So we're going to pass this case Thank for you. 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then see where we... 10 minutes into five, if possible. Well, Thank we'll you. We'll see, somebody will let us know when you're ready. I'm out here. Okay. We'll talk with them. Bye. Prince George's County Planning Board is back in session. When we broke, we were going over, um, when we took a break, we were going over um, proposed conditions of our, our staff as presented by Mr. Hurlbut. Um, we need to have those proposed conditions marked and accepted into the record as staff exhibit number one. Okay, now then we took a break and I think the, um, our staff and legal counsel, our legal counsel was con consulting with the applicant and legal counsel, Mr. Gibbs. Um, on the respective, on the various conditions. And can you, someone tell us where you yeah. are? Staff will take a first shot at. Um, essentially what we agreed to um, was to modify um, the recommendation in staff exhibit number one um, under C, under disapproval to move C1 to B2. Um, to approve the amendment for the seven-story building. Oh, we still need to keep up with you. So. This is on page one. So you said smooth. Yeah, so C1 becomes new B2? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what's after that? Um, and then on page two, um, we agreed that 1B should be removed. Okay, that's D1B? D1B, correct. Okay. All right. And then D1... D should be modified Wait, in the D one D okay should be modified in the second line after facade to say doesn't does not exceed fifty percent and then just one second please okay and um, essentially then the deletion of um, has been minimized to broken up the consistency in materials and highest of character essentially. D deleted to or removed. I, excuse me, I need okay. to go back to D for a second. Yeah. That, that's what he's on. I okay. Oh, okay. He's so still on the same one. Yeah. So okay. just remove the middle section okay. down to the second to last line to be reviewed and approved by the urban design section. Okay. Or one, one, one more time. Demonstrate that the amount of exterior insulting, Neither. insulating. I'm sorry. Jesus. Finishing system on each building facade does not exceed 50 percent. Period. Two. Is that a period after yes. that? Yes. Okay. And then has been minimized. Is that where you start deleting? Yes. And you said okay. And we go through. Go how far? Well, actually, it's not a period. It's a right. comma. That's it would right. be a comma to down to, to the comma in the second line to be reviewed and approved by the urban design section okay. as designee okay. of the planning board. So has been minimized all the way through decorative wood comes out. Correct. Yes. Got it. Okay. Next. Um, e. We agreed to add. More faux windows, w windows, and bays with to be consistent with, and then at the end to be consistent with uh, applicants' exhibit number one. Okay. Okay. Um, F and G stay. H we modified to say provide an an art piece, building tattoo, or super graphic on the upper three stories of the east elevation. I'm sorry, Mr. Herbert, you lost well, me again. Yeah, where, which one are you on? Uh, D1H, okay. which was the step back. Because F and G were okay. Yeah. Okay. So H was the step down of, uh, of the okay. building. Um, right. We've deleted that and provided a new H, which would be to provide an art, provide art or building tattoo or super graphic on the upper there three elevations. Substituting. Sorry. I am so sorry. We got to provide art. I know. Yeah. Art or so building is this tattoo. a new H? Yes. Yes. 
Okay. That's what he said. I didn't hear it. Okay. Okay. So start See? at the beginning of the new H. How does it read? Provide mm -hmm. art. Art. Building A -R tattoo or yeah. super graphic. Provide art. Building tattoo. No. No. Yeah. What did I say? Building tattoo. Building, Building tattoo. tattoo. Okay. Oh. Or no, super no graphic. Art. What? Super graphic. Yes. Okay. Provide art. Provide building art building tattoo or super, or super art super graphic or super graphic super graphic and that's what? the that on the upper three stories of the east elevation on the upper, upper east upper stories so that's gonna be the back side of the building that would front the park area Yes. Park area. I'm yes. sorry. Upper yes, three sir. stories of the what? Of the, of the east, east, elevation. east elevation. Of which the is east elevation. The rear. To, yeah, let's put east and then in paren rear. And then to be reviewed by the urban design section. What was that? And, and to be reviewed by the urban design section. Yes. Yeah, that's the new stories. To be elevation. reviewed and approved. Stories of the yes. elevation. Where exactly what's in D. Same language from D1D in, in the last two lines. Of the same age. Parenthesis rear elevation and then comma to be reviewed by the urban um, design section. Reviewed and approved. approved. Reviewed and approved. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's new H. All of two was okay if I remember correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is correct. Okay. So that's all you have to say right now? Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Gibbs? Okay, I, I, I just, my client would like some uh, clarification on what was D1. Microphone? I yeah, I don't know why the microphone's not working there. My client, is that better? Yes. Better. My client would like some clarification on what the wording is for what used to be D1E. It's now it's D1D. I guess because we deleted it. Provide yeah. more faux windows and bays with consistent fenestration fin <laughs> as outlined in applicant exhibit number one. On all? On all of the upper levels of all sides of the building to break it up as viewed from a distance and provide a sense of engagement. Is and that that's consistent. At that the mean? end, it was supposed to be consistent so with, with applicants one. exhibit one. Yeah. All right, well, I just right. added it further. Okay. So. But, but here's my, here's, here's just my question, question I have. So is applicants exhibit one acceptable? And we're just, uh, what are we referring here? Are, because we put an applicants exhibit one, we put into the record today. Applicants exhibit one was the, was the um, PowerPoint, right? That's correct. Right. And Which it has, is shown here. has the perspective and it has these elevations. And so my question is, is what we've shown there satisfactory, or are you asking for something more? Well, I think since we said it was consistent with applicants exhibit one, and if that's applicants exhibit number no. one, that, no, no, because because it's because you specifically had to provide more faux windows. So that's are you saying that wasn't enough? We were we added the words more faux mm -hmm. windows because. What was presented as part of staff's recommendation had no faux windows on right. this okay. back, thir back so third. Now, so, now, so now with what you see there, is that acceptable? Yes. Okay, okay. so we don't need. Okay. It's got to be okay. consistent with what happens. Okay, so just provide the faux window. It doesn't need the word more then, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. All right. And Mr. Holbert, I'm not clear about C2 and 3. Are, those, are you saying that those stay as they are or come out? Those would stay as they are because the applicant has essentially demonstrated that they conform. So are we saying disapprove the applicant? With applicant exhibit A, one. My question is, are we saying we're disapproving the applicant's requested amendments for C2 and 3? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, C2 can be withdrawn. That goes and to one, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Or C, which C1, becomes C1. C1 becomes Sorry, B2. I just really, okay, Mr. Hope. What is it? The, new, the, the former C2, which becomes C1, may be withdrawn because the applicant has shown, or has shown uh, 
he will meet that with exa applicant exhibit one. Um, and same with uh, three. three, because the condition for, that you're approving in um, that we just talked about more faux windows is satisfying. So in effect, C goes away. All yeah. right, my old C1 becomes my new B2. You're right? correct. All right. You guys will reorder it and get everything all okay. in here for us, right? Okay, all so right. wait a minute now. So somewhere in here, if some of these things are coming out because of um, applicants exhibit one, um, is, is that referenced in here? That, we're, that We reference it in current D1E, consistent with applicant exhibit number one on the tail end. Is that what you're saying? D1E. Mm -hmm. But that's only, if we say that, that's only for D1E. I, I want to make sure. And, and it says D1A, that, that condition. Yeah, applicant exhibit number one. Yeah, this can be, that can be in the findings, right? In the staff report that they can. Yeah, D1A covers everything for you because it says it says the whole site plan has to be amended in accordance with exhibit one. Okay, with, with All right, exhibit got it. One. okay thank you. Okay. With those changes, we, we're in agreement. Thank you very much. Appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Lenhart arises. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I have to ask this question, but I hope that, that um, no one responds. Does the board have any other questions of anyone? Okay. Um, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, Based upon the additional information and testimony presented um, at this hearing and the revised exhibits presented by the applicant, uh, I move that we recommend to the district council to, um, uh, and we find that the DSP is in conformance with the development district and will not substantially impair implementation of the master plan or sector plan subject to the conditions recommended by staff and um, as outlined on staff exhibit number one. And let me uh, walk through some of the changes to staff exhibit one just discussed on the record. Uh, so I move that we approve applicants uh, requested amendment uh, uh, as outlined B1, which is mix, mixed use transition parking and access, man, uh, access management. Uh, that we add a new B2, which is to approve the mixed use transition table 8-9 mixed use transition area bulk table, page 157, excuse me, 158, and that we delete uh, what's currently outlined in staff exhibits one items C2 and C3 as no longer um, needed. And then for current, and also in staff exhibit number one, item number, currently item number D1B shall be removed. Uh, and that be, the sentence begins with calculate the average height of the building. Uh, let's see, again, still in staff exhibit number one, that item, current item D1D be revised as follows, uh, or shall read as follows demonstrate that the amount does not exceed, that the amount of the exterior insulating finishing system on each building facade does not exceed 50%, comma, to be reviewed and approved by the urban design section as designee of the planning board. Current um, um, D1E shall be revised to read uh, provide faux windows and bays with consistent fenestration on all of the upper levels of all sides of the building to break it up as viewed from a distance and provide a sense of engagement, uh, comma, consistent with applicant, also consistent with applicant exhibit number one. Uh, we shall uh, strike the current D1H and there shall be a new D1H, which shall uh, read as follows. Provide art building tattoo or super graphic on the upper three stories of the east elevation, uh, also uh, in comma or in parents rear of the building to be reviewed and approved by the urban design section as designee of the planning board. 
as well as accepting all conditions as outlined in um, uh, staff exhibit number one, section D2 in its entirety. And just to clarify, so I will second the motion, but I just want to make sure the staff report will be revised to reflect the stuff that we've talked oh, about. Oh, the re resolution. Yeah, the resolution, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess also some parts of the staff report that you can that would be inconsistent with what we talked about today um, would be helpful. And then I'll second that motion. Okay, and let me add before we go into discussion um, also that uh, my recommendation is that we take no position on the use. Okay. Commissioner Watch, I just, I didn't hear it, so I apologize. Did we move C2 up to yes. B2? Okay. Yes. Yes. Did that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion. Yes. Was it a second? Yes. yes, second. Okay, second. Okay. Is there a discussion? Good answer. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, Mr. Hunt. Thank you very any much. Okay. Any Thank additional you. business to come before the board today? Madam Chair, okay. that's all for today. And board is adjourned. Thank you all good people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we are.